You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of, I'm going to call it a cycle of lectures, entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness by Rudolf Steiner. Fourteen lectures, given in Dornach, from the 29th of September to the 28th of October 1917. This is Lecture 1, entitled The Driving Forces Behind Europe's War, given in Dornach on the 29th of September 1917. It is a matter of deep satisfaction to me, as I think you know, to be with you again for a while, for this is the place where we are able to create a visible sign of our intentions and of the will to come closer and closer to a true knowledge of the Spirit in our studies and in our work in spiritual science. The quest for knowledge is intimately bound up with the most inward aspect of the human being, and every now and then we must therefore inquire into the essential nature of our will and intent. In the light of the present situation, woeful as it is, it seems the answer to this question must be a negative one. For more than three years we have seen something spread across the world that I need not discuss in detail, at least to begin with, for we are all aware of it and feel it deeply. The events now taking place are the opposite of our own intentions, which have come to expression in this very building. Again and again we must try to see clearly which stream of spiritual development we wish to see taken up by humanity. And today we have to say it is the opposite of the stream which has led to the terrible tragedy of these last years. This is something we may call to mind again and again, when we give deep and full consideration to the events now raging all over the world. We may say to ourselves that it appears as if time were drawn out and had become elastic, as if the things we remember from before this madness took hold of the world happened not just years but centuries ago. There will, of course, be many today, as there always have been, who may be said to sleep through the events of the day, people who are not fully awake to what is going on today. But when those who are awake look back on what went through their minds four or five years ago and left an impression, they will feel more or the less the way one does when one lets the mind dwell on an old book or a work of art that was created hundreds of years ago. Events which meant something to us before this madness came on the world now seem to have happened an infinitely long time ago. Anyone who is awake through the science of the Spirit was, of course, able to appreciate what was coming even before these events developed. Many of our friends will remember the almost routine answer I gave to questions asked over and over again after my public lectures from the beginning of this century. The question, you may remember, was, quote, According to the statistics, the world population is increasing. How does this relate to the idea of repeated earth lives? The increase in population is rapid. How can one reconcile this with the spiritual scientific finding that these are always the same souls? Close quote. My answer always had to be, it does look as if the statisticians are right, and the world population is increasing, but we have to take a longer view and consider much longer time spans if we are to do justice to the question. And I would always go on to say that a time may may well come, sooner than we may expect, when people discover to their horror that the population can also decrease. It is not always possible to give plain and simple answers in anthroposophy. People have not yet reached the point where they are able to take truths in the right way, and some things can only be hinted at. Read through the lectures given in Vienna not long before this catastrophe came on our world, and you will find the passage where I spoke of the social cancer that is gnawing away at the evolution of humanity. This and other things were said in order to indicate what was going to happen in human evolution and to challenge people to reflect. For we need to reflect on these things if we are really and truly to wake up. 
We need to be awake and alive for the sake of humanity. If anthroposophy is to fulfill its purpose, its prime task must be to rouse people and make them really wake up. Merely knowing what is going on in the physical world and knowing the laws that human minds are able to perceive as operative in this world is no more than being asleep in a higher sense. Humanity is only fully awake when people are able to develop notions and ideas of the world of the spirit. This is all around us, just as air and water, the stars, the sun and the moon are all around us. When we are physically asleep, we are wholly given up to the internal processes that go on in the body during the night and have no idea of anything in the physical world around us. We are asleep in exactly the same way when we are wholly given up to the physical environment and to the world and the laws of the intellect and have no idea of the world of the spirit that is all around us. Humanity has made great play of its intellectual progress and scientific achievements in the last few centuries and has been particularly insistent on this at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Yet strangely enough, the unconscious and instinctive life was never more to the fore than it is at this time. Up to the present time, this instinctive and unconscious element has increasingly taken hold of the human race. Failure to see the spiritual reality and take account of the element of the spirit is ultimately the cause of this terrible world war. Nor can it be said that through these years, years which have turned into centuries for anyone who is awake in them, as I have said, humanity has learned an adequate lesson from the terrible events around us. Sadly, it has to be said that the opposite is the case. What is the characteristic element to be found day by day, hour by hour, when we take note of what people think or rather pretend to think and pretend to want. It is that, fundamentally speaking, no one in the world knows what they want and no one realizes that people's perfectly justifiable aims, whichever form they may take in the minds of individual nations, would be achieved so much better if they did away with these terrible wars in which so much blood is shed. People do not realize that this that these terrible events with their bloodshed are really not necessary as a means of helping them to achieve their aims. These events have a mysterious background, but if you consider some of the things said in our anthroposophical lectures over the years, even if they have only been touched on lightly, you will find perfectly clear statements, also with reference to the most significant of recent events. Consider also what has been said in these very rooms, especially in the last few years, on the character of the Russian people and the difference between the Russians and the peoples of Western and Central Europe. You will find that you need the things which have been said here to gain understanding of an event that appears to have come in with such vengeance. It has burst forth as though it were a karmic vengeance, the inner meaning of which is quite clear though the word vengeance must be taken as a technical term and not at all in a moral sense. Not only the Russian people, but those of Europe and the whole world will have to reflect for a long time to come on the events in Eastern Europe, events much more mysterious than we are inclined to think. Something has come to the surface which has been preparing for centuries. The new element wanting to take shape is something completely different from what is actually taking shape. Later generations will be able to use the events which will be taking shape in Eastern Europe over the next decades to demonstrate the difference between Maya and reality. For you see, the generations of today are taking what is happening now for the real thing, when this is in fact still waiting in the wings, and they are wrong in taking it for real or something quite different wants to make its appearance. The people in the West are ill-equipped to understand what wants to come to the surface, 
Why are they so ill-equipped? Strange as it may seem to people today, not to you but to the ordinary average individual, being anthroposophists you are not ordinary average people of today, the present age is more than any other age demanding the one thing people least want to have, understanding based on the science of the spirit. Strange as it may sound to the ordinary average people of today, order will not be created from the chaos of the present time until a sufficiently large number of people are prepared to recognize the truths of that science. Such will be the karma of world history. If people insist that this war is just like the wars of the past and that we'll be making peace just as peace has been made before, let them talk. They are the people who love Maya and do not distinguish between truth and deception. Let them make what may seem like peace. Order will only arise from the chaos that fills the world today when insight based on the science of the spirit dawns in human minds. You may feel in your hearts that it will be a long time before such order comes. You may think it will be a long time before people are prepared to let the dawn of such a science arise, and you will be right. You have to accept that it will be a long time before order arises from the chaos, for it will not come until human hearts understand the realm of the spirit. Order can only come when it is understood how this chaos has arisen. Chaos has arisen because the reality is considered in an unspiritual way and the world of the spirit cannot be ignored with impunity. You may think it is enough to live with thoughts and ideas that are wholly derived from the physical world. It is what people generally think today, though this does not make it true. The most completely and utterly wrong idea of humanity let me read that again. The most completely and utterly wrong idea humanity has ever had is, to put it simply, that the spirits will put up with being ignored. You may consider it egotistical and selfish on their part, but the terminology is different in their world. Egotism or not, the spirits take their revenge if they are ignored here on earth. This is a law, an iron necessity. One way to characterize the present time is to say that the present human chaos is the revenge of the spirits who have been ignored for too long. I have often said both here and elsewhere a mysterious connection exists between human consciousness and the destructive powers of decline and fall in the universe. Each can or indeed must take the place of the other in the following way. Let us assume there was a time, say during the last twenty or thirty years of the nineteenth century, when people put the same effort into their quest for the things of the spirit as they have put into achieving material knowledge and material actions during those twenty or thirty years. What would have happened if they had endeavored to recognize the world of the spirit and used this to give a character, a foundation to the physical world? rather than follow mere instinct and chase after more and more knowledge of a kind that has seen its ultimate triumph in the creation of instruments of murder and found its be-all and end-all in people enriching themselves with nothing but material goods. What would have happened if people had sought to gain spiritual knowledge and spiritual impulses for their activities in the social sphere? It would have meant that the powers of destruction were paid off. If people had been more awake and not asleep in the last decades of the 19th century, there would have been greater awareness and therefore no need for destruction in the first decades of the 20th century. Spiritual awareness simply has to be greater than purely sensual and material awareness. If this had been the case during the last decades of the 19th century, the powers of destruction would not have had to intervene in the early decades of the 20th century. This is brought to realization most insistently, and perhaps most cruelly, to the perceptive mind, 
when you meet many of the dead who have entered the world of the spirit, either during the last decades of the 19th or the first decades of the 20th century. Many of them have been caught up in the hustle and bustle and search for material values here on earth, and never had the opportunity to let spiritual impulses arouse awareness. Many have gone through the gate of death without even a notion of the thoughts and ideas that point to spiritual impulses. If they had had the opportunity to take in spiritual thoughts and ideas before they went through the gate of death, they could have taken these with them. It would have been something they needed after death, but they were not in a position to have it. Anyone who knows the history of ideas of the last decades of the 19th and the first decades of the 20th century also knows that people actually no longer knew how to use the term spirit. It has been used to describe all kinds of things, but not the true spirit. Those souls therefore had no opportunity of knowing the spirit whilst here on earth and they have to take the consequences. Having gone through the gate of death and entered the world of the spirit, They are thirsting for, well, what are they thirsting for, these souls who lived in materialism here? They are thirsting for destructive powers in the physical world. Those are the dues and they must be paid. There is no easy way of dealing with these things. If we want to know the realities of this sphere, we must acquire a feeling for what the ancient Egyptians called iron necessity. Terrible as it may be, it was necessary that destruction should spread, for those who had gone through the gate of death were longing for the destructive powers in which they are able to live, seeing they did not receive what was due to them and had been deprived of spiritual impulses while on earth. Order cannot arise from the chaos until people are ready to give room to such grave truths in their souls and also let these truths enter into the ideas that apply in the world of politics today. And if these truths sound pessimistic to you and make you think that humanity is still a long way from achieving all that is demanded, as I have indicated, you are indeed right. But let this justifiable pessimism become a challenge to be awake and to try, whatever your place in life may be, to awaken souls so that the science of the spirit can send out its impulses. It cannot yet be done to any great extent, but we must have the real honest desire to make people consciously aware in such a way that they are able to understand this concrete fact. Longings have arisen in the dead in recent times, and those longings are being met with events which are truly horrifying for those of us who are alive here on the physical plane. Just think how easy it is for some people to present their friends with an image of the region into which human beings enter when they have gone through the gate of death. Consider the unctuous sermons preached in the churches with politicians now actually following the example of these sermonizers and the facile notions people have of the world of the Spirit, and you simply cannot help realizing how far removed from reality is the facile vanity of many of today's leading figures. Compare the speeches of such leading figures. Their lives show that they do anything but lead, and that they are guided by all kinds of forces of which they are completely unconscious, and which are not the right forces. Compare this with what is really needed at the present time and you will realize the immense gravity of the present situation. Right next to our physical world lies another, non-physical or spiritual world. And this has never before influenced our world as intensely as it is doing as it is doing at the present time. People are not aware of this, however. They do not even notice when things get heart-stoppingly fearsome and terrible. Intensely illuminating words are heard in the world today. They should set vast numbers of people thinking, but people never notice, or at least they do not show it if they do. 
Some of you will remember that on a number of occasions in the last three years, I have said that when the history of this world war will be written in the future, unfortunately present-day critics have not done so, though it could be done fairly easily, it will be impossible to use the method which has produced the legend, the fairy tale, or call it what you will, which currently goes by the name of history. This was produced by scholars, in quotes, as the world calls them. Sitting in libraries for months, years, and decades, and studying diplomatic records in order to write their histories. Inevitably, a time will come when most of these histories will have to be pulped. In fact, no one will be able to write the history of these last years by such a method unless they are literally off their heads. The causes of the chaos will not be apparent to the people who have been writing histories until now but only two people who have a real feeling for what it means when a miserable individual of our time has to face a court and is forced to sum up the condition he was in at the time by flinging down before the world the lamentable statement, first one thing happened, then another, and that was the moment when I went out of my mind. It was Sukh who spoke these pitiful words. Many people had gone out of their minds at that time, not only Sukh Amlanov. What kind of moments are these in world events, when the only way of describing them is by confessing that one has gone out of one's mind? They are moments when Araman and his cohorts gain access to the human race and to human thoughts. For as long as people watch over their conscious minds and their consciousness, is not in any way clouded or inactive, neither Araman nor Lucifer have access to it. But when it is not fully active and one needs to use the phrase, I have gone out of my mind, that is the moment when Araman and his cohorts enter the stage. The things that happen then will not appear in diplomatic records. Little by little of what it says in those records in recent decades makes real sense, by the way. Leaving this aside, the things that have happened in our time and have led to chaos are not merely human actions, but above all the actions of Aramonic spirits seeking to gain access by reducing human awareness. Some of you know very well that soon after the present catastrophe broke on the world, I pointed out that when we speak of the origins of this catastrophe in time to come, we must not do so on the basis of written records. Instead, we shall have to point to real facts through which our amonic spirits gained access to the stage of human events. These things must be taken in all seriousness. They have to be seen as concrete realities and not merely as abstract formulations. People who do not know anything about it may well laugh when one says that Araman gained access to human evolution. They may well laugh at people who say this. But the day will come when world history laughs them to scorn for having laughed at others today. We certainly cannot say that the judgments, ideas, and notions to be found on the surface in recent years show any degree of maturity. People even failed to understand when, eighteen months ago, it was pointed out somewhere that something might soon happen of which due note should be taken. It should not be taken lightly. Concrete examples given as an indication of what was likely to happen were never taken in the right way. People were not sufficiently awake in their minds to do so. Now the event has come, and people fail to realize that something is taking root deeply in a certain soil. People are taking it as something which, well, because a certain number of statements take up so many lines, people accept that a, except they have a certain number of statements made in that particular number of lines, they are not at all interested in looking for the roots of such statements, but simply take things at their face value. I think you know what I mean. You know I am referring to the papal note as something I had seen coming for 18 months. Footnote. On August 1st, 1917, Pope Benedict XV issued a peace note to the governments of the belligerent nations. End of footnote. 
I have looked around a good deal to see if I might not find someone who has expressed their views on this note or asked the kind of question that should have come to mind. Let us remember that the idea of the state as we know it today has been dawning since the 16th century. In some parts of the world, peculiar people known as historians are speaking of states as something which have existed for I do not know how long, but they know little about real history. The present-day idea of a state is no more than four or five hundred years old, and something entirely different existed in earlier times. It is important to know this and be really clear about it. The priestly element, which is to be found in Rome, is indeed older than our modern states. It had its justification in its own day, when it brought about many things in the world. I have tried to find out, if people are asking themselves the question, what does it really mean that the modern structures, which have developed over four or five centuries, cannot find a way of achieving order out of their own resources, and look back to the old priestly element as something to be discussed in the way people generally discuss things today? It would interest me to know if anyone faced with the question as to whether it is a good idea to skate on ice when it is only one millimeter thick would actually answer in the affirmative. Relative to what we are really dealing with, the concepts on which people base their opinions when a priestly element brings impulses into modern life today are like a one millimeter layer of ice covering the water. The things people write and say today are like someone skating on ice that is not more than one millimeter in thickness. No one is trying to understand what is happening. No one is prepared to see that what matters is not to take a document and look at the statements it contains, but to know that a statement can mean something totally different, depending on the source from which it comes. Everywhere today we are faced with the need to warn people in all seriousness to look to the origins, to see how things are related, to look for realities and not to the way things look on the surface. Surely it cannot be that difficult for anyone to admit, I see the way things are, but I do not yet understand them and I, therefore I will not say anything to interfere. Considering the incredibly superficial level of education, it is not at all surprising when people are able to understand and have an opinion on everything. People find it very difficult to admit that they cannot judge an issue and need to get a basis for their judgment before they give an opinion. In fact, it hardly ever comes to their minds that one has to have a basis on which to form an opinion. Infinitely much depends on real insight into the driving forces especially for the immediate future. It has to be realized that the chaos will certainly not be reduced if, speaking hypothetically, the churches were to succeed in establishing even the initial stages of apparent order. The worst error we can fall into would be to say, it does not matter where peace comes from, even if it is from the Pope. The point is, it may actually cause no harm at all to have peace initiated by the Pope, the question is how those who are involved see the issue. Again and again we need to be really clear in our minds that the present time is literally challenging us every hour, indeed every minute, to wake up. Anthroposophy as a science of the spirit can only be understood by those who are able to grasp that humanity is being asked to make a clear decision. Either the spirit is understood or the chaos continues. A papered over chaos would be no better than the carnage we have today. If we are unable to come up with anything better than materialism, and again materialism, even a heightened materialism in the next few years, and if it were to happen that the events of the last three years to which humanity has failed to wake up and take notice were to lead to a new rush for material goods, many people are longing for this as something that comes with peace, then souls would once again go through the gate of death and thirst for destruction here on earth. There would be no end to the destruction. All it needs is to get an idea, a feeling, an inner impulse for the need to turn to the things of the Spirit. Then we shall progress 
depending on the extent to which this is achieved. Anyone who wants to gain a little understanding of the present position and looks at our time in the light of the serious truths we have been considering must develop a reasonable degree of feeling for all the terrible, hopelessly commonplace and superficial things that are now be, being written and said in this world. Imagine a band of children smashing up all the pots and plates, glasses and everything in the house. The adults who see this happening are considering how to stop it, for the children keep running to the larder and all over the house to find more things to smash. Finally, the adults have an idea as to how they can stop it. A number of people who are watching, people who actually consider themselves to be the teachers of these children, find a solution. They take care that everything breakable is collected and smashed to pieces, and that, they think, should put an end to it all. I do not know how many people would not consider those teachers to be fools. This is the kind of situation where people would see the truth. Yet there are people who consider themselves to be wise and who say to the whole world, Carnage must continue until peace comes. Everything has to be broken, so there will be nothing left to smash in the world. This is considered wisdom. Go on murder murdering people for as long as you can, and you will stop the murder. This is wisdom. For anyone who has even a spark of logic, it is no longer wisdom when the teacher says to a band of children, to make sure nothing else gets smashed up, I will quickly get people to collect all other breakable objects and smash them. I reckon nothing else will get smashed after that. Why do people call this foolishness and, other, and the other thing political foresight? Because people's thinking stops at the very point where it should be most intense, which is where their thoughts relate to great questions of destiny. We shall continue with this tomorrow and consider some serious spiritual truths. The end of Lecture 1 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com This is a reading of a cycle of lectures entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness by Rudolf Steiner. This is Lecture 2 entitled Humanity's Struggle for Morality given in Dornach on the 30th of September, 1917. Today's lecture will add further details to an image which I finally hope to present in its entirety tomorrow. We are living at a time, yesterday's lecture will have given you an idea of this, of which we can say that much will have to change in the way people think, feel, and use their will. Our inner aims will have to change, it is especially with regard to our innermost being that old, inherited, and acquired habits will have to go and a new way of thinking and feeling develop. This is what our time demands. I think it can have a profound and truly significant effect on people to ponder the truth I presented yesterday, which is, to put it simply, that there can only be one of two things destructive processes here on the physical plane or the spiritual development of humanity. Just think what it means that, knowing this truth, we shall be compelled to feel socially at one with the dead, the departed. Our inner response to present events on this physical plane is one of deep pain, and it is right this should be so. On the other hand, we should not forget that the number of people who have taken up spiritual life in recent decades is small, and the souls of those who have not done so are thirsting for destructive processes here on the physical plane, because these will give them the powers they need for the life of soul and spirit which comes after death. In practice, this means we are challenged to do everything we can to encourage spiritual life as the only way of freeing future humanity from those destructive forces. It has to be clearly understood, of course, that this was different in the past, when the fact that an age of materialism must inevitably summon up an age of wars and devastation did not hold true to the same degree. It will, however, hold true in future. 
Humanity is laboring under numerous illusions that have their origin in the past. The consequences of these have not been as serious in the past as they will be in the future evolution of humanity. I think it is fair to say that, generally speaking, human souls are still very much asleep at the present time and fail to notice many of the tremendous changes now taking place. Sometimes, however, some of this comes through at an instinctive level, and individuals are then aware of the great riddles of the age. However, many are not fully active inwardly, and therefore not yet able to experience these riddles in their full depth. Taking note of the turbulent and destructive events of today, some individuals are becoming aware of one such riddle, yet they are, in many respects, quite unable to find the answers. The riddle I am speaking of is the discrepancy between intellectual and moral development in human evolution. Strangely enough, recent developments in materialistic thinking have led none other than the Darwinists to this conclusion. Haeckel, too, has commented to this effect in his title Weltretzel, which means world riddles. Now in these times of war it can be seen again and again that this imbalance between intellectual and moral life in human evolution is beginning to puzzle people. They say to themselves, quite rightly, that the life of the intellect, the rational mind, has made tremendous advances. This is what many people call the realm of science today. It provides the basis for the modern materialistic view. Consider the tremendous advances made as the laws of nature have been penetrated, studied and finally used to build all kinds of instruments. Most recently, especially the instruments for murder. People will also begin to consider other things in the light of this science of theirs. They will analyze foods for their constituents and manufacture chemical foods, never realizing that chemical foods are not the same as those provided by nature, even if they do have the same constituents. Intellectual, or we may also say scientific development, has shown an upward trend. Moral development has not progressed to the same extent. Surely the present world catastrophe, catastrophe could not have arisen or taken the course it has taken if moral development had kept pace with intellectual development. It would be right to say that because moral development has not progressed, intellectual development has assumed something of an amoral character and has in many respects become downright destructive. Many people are beginning to notice that the moral development has not been keeping pace with the intellectual development of humanity today. However, no one asks at the present time that issues like these should be gone into sufficiently deeply so that they may serve a truly human evolution. No one asks that they should be tackled at the point where it is fully evident that modern people simply cannot penetrate to the deeper sources of human thinking and human actions, because elements which are separate and distinct in man and relate to quite different regions of the universe are all mixed up in people's minds. Modern scientists are faced with a human being consisting of physical body, etheric body, the body of generative powers, astral body and ego, but everything is mixed up. People do not make the distinction in modern science. How can we arrive at a science that will enable us to grasp these things if everything is mixed up together? The truth is that these different aspects of human nature belong to entirely different regions and spheres of the universe. Our physical body and our generative powers relate to the physical world. With the astral body and the ego we enter a totally different world every night and initially this has extraordinarily little to do with the world in which we are awake during the day. The two worlds really only work together insofar as they are brought together in the human realm. Consider also that the human ego and astral body 
are much younger than the physical and etheric bodies. The first beginnings of the physical body go back to the time of ancient Saturn. That early body progressed through four stages, Saturn, Sun, Moon and Earth, to reach its present level of evolution on Earth. The etheric body has gone through three stages, the astral body through two stages. The ego has only come in during Earth evolution. It is young and belongs to an entirely different cosmic age. The apparatus or instrument of our human intellect is intimately bound up with the physical body. It has reached a great level of perfection because the physical body has gone through such a comprehensive process of development in the Saturn, Sun, Moon and Earth periods. We can see this from the level to which the nerves, the brain and the blood have developed. This then is the highly developed instrument we use for our intellectual activity. On a previous occasion, here in Dornach, I suggested that the human being is much more complex than we are inclined to think. When we say, in quotes, physical body, we are speaking of something that is far from simple. It is based on principles that go back to ancient Saturn. Then the etheric body was added. This created its own element in the physical body. The astral body also created its own element in the physical body and so did the ego. The physical body thus really has four elements to it. One of these relates to the physical body as such, one to the etheric body, one to the astral body, and one to the ego. The etheric body has three elements, one related to itself, one to the astral body, and one to the ego. Let us stay with the physical body for the moment. We find that during the night when we are asleep, the element of the physical body relating to the physical body continues in the usual way. The element relating to the etheric body can also continue, for the etheric body stays with the physical body. But what happens to the element relating to the astral body, which is organized to meet the needs of an astral body that wants to go outside, and with the element relating to an ego which has also gone outside. During the night these two elements, let us call them the astral physical body and the ego's physical body, are forsaken by the principles on which their whole organization is based. The ego and the astral body are then outside the parts of the physical body to which they belong. For as long as we live between birth and death, we are really leaving something behind in bed every night which is not taken care of by the principle to which it relates. It clearly has to function differently during the night than it does during the day. I think you can see this. During the day the astral body and the ego are active and aglow in it. During the night they are not. People do not inquire into these things today because everything has merged into one and become mixed up in their minds, as I have said. They do not distinguish between the different aspects of their body, though these can be quite clearly distinguished. During the night when we are asleep, the astral-physical element in the physical body exercises powers very similar to the powers of mercury, the mercurial powers that make mercury liquid and so on. The part of the physical body relating to the ego acts like salt during sleep. Human beings thus have salt and mercury flowing through them during sleep. Up to the 14th century, those alchemists who must be taken seriously still knew of these things. After this, sectarianism came into alchemy and the books were written which are generally read today. The old knowledge was still to be found with Jakob Burma, however, who used the terms salt, mercury and sulfur. These are some of the secrets of human nature. We say then that when we are asleep we look down on a body that has become mercurial and salty. The fact that the body becomes mercurial has highly significant consequences 
and we may be able to say more about this in the course of these weeks. The fact that it becomes salty, well, I think it is not at all difficult for people to discover this for themselves when they get up in the mornings. What is the significance, however? It is more or less like this. On waking, the ego and astral body, having been outside in the world of the spirit during sleep, enter into the salty or mineral principle in the human body and into the mercurial principle, which flows within the human being as a vitalizing principle. Principles which have been separated during the night now come together. As they interact, opportunity is given for the things acquired in the world of the spirit to be brought in. Mercury and salt have been resting. Now the ego and astral body enter and fill them with what they have gained in the world of the spirit. As a result, the physical body, the instrument which has evolved from ancient Saturn, is enriched still further. On the one hand, the physical body is the instrument we use for intellectual activity, and it is truly venerable and highly developed because it has evolved over such a long time. Yet on the other hand, the process I have just described can bring the influence of the spiritual world to bear in the present time. As a result, human beings are now able to influence the instrument of the intellect from the world of the spirit, and intellectual thinking can play such a significant role in the present age. The world in which we are, between going to sleep and waking up again, does, however, have one peculiarity. There is nothing in it by way of moral laws. Strange as it may seem, between going to sleep and waking up again, you are in a world devoid of moral laws. We might also say it is a world that is not yet moral. When we wake up, the impulses we bring from this world may take hold of the physical body and the etheric body with regard to the intellect, but cannot in any way take hold of them in any moral sense. This is quite impossible, for the world in which we are, between going to sleep and waking up again, does not have moral laws. People who think it would have been better for the gods to arrange things in such a way that humans did not have to live on the physical plane at all are very much mistaken. For in that case, people could never become moral. Human beings acquire morality by living here on the physical plane. In short, we bring wisdom to the physical body from the world of the spirit, but not morality. This is tremendously important and significant, for it explains why humanity must inevitably lag behind when it comes to moral principles, whereas the gods have made excellent provision for their intellectual development, not only providing them with an instrument which has evolved through the Saturn, Sun, Moon and Earth periods, but also giving them the wherewithal by which to maintain the intellect by filling them with wisdom in the world which they enter during sleep. It will not be until later periods, in the second half of Venus evolution, that we make connection with a moral world during sleep. Clearly, it is therefore tremendously important for us to see to it that our social life becomes truly moral. These are the things modern humanity does not want to consider. Some are aware of the riddles, as I have said, but people do not want to consider the deeper reasons for that would be too much of an effort. They want to take human nature as it presents itself and refuse to consider that in many respects it extends into the worlds of the cosmos beyond space and beyond time, and that human nature cannot be explained if we merely look at it the way in which it normally comes to expression and do not take account of these other aspects. It is a magnificent and awesome truth that sleep helps our intellectual thinking, even our genius, for geniuses too bring back elements from sleep that enter into their mercurial and salt principles. In fact, it is this which makes someone a genius. But morality can only be provided for if human beings gradually 
let the moral element enter into them here on the physical plane. For humanity here on earth, the Christ impulse is the heart of the moral life. It is therefore most important, I have stressed this before from other points of view, that human beings encounter the Christ impulse here on the physical plane. We have to look at this from many different points of view. So it seems we can now understand why people who have all kinds of impulses based on wisdom at an instinctive level these impulses are given in sleep, are able to invent tremendously complex machines, playing a role in the advance of science and technology, need not connect this in any way with morality, for morality belongs to a totally different sphere. People do not like to hear or know such things today, yet they will have to be known if we are to escape from the chaos that has arisen in the world. And this is a very serious matter, Human evolution will not progress unless these truths become part of our life on earth. The gods did not intend human beings to become automatons, which they could influence like automatic machines. They wanted them to be free individuals who realize what will take them forward. It is wrong to ask why the gods do not intervene. Attempts have to be made, and if one such undertaking should go awry, we should not draw the wrong conclusions. Instead, those who come later must let this give them an even greater impetus to work in a way that helps to encourage such an attempt at further development in the spirit. I have recently been much concerned with a significant attempt made in the past which did not entirely come off. I discussed this in the first part of my essay on title The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. Anno 1459. It is to be continued in title Das Reich. The work was written in the early 17th century. People were given it to read as early as 1603, and it was published in 1616. The author, Johann Valentine Andrea, also wrote title Fama Fraternatis and Confessio Rosicruci, Unusual works, which attracted all kinds of comment, some sensible, but most of them absurd. All I want to say about them today is that although they may at first sight appear to be satirical, they nevertheless represent one great impulse, to deepen insight into nature in its spiritual aspect to a point where deeper knowledge of the laws of nature also discovers the laws that govern human social life. This is an area where people find it particularly difficult to distinguish between maya, illusion, and reality. The motives we ourselves or others tend to ascribe to our actions are not the true ones. It is painful to have to realize this, but I have spoken of this on several occasions. They are not our true motives, nor are the outward positions people hold in social life their true positions. People are usually completely different inside from the way they present themselves in the social sphere and also from the way they see themselves. People believe so strongly that their actions are based on a particular motive. Some think their motives are entirely selfless when in reality they are nothing but the most brutal egotism. People are not aware of this because they have such illusions concerning themselves and their social connections. This is another area where we can only discover the truth if we look more deeply into the whole scheme of things. Johann Valentine Andrea was someone who wanted to look more deeply. What mattered to him, among other things, was to see beyond Maya into reality. He was not the kind of superficial person who thinks he can do this with all those harangues profound educationists and others today think will reform the world. He realized that one must look more deeply into the whole scheme which lies behind the world of nature if one is to find the spirit in nature. Then one will also find the threads which truly connect human beings with the spirit. And only then shall we really know the social laws that are are needed. 
You cannot reflect on social relationships today if you think the way people do in modern science, for this will only give you the surface of nature and the surface of social life. Johann Valentine Andrea looked deep down to find nature and the social life, for only there do they come together. It really is like this. Think of the borderline between Maya and reality. There you have a peephole on nature on the one side and a peephole on social life on the other. And you have to look deeper before you realize that they actually only meet a long way back. People will never reach this point, however. They will continue to look at some of the laws of nature at a surface level and will then speak about social life out of their feeling, out of superficiality. This will not help us to see the scheme of things, however, that Johann Valentine Andrea sought to find. At most we shall get to be, excuse me, calling a spade a spade, a Woodrow Wilson. Andrea wanted to discover the scheme of things, and his desire to do so fills such works as his title Fama Fraternitatis, 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 there we go, and Confessio Rosicruci. He was addressing the leaders, the statesmen of his time. It was an attempt to establish a social order based on truth and not illusion. The Fama appeared in 1614, the Confessio in 1615, and the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz in 1616, though it had already been written in 1603. The year 1618 marked the beginning of the Thirty Years' War, which brought conditions in which the truly great things aimed at in the Fama and the Confessio were swept away. We are now living in an age when one year of war is equal to more than ten years of war in the 17th century because war has become so much more destructive. By the standards of those times, we have more than a thirty years' war behind us already. Try and see this as something you can guide, that can guide you toward the will and endeavor that arose in the seventeenth century, but was brought to a halt by the thirty years' war. As I have said, if there have been such attempts and a beginning has been made, we must not let ourselves be put off by this, but rather let it spur us on to even greater activity. Then a later attempt may not end in failure. The first condition is, however, that we really come to know life. I now want to relate these to matters I discussed with you last year and at the beginning of this year. I drew your attention to the strange course that the whole of human life and human evolution is taking. Individuals will gain in years, being one, two, three, four years old, and later thirty, thirty-five, forty, and so on years old. But the opposite is true for humanity as a whole. Humanity was old to begin with and is getting younger and younger. If we go back in time, for our present purposes we need only go back as far as the watershed between Atlantean and post-Atlantean life, when the catastrophe happened on Atlantis, we come first of all to ancient Indian times. Conditions were very different then. Humanity as a whole remained capable of further development beyond the fifties. Today we are only capable of developing in such a way in childhood and up to a certain time of our youth, for only then is our physical development directly connected with the development of soul and spirit, and the two run parallel. This soon comes to an end, however. In ancient Indian times, development in soul and spirit continued to be dependent on physical development until well into the fifties. People went on developing the way a child develops, and this only came to an end when they were old men and women. This is the reason why people looked up with such humility to their old people. During the time of ancient Persia, people were no longer able to develop to such a high level but only into their forties and early fifties, and in Egyptian and Chaldean times only into their forties. In Greco-Latin times this kind of development went only as far as the thirty-fifth year. Then came a time, you will remember, the Greco-Latin age began in the eighth century before the mystery of Golgotha, when human beings were only capable of development up to their thirty-third year. 
That was the time when the mystery of Golgotha took place. The age of humanity then matched the age at which Christ went through the mystery of Golgotha. After this, the human race got younger and younger. By the beginning of the fifth post-Atlantean age in the 15th century, humanity was only able to develop up to the age of 28, with no further development after this. And today we have reached a point where people only reach the age of 27, if this is left to nature. In the past, human beings naturally remained capable of development into a ripe old age. Today people must conclude such development as comes of its own accord and is tied to the physical body by the age of 27, unless they take up a spiritual impulse in their inner life and push on from within. People who do not take up anything spiritual remain 27 years old, even if they live to be 100. It means they have the characteristics of 27-year-olds. And with people refusing to look for inner spiritual impulses, we now have a culture and a social life that is 27 years of age. We do not grow beyond the age of 27 in our outer social life. This age now rules humanity. If we go on like this, humanity will go down to 26, 25, and 24 years, then in the sixth post-Atlantean age to the 21st, and later to the 14th year. These things must be looked into, and they should not be taken pessimistically. Instead, they should give us the inner impulse to go toward the life of the Spirit and set out on an inner quest to look for the elements nature is unable to provide. This is another point of view from which it is apparent that spiritual impulses are needed in civilization. The most characteristic people of our age, those who take the lead today, are people who do not get beyond their 27th year. The question is, what would really make someone a present-day leader? Well, let us say we have someone who is born and is very much alive, who does not take in much by way of tradition, but only what comes by nature, without undue influence from outside. This individual would be very much determined by what comes of its own accord. Education usually gives color and nuance to this in most people. But let us take a really typical individual who essentially shows only the characteristics of the present age, someone born into poverty perhaps and not given an education that puts much emphasis on tradition, but who would only be influenced by whatever arises from circumstance. Such a person would grow up would be very active initially, for it is part of the present age that one is active up to the 7th, 14th, and 21st year, and perhaps be a forceful personality up to his 21st year. But unless he is able to develop spiritually, then, being very much a representative of the age, he will come to a halt at the age of 27. Now, if he were to be truly representative of the age, something like the following would have to happen. At the age of 27, he would come to a key point in his life, to such effect that the circumstances he creates for himself at the age of 27, committing himself for life, would not allow him to progress beyond this. In modern life, this could take the form, for instance, that such a person a self-made man with tremendous energies and all kinds of impulses arising from the time itself, gets himself elected to Parliament at the age of 27. To get oneself elected to Parliament means one has committed oneself, and there are some things that now have to be maintained. And so the individual remains as he is, which is entirely due to this development in the present age. And he is highly representative of the present age, Parliament being the great ideal in the present day and age, this would be a key point in the life of an individual who would then refuse to accept anything capable of growth for the future and who would become completely adapted to external circumstances or, in a word, remained 27 years of age. And so at the age of 27 this would be a strong, powerful individual imbued with the impulses of the age who now entered Parliament. 
After some time, he would even be a minister and advance to become one of the leading figures. But he would merely be a man of our time, a typical 27-year-old. There is such an individual, someone born into such circumstances who only took in what came, nothing by way of tradition. He grew strong and powerful under these circumstances, someone who would go through thick and thin for anything that came to him in the first twenty-seven years of his life, and who did, in fact, become a member of Parliament at the age of twenty-seven. He was a thorn in the flesh at first, being in opposition, but soon rose further and has become a kind of axis of rotation at the present time, and this is Lloyd George. No one is more characteristic of the present age than Lloyd George. Quote, his own man, close quote. He committed himself for life within a week of his twenty-seventh year by getting himself elected to the House of Commons. This and the rest of his life story show him to be a typical representative of life in the present age, a life we should not follow, for spiritual impulses should have taken over in the twenty-seventh year. If one is able to penetrate the inner aspects of life, one sees the most important events of the present time to be events to which other people are asleep. To anyone who can make a wider view, it is immensely significant that such a self-made man is elected to the British Parliament exactly at the age of twenty-seven and thus commits himself. These are the realities which people must gradually learn to observe and consider for they reveal the deeper connections in life. People like to skip over them today because they are not easy. Reluctance is felt because people prefer to give free rein to their passions, the emotions they create for themselves in the outer world and to their instincts, rather than seek to gain insight. They want to live the life of the world, basing themselves on these emotions and not on their true selves. The end of Lecture 2. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness. This is Lecture 3, entitled The Search for a Perfect World, given in Dornach on the 1st of October, 1917. My intention is to give a series of lectures which will enable you to understand the present time and the immediate future, in some aspects at least. It should be a coherent whole, but it may sometimes be necessary to go a long way back. There will be a continuous thread through it all, but I would ask you to see the parts always in the context of the whole. I will sometimes go far and wide, to collect the material we need to understand the present time, and some of it may seem remote. When I say the present time, I mean quite a long period of time, going back several decades, and also looking decades ahead. It is important to realize that it will be necessary to present truths based on the science of the Spirit that in many respects go utterly against current and generally accepted beliefs. The world holds opinions that not only differ, but often are the direct opposite of the truths that have to be spoken out of anthroposophy. It is only to be expected, therefore, that people will consider these truths to be incredible, warped, and downright foolish. When truths which differed from generally accepted views had to be said in the past in order to open up a road to the future, the difference between those truths and common opinion was probably never as marked as it inevitably is today. This may not be, absolute, this may not be absolutely the case, but relatively speaking it is so. For people are tremendously intolerant in their hearts today and less able to accept views which differ from their own. In the immediate future, people will feel more strongly than ever before that the new and different views presented to them are fanciful and, and absurd. Nevertheless, truths that until now were closely guarded by small groups of people 
with strict silence demanded by anyone to whom they were made known, must increasingly be made public. It does not matter how public opinion and those who hold it react to these truths, nor do the prejudices and counter-currents matter that are provoked by them. The reason for this will be discussed later on in these lectures. To begin with, I must speak of some of the ways in which people will react to truths today and in the immediate future. People believe they have long since outgrown the illusions and superstitions of the past, yet in some respects they are entirely given up to illusion. There is a growing tendency to live in illusion concerning some important and essential aspects of the great scheme of things, and this to such an extent that these illusions become powers that rule the world, nations, and indeed the whole earth. It is important to realize this, for illusory ideas are a major element in the chaos in which we find ourselves today. In fact, they make it a chaos. Let me tell you of one common illusion which exists today and is closely bound up with the materialistic trends of the age. It is the growing tendency to form utterly wrong opinions about what, in the science of the spirit, is called the physical plane and the New Testament words that are fundamental in this respect, quote, my kingdom is not of this world, close quote, are increasingly less understood today. They are misunderstood insofar as the leading personalities of the outer world are caught up in the illusion that their kingdom should be very much of this physical world. What do I mean to say? Anyone who is able to see the reality and to see through it knows that this world on the physical plane can never reach perfection. Yet people who think materialistically have the illusion that perfection can be achieved on the physical plane. This is the source of many other illusions, and particularly and characteristically the socialist illusion of the present age. People's illusions come in all shades of meaning. They are colored by party politics and so on. People who take a liberal view of the world and of life have constructed their own ideal of the physical world and believe that if they realize this, we will have paradise on earth. All that the socialists are able to think of is how to arrange things on the physical plane so that everybody can live what they consider to be the good life, the same for everybody, and so on. Their vision of the future on this physical plane is of a wonderful paradise do examine the programs put forward by people who see themselves as belonging to the many different socialist parties, and you will see for yourselves. They are not the only people, of course, who have such views and opinions. Teachers also do, for instance. Today, every educational agitator and writer is absolutely convinced that it is up to him to establish the best possible educational system, the best principles of education one can think of. And in an absolute sense they really are the best. One cannot imagine anything better. To go against such endeavors must seem sheer madness to people. The way things are today, people simply must consider anyone who does not want things to be the best possible in the world to be evil-minded. One can understand people feeling this way. Yet it is not evil-mindedness that stops us from thinking their way, but a clear vision of the truth. It tells us that it is illusory to think such levels of perfection can be achieved in the physical world. And if it is a law that there never can be perfection in the physical world, just as it is a law that the three angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees, then people will simply have to face such a truth boldly, and not shrink from it. So, there you have the kind of illusion which arises from entirely materialistic premises. Many say they believe in the world of the spirit, but with many of them this is mere words, nothing but hot air. In their innermost hearts, in their feelings and unconscious impulses, lives something different, 
the inclination to think materialistically. However much people may pretend to themselves that they believe in something else, in reality they believe only in the physical world. And since they do not believe in anything more than just the physical world around them, the only ideal they can possibly have is to arrange things in the physical world in such a way that it becomes a paradise. Otherwise the whole world would make no sense to them. Until materialists are prepared to say that the world makes no sense at all, they can only live in the illusion that however imperfect this physical world may be, it will be possible to create conditions that will put an end to imperfection and let perfection take its place. Everything coming to the fore today in this respect, in general terms with all kinds of political, social, and other agitators making great words about it, or in specific instances such as in education, is based on illusion because people are unable to see the connections between the physical world and the other spheres of the world. In no way can they gain an idea of what Jesus Christ meant when he said, quote, My kingdom is not of this world, close quote, and why Jesus Christ did not want to bring a kingdom of perfection to realization here in the physical world. There is nothing in the Gospels to show that Christ intended to reform this outer kingdom of the physical world and make it into one of perfection. He certainly did not cherish that illusion. But he made up for this lack of desire to establish paradise in the physical world by giving people something which is not of this world. To let impulses enter into their souls which are always alive in the world but are not of this physical world. Illusions of this kind dominate the human race today in the widest possible sense. And this creates an unhealthy climate. People are free individuals and therefore free to live in illusion. In more down-to-earth contexts, their illusions would immediately be seen to be illusions. When we are dealing with physical objects, fools who invent things which merely work in theory are instantly seen to be under an illusion. It is not immediately obvious, however, in the vast field of social and political life. The following story is one I have told before. When I was a young fellow of 22 or 23, one of my fellow students came to me one day, his head aglow, absolutely fired with enthusiasm, and told me he had just made an important epoch-making invention. Oh, I said, that is nice. What are you going to do with it? Well, he said, I'll have to go and see Rattinger, our professor of mechanical engineering at the university, and tell him about it. No sooner said than done, and off he went. Rattinger was not free at the moment, and so the student came back. He had been given an appointment for later on. So I said to him, Why don't you tell me about it in the meantime? We have some time to spare. Tell me about your invention. It was a very clever thing. He had invented a steam engine that needed just a very small amount of coal to heat it up. After that, no more coal would be needed, for a special mechanism kept it going of its own accord. One merely had to start it up. This was certainly epoch-making. You will be wondering why we do not have it today. I got him to explain it all to me and then told him, You know, that is really clever, but if one looks at the whole thing, it is no different from wanting to get a railway truck going by getting into it and pushing as hard as you can from inside. Someone standing outside can, of course, get it to move, but anyone inside will not get it to move a millimeter even if they apply the same amount of energy. This is what it all came down to. Things will be extremely logical and clever, developed by applying all kinds of technical principles, and they may still be nonsense, having been thought up without taking account of reality. What matters is not to be merely clever or logical, but to relate to reality. In the end, the student never went to see the professor. When one is dealing with physical matter and mechanics, such a thing will soon be obvious. But in social and political affairs, and with reference to what in its widest sense may be defined as making everyone happy, 
it will not be immediately obvious. You can easily put forward ideas of exactly this kind. People will be impressed and believe you. Yet it is all a matter of being inside the truck and pushing from there. A time will come when a certain basic characteristic of the present time may actually be labeled with a particular name, a name that will typify a way of thinking which at heart is utterly illusory and unreal. I am very sure that in future people will speak of early 20th century Wilsonianism, for Wilson's ideas are typical of those of someone who wants to push a railway truck from inside. All the basic ideas of Wilsonianism, which make such an impression today, are utterly unreal, though they also have a major influence on people for other reasons. They are powerful for the very reason that they cannot be realized. Any attempt to implement them, it would soon show them to be meaningless. But people are able to imagine they could be implemented. If we were to, if we were able to implement Wilsonian ideas, world philistinism would be realized throughout the world. Woodrow Wilson really deserves to be made the universal savior of general philistinism. Of course, Philistines would not actually do all that well in a world organized by Wilson, which anyway cannot be realized, but at least they imagine that if Wilson's ideas were to conquer the world, we would be able to live according to our ideals. A time will come when people say, at the beginning of the 20th century a peculiar ideal arose, which was to make the world into a perfect image of Philistine or bourgeois ideals. Wilson's ideas will be analyzed one day and presented as typical of the early 20th century. You see, we have not only small but also big examples of illusory ideas in our time. These illusions and unreal ideas are held not by otherworldly sects, but by groups whose beliefs spread far and wide. Important and vital, genuine truths must now be proclaimed to the world for the reasons and because of the kind of conditions we have been discussing, they will show little relationship to the general opinions of today. Different conditions have to be created to enable people to grasp the truth. The truths which must inevitably come up are repulsive to many people today. They are thoroughly uncomfortable. The truths people like and ask for are convenient truths, for that is the way people are today. Some of these uncomfortable truths will have to be presented in the course of these lectures. They need to be made known out of a feeling of responsibility. And above all, they must relate not only to the physical plane, they must cut across the illusions people have of the physical plane and offer reality rather than fantasy. The most unrealistic and fantasy-ridden people today are those who consider themselves to be more or less entirely realistic. One makes the strangest discoveries in this respect. I was recently sent a kind of lexicon listing the names of writers. It purports to list the names of all writers who have a connection with Judaism and anything which seeks to bring Judaism to realization in this world. I am one of the writers listed in the book, the reason being that according to the author of the lexicon, I have many similarities with Ignatius de Loyola, who is stated to have founded the Jesuits precisely because of his Judaism. Furthermore, I come from a border region between Germans and Slavs, which is where I happen to have been born, though my family certainly do not come from there. And apparently the fact that I come from there indicates that I am Jewish in origin. I have no idea why. This does not really surprise me for I think you will agree that even odder things are published today. But the lexicon also includes Hermann Barr as someone who is prom promoting Judaism. I was merely leafing through the book. Yet he is an out-and-out -out Upper Austrian. It is really and truly impossible to think of any way in which he can be connected with Jewish blood or the like. Nevertheless, this literary lexicon quotes a well-known literary historian as saying that Hermann Barr definitely had Jewish traits. Well, when I was said to be Jewish on one occasion, 
These things are not new. I had a photograph of my certificate of baptism made. Hermann Bahr also had to jump through those hoops because a literary historian had said he was Jewish. Bahr wanted to establish the truth. The literary historian then said, well, his grandfather may have been a Jew, but it simply is not possible to find anything in Bahr's family which is not absolutely Upper Austrian German. This was, of course, an embarrassment for the literary historian, but he would stick to his opinion. He went so far as to say that if Hermann Bahr were actually to present the certificates of baptism for the last twelve generations to show that he did not have a drop of Jewish blood from anywhere, then he, the historian, would believe in reincarnation if forced to do so. So, you see, the reason for believing in reincarnation is a highly peculiar one in the case of this renowned and widely read literary historian. There are times today when it is really difficult to take what is said by famous people at all seriously. It is a pity, of course, that it is so difficult to convince the wider public of this. People are rather in the habit of believing in authority, despite the fact that modern people do not believe in authority at all, of course. Such at least is their opinion. Yesterday we were able to learn something about the opinions people have of themselves. Today, when people's basic instincts sometimes take them so far from the truth, it is extremely difficult to accept the truths relating to the region which borders immediately on the physical world. To characterize anything relating to this region, one has to appeal to healthy, incorrupt minds, and this presents the greatest difficulties one can imagine. For when it comes to the truths which must now be made known, the whole constitution of the human soul will be affected even if people merely get to know them, let alone gain direct perception of them. External knowledge about the physical world has a certain effect, let us say, on the human head. But truths which go deep, even if only to the depth where they relate to the world immediately next to the physical world, touch the whole human being and not only the head. To proclaim such truths one must be able to depend on a sound, incorrupt mind. In many spheres of life today, a sound, incorrupt mind is almost a rarity, whilst unsound, corrupt minds are far from uncommon. And the way individuals accept truths today strongly reveals the particular nature of their life of instincts and drives the whole constitution of their souls and their state of mind. People with corrupt instincts who are unwilling to apply some degree of discipline to their lifestyles quickly tend to take an attitude which is completely determined by the base mind, particularly when the truths to be accepted relate to the world bordering on the physical world. This happens only too easily. If people do not take a healthy objective interest in what goes on in the world, if they are essentially only interested in anything that relates to themselves, this will often corrupt their mind and attitudes to such an extent that they do not have the right instincts for occult truths and particularly for truths relating to the world bordering on the physical world. With respect to the physical world and anything relating to it and to all the great advances humanity has made, I think I can say that physical nature makes sure this corruption does not go too far in human minds. People are confined within the limits imposed by physical nature. They cannot get very far with their instincts and have to obey the laws of nature. When we move from the physical world into the one bordering on it, we are no longer on those leading reins. Guidance has to take another form and a different inner certainty is needed. This is only possible, however, if the mind is incorrupt as we go beyond the physical level. Otherwise we lose all control in that other region where we are no longer controlled by physical nature, nor by social and traditional prejudices. We are suddenly quite free and cannot bear such freedom. For instance, the physical world has many ways of preventing people from lying. 
If someone were to say at six o'clock in the evening that the sun had just come up, nature would soon demonstrate this to be wrong. It is like this with many things relating to the physical world. If people insist on talking nonsense about things relating to the higher worlds, even if it is only the one immediately next to our own, the physical world will not immediately show them to be wrong. This, then, is the reason why people may lose all control if they rush to escape the discipline which is imposed in the physical world. Here we have one of the great problems which may arise when truths relating to the non-physical world are presented. Yet the answer always has to be that it is simply necessary to present these truths today. We must not forget that truths relating to the non-physical world cannot be received in the same frame of mind as truths relating to the physical world. To take them in, we must slightly loosen the etheric and astral bodies. Otherwise, we shall hear, we shall only hear words. The state of mind has to be such, and with reference to the phenomena of the subjective inner life, it merely is a state of mind, that for any real understanding of the things of the spirit, one has to loosen the etheric and astral bodies a little. This loosening should only be a means of gaining understanding of the world of the spirit. It must not become an end in itself. This would be a very serious matter. Imagine, to take an extreme case, someone comes to an anthroposophical lecture, not in order to gain insight into the realms of the spirit, which would be the right thing, but because he thinks this is truly mystical. As he listened, he would let the words flow through him, as it were, because this would slightly loosen the ether body and the astral body. People certainly do come to lectures of this kind, sometimes also to those on pseudo-spiritual science, and listen in a kind of sleepy ecstasy. They are not really interested in the content, but more in the feeling of voluptuous pleasure which comes when the ether body and the astral body go partly outside the physical body. There may be other situations in life when to be thus given up or warm is a good thing. It is no good at all when it comes to revealing the truths relating to things of the Spirit. This must be properly understood. If spiritual truths are rightly understood and if people are, in all seriousness, following the lines of thought used to develop concepts which may make the world of the Spirit accessible to our understanding, their humanity will be enhanced and they will learn the things which have to be known at the present time for the salvation and further development of humanity. People who take these truths into themselves in the right way will also find their drives and instincts ennobled and raised to a higher level. By merely listening to spiritual truths, they go through a development that is for the good. Anyone who is not willing to accept anthroposophical truths in this sense, but is perhaps doing so from some kind of purely personal interest, let us say he wants to belong to a society and has not found another one which suits him as well as the anthroposophical society does, anyone who comes to this society with personal interests may indeed find that spiritual truths will first of all activate low instincts, and perhaps even the lowest of the low. It, therefore, does not come as a surprise that people who really should not be members, but nevertheless do come and hear such things, find their lowest instincts brought to life. It is something that cannot be avoided at this time, for these things have to be made public, and it is difficult to draw the line. The right way will only be found if those who have the inner justification to be part of such a movement, use their wide-awake judgment and take themselves to task. People who in any way bring personal interests to bear before or after leaving the society merely show that they never should have been members. And I think it is not really difficult to distinguish between personal interests and interest in objective understanding. But it is not surprising that in the situation which has arisen, because it is now necessary to make things generally known, it happens again and again that some of the instincts of the lower human nature come to the fore. 
The potential dangers must be consciously and clearly considered and ways must be found to correct them. If we take the right attitude to these dangers, we shall certainly be able to meet them. This is very much a time, it is part of the chaotic situation we are in, when aberrations of this kind are far from uncommon. The tragic situation of today makes tremendous demands on the powers of many people. It is true to say that people who were not in the habit of working hard in the general rather than merely personal interest really have learned to work hard in the last three years. Many people have learned to work and to acquire general interests. People who rightly belong to our movement will have come to it out of more than personal interest. Nevertheless, the present age does offer enormous opportunities for a kind of lazy outsider attitude. The special constellation created by the war means that some people have really nothing to occupy them. If they are part of our movement, they will also be aware of it. Before the war, we had many lecture tours. A whole raft of people would get together and travel from one lecture to the other. Outer interest may have been lacking, but excitement could be found. And if this did not come from outside, people created their own excitements. This has now become difficult. It cannot be done. However, some people have not found a way of occupying themselves usefully. That is why a lazy outsider attitude is to be found in our ranks exactly at this time, with people whiling away the time by creating all kinds of opposition. Being unable to get the excitement of traveling from lecture cycle to lecture cycle, they find other ways of entertaining themselves. This merely shows the true nature of the interest that formerly made them travel from lecture cycle to lecture cycle. When there is an inner obligation to represent philosophical truths before the world, in all seriousness and with dignity, you also know that more than fifty out of an audience of a hundred may well become opponents. That is a law. It is the way it is. If these fifty percent of such people do not actually become opponents, there will be a reason for this but it will not be because they are consistent. For reasons which have already been given and others that will be given, this is how matters are. Someone who represents anthroposophical truths is therefore not in the least surprised if there is opposition. We might take up the points that these opponents keep coming up with all the time, things they generally know better than anyone else to be untrue for they do, of course, know that they are not true, but it would be much more useful to consider the sources from which such opposition has sprung. All kinds of peculiar things will happen when we do so, and we shall then no longer feel inclined to take up the points that our opponents want us to take up. Instead, we are going to discover their true reasons. This can sometimes be more of an effort than to take up the points the opposition is making. Think of all the years in which lectures have been given here and how it has been necessary over and over again to say the same things I am also saying today, though this is always pointed out. But it is necessary to consider them with profound seriousness and dignity and to consider them in a way which is fitting for an ethoposophical movement. Believe me, I have more important things to do if I am to lead this movement and be fully responsible for it than to take account of the fact that three or four people, or even more if you will, get together and invent all kinds of gossip. I have more important things to do and never feel the inclination to go into such matters. But unfortunately this is so little understood. Even within this society, there is more interest in excitement and sensation than genuine scientific interest. From the scientific point of view, it is, for instance, interesting to study not only useful but also poisonous plants, but one has to find the right point of view. Very few of those who profess to follow anthroposophical spiritual science have even the least notion of the immense seriousness and importance of what it really should be. Forgive me for saying this. If there were the right seriousness, and if the importance of this were really understood, 
people's attitudes would in many respects be very different from what they are. Of course, I am not saying that people should turn their attention elsewhere. Rather, the opposite. We should not turn our attention away from the phenomena which go hand in hand with the will to destroy this anthroposophical movement. But we have to find the right approach. People may, for instance, write volumes on the way in which I have contradicted myself in my written works and with reference to all kinds of other things. One way of countering this would be to say that Luther was shown to have contradicted himself in hundreds of ways, not just a few dozen. His answer was, These asses are talking of contradictions in my works. I wish they would make the effort to try and understand just one of the things that appears to be in contradiction to other things. So, one way would be to point out something like this. But there is no need of this. For when people speak in opposition today, it is not because they are interested in finding and revealing contradictions, but for quite a different reason. Someone offered a manuscript to Philosophisch Anthroposophische Verlag, for instance, the publishing house was unable to use it, and therefore returned it to the author. From this moment the author, who until then had been running after me wherever I went, became an opponent. The real reason was not that he had found contradictions. If that were the real reason, we might use Luther's words. But we cannot do that, for the individual concern can only be seen in his true colors if we know that he is giving vent to his spleen because the publishing house was not able to publish his book. This was the real reason. So, if we simply listen to the things people say, we shall have little opportunity for getting at the truth, just as little, perhaps, as the literary historian who would convert to reincarnation if this allowed him to continue in the belief that Hermann Bar had Jewish connections. Conversion would be necessary if he were to be shown certificates of Christian baptism for Hermann Bar's ancestors down to the twelfth generation. Much is said about the courage which people are showing today. To assert the truths humanity needs today, in the sense I have spoken of, we'll need quite a different kind of courage, inner courage. But the place where this courage should be in the soul is occupied by cowardice, reluctance to take action, and this is tremendously widespread. In many respects it is due to this cowardice that anthroposophical spiritual science finds it so difficult to make its way today. It will make its way, but one should not sit back and accept. One should not think that things will go the right way without human involvement. One thing you will have to get used to, and it will be different from what you have been used to so far, is that I myself will have to be a lot less lenient in some respects than I have been until now. Do not think this is because I have changed my will and intention. You must look for the reasons in the existing situation. You will have to understand that I cannot let the movement which I have to represent before the world go to the dogs in any old way. Uh, Forgive the expression. Higher duties are involved than people may dream of. I cannot be involved in whatever excitements or sensations some group or set may be desiring. Consideration must be given to many general and more important interests and impulses than to the purely personal ambitions which rule one set of people or another. To find the right way of presenting anthroposophy, we simply must be able to set aside the purely personal element which for many is about the only thing that interests them today. And so I must conclude here today with something which I have always been saying in all the other places where I have been speaking these days. There are many members of our anthroposophical science of the Spirit who are truly dedicated and who have a clear idea of the seriousness of our work. But again and again there are others who do not belong and who behave in a way that simply would not happen if membership of the society were limited to those who rightfully belong to it. Things keep coming up among among members which are far removed from what is really intended. Some of these can only be said to relate to what is really intended if one takes a totally distorted view. 
Things are said by groups of people who have to be ignored, for our real interests go far beyond giving one's attention to the ambitions which are alive in those groups. Things are said there, and people are beginning to believe them, which have no more to do with our true intentions than a dung beetle has to do with a pendulum clock. It is quite impossible to see how they go together. Yet fantastic stories created out of base instincts that are left to run riot are set in circulation. And this despite the fact that the people who generate them know full well that not a word is true. Such things can be explained in natural science, but we must also draw the logical conclusion and take the necessary actions. In the first place, I am going to impose two rules on myself. Anyone who is going to speak of the one rule without the other will be saying something which is not true. I have made these two rules known in all the places where I have been giving lectures in recent months. In principle, I shall no longer continue to give private interviews to members of the Anthroposophical Society. For all those private interviews have led to reports which are full of lies. I have better things to do than refute the tales told by people who let their imaginations run riot, and so there is no other way but to discontinue these private interviews. Some individuals have a true esoteric impulse, and I will find other ways of making sure they are able to progress. It will just take a while. The measure should not prevent anyone from progressing in esoteric development, but, generally speaking, all private interviews must now stop. This, then, is the first rule. Do not come to me, as people have done in some local groups, and say it is a harsh rule. No, do not come to me. Go to those who are responsible. The second thing is that I release everyone who has ever had a private interview with me from the promise not to talk about it if they wish to do so. Anyone can tell anything they like about what has happened or been said in those private interviews, that is, in so far as they wish to do so. I am not going to prevent anyone from telling the whole truth about anything ever discussed with me in a private interview. These two rules go together. The one does not apply without the other. And as I said, if you think they are harsh, go to those who are responsible. Unless I am less lenient in these matters than I have been until now, the problems I am speaking of will not stop. As I said, I shall find other ways to make sure this does not harm anyone's esoteric development. Ways and means will be found. But people being as they are today, it is not possible to establish such a science without things going badly astray on occasion, with people always jumping to the wrong conclusions. This is why there will have to be these rules. People who take a serious and dignified approach to our spiritual scientific development may find it difficult to understand how such rules could come about, but they will accept the two rules as inevitable. From now on everything will be entirely in the open. There is nothing there which needs to shun the light. This is what is so shameful about it all. The truth and the whole truth could be told by everybody without leaving the least stain on our movement. But people have grown attached to something which has survived in our work as a continuation of earlier practices, to have individual interviews. If talking to individuals had not resulted in lies, the rule would not have been necessary. But everything ever said to any member can be truthfully told. Our movement can only gain from the truth. Go and tell as much as you like. The truth will not be affected by the lies which are told. But it must not even appear to be affected, for it is important for humanity that anything presented out of a background of spiritual science is presented in a serious and dignified way. So let me repeat once more. Without causing any loss to those who are seriously seeking esoteric development, I will generally no longer give private interviews for members. Everyone is free to tell everything they want about the interviews which have been given, but it must be the truth. I realize everyone from whatever vow of silence there may be. Or excuse me, I release everyone from whatever vow of silence there may be. But it should only be because individuals want to tell others for their own sake. 
They do not have to do it for my sake. And I have no objection to people spreading it about far and wide that these rules exist and and are characteristic of our movement. Then the world will realize the infamous nature of the things that are so often said, especially about our society. The end of Lecture 3 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness. This is Lecture 4, entitled The Elemental Spirits of Birth and Death, given in Dornach on the 6th of October, 1917. As I said in my earlier lectures, the time has come for humanity to know certain truths concerning the spiritual background to the physical world. If people are not going to be prepared to accept these truths out of their own goodwill, they will be forced to learn them from the terrible events that will happen as time goes on. The question may arise as to why now is the time for humanity to learn these truths, some of which are liable to shock people. They have, of course, existed for a long time, but humanity in general was protected and it did not have to accept them. Many of these truths were carefully guarded in the ancient mysteries, as you know, so that people in the surrounding areas were not exposed to the disturbing effect of these truths. Now we have often said that it is fear of the great truths that prevents people from accepting them. Those who have this fear today, and there are indeed many of them, could of course say, why cannot humanity go on in a kind of sleep state? where these truths are concerned. As it is, people have grown tense and fearful in recent times, and why should they be exposed to those great and fearsome truths? Let us go into this question. First of all, considering why from now on humanity has to be treated differently, as it were, by the world of the spirit, than has been the case so far in this post-Atlantean age. In my earlier lectures I spoke of the non-physical world which borders directly on our physical world. This is the world humanity will need to know about in the time which lies just ahead. You know, as soon as you enter into a non-physical world, everything is different from the way it is here. You get to know certain entities, and above all things of a special nature which are hidden from the sight of weak humanity. Sight here includes anything conveyed in ideas and insights. Why has the human eye, EYE, been deflected from this other world in the post-Atlantean age right up to the present moment? It is because there are entities in the next-door world, other higher worlds lie beyond it, which could only be made known to human beings under certain conditions. They have a specific function in the whole universe and especially also in human evolution. There are many different kinds of these entities in the other region. Today I want to talk to you about one class of such entities, the class whose function in the great scheme of things is connected with human birth and death. You should never believe that human birth and death are actually as they present themselves to the senses. Spiritual entities are involved when a human being enters this physical world from the non-physical and then leaves it again for the non-physical world. To give them a name, let us call them the elemental spirits of birth and death for the moment. It is true that the individuals who until now were initiated in the mysteries considered it to be their strict duty not to speak to people in general of these elemental spirits of birth and death. If one were to speak of them, and of the whole way in which these elemental spirits live, one would be speaking of something that would seem like red-hot coals to people, for this is how humanity has developed in the post-Atlantean age. We might also use another analogy. If people get to know more about the essential nature of these elemental spirits of birth and death, and do so in full consciousness, they come to know powers which are inimical to life in the physical world. Anyone with more or less normal feelings 
even today, will be shaken to learn the truth that in order to bring about birth and death in the physical world, the divine spirits who guide world destinies have to use elemental spirits who actually are the enemies of everything human beings seek and desire for their welfare and well-being here in the physical world. If everything was done just to suit the wishes of the human being, to be comfortable in this physical world, be fit and well as we go to sleep and wake up again and go about our work, if all spirits were of a kind to see to it that we have had such a comfortable life, birth and death could not be. To bring about birth and death, the gods need entities whose minds and whole way of looking at the world give them the urge to destroy and lay waste to everything which provides for the welfare of human beings here in the physical world. We have to get used to the idea that the world is not made as people would really like it to be and that there exists the element which in the Egyptian mysteries was known as iron necessity. As part of this iron necessity, entities hostile to the physical world are used by the gods to bring about birth and death for human beings. So we are looking at a world that is immediately next to our own, a world that day by day, hour by hour, has to do with our own world, for the processes of birth and death happen every day and every hour here on earth. The moment human beings cross the threshold to the other world, they enter into a sphere where entities live and are active, whose whole conduct, views and desires are destructive for ordinary physical human life. If this had been made known to people outside the mysteries before now, if people had been given an idea of these entities, the following would inevitably have happened. If people who are quite unable to deal with their instincts and drives with their passions had known that destructive entities were present around them all the time, they would have used the powers of those destructive entities. They would not have used them the way the gods do in birth and death, however, but within the realm of physical life. If people had felt the desire to be destructive in some sphere or other, they would have had ample opportunity to make these entities serve them, for it is easy to make them serve us. This truth was kept hidden to protect ordinary life from the destructive elemental spirits of birth and death. The question is, should we not continue to keep them hidden? This is not possible, and for quite specific reasons one of which is connected with a great important cosmic law. I could give you a general formula, but it will be better to use the actual form it is taking now and in the immediate future to demonstrate this law to you. As you know, not long ago, growing numbers of impulses came into human evolution which did not exist before and which are quite characteristic of our present civilization. Try and go back in your mind to times not very long ago. You will find times when there were no steam locomotives, when people did not yet use electricity as we do now. Times perhaps when only thinkers like Leonardo da Vinci were able to have the idea, theoretically and on the basis of experiments, that humans could create apparatus which would enable them to fly. All this has come to realization in a relatively short time. Just consider how much depends on the use of steam, of electricity, of the changes in atmospheric density which has made airships possible, or the knowledge of statics which has led to the airplane. Consider everything which has come into human evolution in recent times. Think of the destructive powers of dynamite, etc., and you can easily imagine seeing how swiftly this has gone, that new and different fabulous things of this kind will be the goal of future human endeavor. I think you can easily see that the ideal for the near future will be to have not more and more Goethe's, but more and more Edison's. This really is the ideal of modern humanity. Modern people, 
do, of course, believe that all this, the telegraph, telephones, the use of steam power, etc., happens without the participation of spiritual entities. This is not the case, however. The development of human civilization involves the participation of elemental spirits, even if people do not know about it. Modern materialists imagine that the telephone and telegraph and the steam engines, driven long distances and also used by farmers, have been constructed merely on the basis of what people produce by the sweat of their brow. Everything people do in this respect is under the influence of elemental spirits. They are always involved and helping us in this. People are not taking the initiative on their own in this field. They are guided. In laboratories, workshops, really everywhere where the spirit of invention is active, elemental spirits are providing the inspiration. The elemental spirits who have given impulses to our civilization from the 18th century onward are of the same kind as those used by the gods to bring about birth and death. This is one of the mysteries which human beings have to discover today. And the law of world history, of which I have spoken, is that as evolution proceeds, the gods always rule for a time within a particular sphere of elemental spirits, and then human beings enter into this same sphere and use the elemental spirits. In earlier times, the elemental spirits of birth and death essentially served the divine spirits who guided the world. Since our day, and this has been going on for some time now, the elemental spirits of birth and death are serving technology, industry, and human commerce. It is important to let this disturbing truth enter into our souls with all its power and intensity. Something is happening in this fifth post-Atlantean period of civilization, which is similar to something that happened in Atlantean times during the fourth Atlantean period. I have spoken of this before. Up to the fourth Atlantean period, the divine spirits who guide human evolution used certain elemental spirits. They had to use them because not only birth and death had to be brought about at that time, but also something else, which may be said to be closer to the earth. You will remember some of the descriptions I have given of the Atlantean age, when human beings were still flexible in their physical nature and their souls could make their bodies grow large or remain dwarf-like, with their outer appearance depending on their inner nature. Please call this to mind again. Today the service certain elemental spirits give to the divine spirits on occasions of birth and death is clearly apparent in physical terms. In those terms, when outer appearance was in accord with inner nature, certain elemental spirits were serving the gods for the whole of human life. When the Atlantean age had reached its fourth period, people again began to rule the elemental spirits, which had previously been used by the gods to govern, govern the growth and general physiognomy of human beings. Human beings gained control of certain divine powers and made use of them. The consequence was that from about the middle of the Atlantean age, it was possible for individuals who desired to harm their fellow human beings to use all kinds of creative powers on them, keeping them dwarf-sized in growth or making them into giants or letting the physical organism develop in such a way that the individual concerned would be an intelligent person or a cretin. A terrible power was in human hands in the middle of the Atlantean age. You know, for I have drawn attention to this, that this was not a kept secret, though not from any kind of evil intent. According to one of the laws of world history, something which initially was the work of the gods had to become the work of human beings. This led to serious mischief in the Atlantean age, so that over the last four or three periods of civilization, the whole of Atlantean civilization had to be guided 
toward its own destruction. Our own civilization was saved and brought across from Atlantis, as I have described elsewhere, and you will recall my descriptions of what happened in the Atlantean age. In the last three or two periods of post-Atlantean civilization, in the fifth stage of earth evolution, work now done by the gods will again become work to be done by humanity. We are only in the early stages of the technological, industrial and commercial activities which proceed under the influence of the elemental spirits of birth and death. This influence and its effects will be increasingly more radical. Until now the elemental spirits of birth and death have been guided by the gods and their influence has been limited to the coming into being and passing away of humans at the physical level. But the civilization of our own and future ages has to be such that these spirits can be active in technology, industry, commerce, and so on. There is also another quite specific aspect to this. As I have said, these elemental spirits are the enemies of human welfare and want to destroy it. We have to see things straight and not have any illusions concerning the radical nature of this. Civilization must progress in the fields of technology, industry and commerce, but by its very nature such a civilization cannot serve the well-being of humanity in the physical world. It can only prove destructive to the human wheel. This will be an unpalatable truth for people who never tire of making great speeches on the tremendous advances made in modern civilization, for they see things in abstract terms and know nothing of the rise and fall which is part of human evolution. I have made brief reference to the causes of destruction in Atlantis, a commercial, industrial and technological civilization which is now in its beginnings harbors elements which will lead to the decline and fall of the fifth earth period. And we only see things straight and face reality if we admit that we are here beginning to work on something which must lead to catastrophe. This is what it means to enter into iron necessity. Looking for an easy way out, people might say, all right, I won't take the tram. It might even go so far, though even members of the Anthroposophical Society are unlikely to take things this far, that people will not go on trains and so on. This would be complete nonsense, of course. It is not a matter of avoiding things, but of getting a clear picture, real insight into the iron necessities of human evolution. Civilization cannot continue in an unbroken upward trend. It has to go through a succession of rising and falling waves. There is, however, something else which can happen, something people generally do not want to know about today, but which is exactly what modern humanity will have to discover. Insight, a clear picture of the necessity which exists, is what will have to come to all human minds. It will necessarily mean that much will have to change in the frame of mind in which we consider the world. Human beings will need to live with inner impulses which they still prefer to ignore today, for these go against the good life they want. There are many such impulses. Let me give you just one example. People today, especially if they want to be good people, wanting nothing for themselves but only to be selfless and desire the good of others, will of course seek to develop certain virtues. These too are iron necessities. Now, of course, there is nothing to be said against a desire for virtue. But the problem is that people are not merely desiring to be virtuous. It is quite a good thing to want to be virtuous, but these people want more. If one looks to the unconscious depths of the human soul, one finds that in the present time people are not really much concerned to develop the actual virtues. It is much more important to them to be able to feel themselves to be virtuous, to give themselves up entirely to a state of mind where they can say, quote, I am truly selfless. Look at all the things I do to improve myself. I am perfect. I am kind. I am someone who does not believe in authority. Close quote. 
they will then, of course, eagerly follow all kinds of authorities. To feel really good in the consciousness of having one particular virtue or another is endlessly more important to people today than actually having that virtue. They want to feel they have the virtue rather than practice it. As a result, certain secrets connected with the virtues remain hidden to them. They are secrets which people instinctively feel they do not want to know, especially if they are modern idealists who like to feel good in the way I have described. All kinds of ideals are represented by societies today. Programs are made, and a society states its principles, which are to achieve one thing or another. The things people want to achieve in this way may indeed be very nice, but to find something nice in an abstract way is not enough. People must learn to think in terms of reality. Let us look at the aspect of reality when it comes to people having virtues. Perfection, benevolence, beautiful virtues, rights. It is nice to have them all in the outer social sphere. However, when people say, quote, it is our program to achieve perfection in some particular way, benevolence in some particular direction, we aim to establish a specific right, close quote, they usually consider this to be something absolute, which can be brought to realization as such. Surely, quote, people will say, quote, it must be a good thing to be more and more perfect, close quote. And, quote, what better ideal can there be but to have a program that will make us more and more perfect, close quote. But this is not in accord with the law of reality. It is right and good to be more and more perfect, or at least aim to be so. But when people are actually seeking to be perfect in a particular direction, this search for perfection will, after a time, change into what in reality is imperfection. A change occurs through which the desire for perfection becomes a weakness. Benevolence will, after a time, become prejudicial behavior. And however good the right may be that you want to bring to realization, it will turn into a wrong in the course of time. The reality is that there are no absolutes in this world. You work towards something that is good, and the way of the world would turn it into something bad. We, therefore, must seek ever new ways, look for new forms over and over again. This is what really matters. The swing of the pendulum governs all such human efforts. Nothing is more harmful than belief in absolute ideals, for they are at odds with the true course of world evolution. A good way of demonstrating things not to prove, but merely to illustrate, is to use certain ideas. And to some extent, ideas from the physical sciences can be used as symbols to illustrate non-physical ideas. Imagine you have a pendulum suspended here, and there's a drawing on the board. Now you see. If you take the pendulum to this point, to one extreme, and then let go, it will go to this point to find its equilibrium. It follows this path. Why does it do so? Because it is subject to gravity, people say. It goes down, but once it has reached the lowest point, it does not stop there. The downward movement has given it a certain inertia, which it uses to move to the other side. It then goes down again. It means that when the pendulum travels this distance, the downward movement gives it sufficient energy to swing to the other side. This provides an analogy that may be used to give a strong visual image of one thing or another. Thus we may say, a virtue, perfection, benevolence, goes in this direction, but then goes in the opposite direction. Perfection becomes weakness, benevolence, uncritical adoration, and right turns into wrong in the course of evolution. People prefer not to consider such ideas today. Just imagine trying to explain to a solid middle-class citizen who is establishing a society which is to serve certain ideals. You are now setting up an ideal. But in making it part of the process of evolution, you will create the opposite effect, and you will do so in a relatively short time. Well, he would think you are not only no idealist, but a real devil. 
Why should the effort to be perfect not go toward increasing perfection? And why should right not continue to be right forever and ever? It is extremely difficult for people today to have ideas based on reality instead of ideas that are one-sided abstractions. Yet they will have to learn to have such ideas, for they will not progress without them. They will also have to become used to the idea that progress in civilization will gradually make it necessary for us to use the elemental spirits of birth and death. And in doing so, humanity will have to live with the fact that a destructive element becomes part of human evolution. Every now and then, people who refuse to familiarize themselves with anthroposophy, which is the only means of finding the right attitude to such things, find the right ideas by themselves from instinct, What is the significance of all this? The elemental spirits of birth and death are, of course, messengers of Araman. The iron necessity of world evolution forces the gods to use Araman's messengers to control birth and death. When they ask the elemental spirits to act on their behalf, they do not allow the powers of these messengers to enter the physical world. But as civilization goes into its decline, from the fifth post-Atlantean period onward, this element has to come in again so that catastrophe may be brought about. Human beings must use these powers themselves. Araman's messengers are therefore an iron necessity. They have to bring about the destruction that will lead to the next step forward in civilization. This is a terrible truth, but it is so. And nothing will avail where this truth is concerned but to get to know it and to see it clearly. We shall be discussing this further and you will see how many things there are which call for the right attitude to these truths. Instinct, I have said, makes some people realize that something is necessary. One such individual is Ricarda Huch, who has written a number of excellent books at the present time though none that somehow comes even close to anthroposophy. Her latest work on Luther's faith is remarkable, not so much because of insight, but because of the instinct to be found in this book. If you read the first three chapters of the book, you find there a strange cry, I think we may call it such, a cry for humanity to find again what has really been lost since Luther came on the scene. Before his day atavistic clairvoyance still existed. Ricardo Huch says that what humanity needs most of all today is to get to know the devil. She does not consider it so necessary for people to come to know God. It is much more important, she says, to get to know the devil. Ricardo Huch does not know, of course, why this is necessary, but she has an instinctive feeling that it is so. Hence a remarkable cry for knowledge of the devil in the first chapters of the book. This is highly symptomatic and significant for our time. Her thinking is, people will come to know God again once they know that the devil is all around them. Individuals like this, who still do not want to take up anthroposophy, will always look for a way to apologize for their statements. Ricardo Huch does feel that people must get to know the devil as someone who is very real. But she immediately says, as a kind of apology, that one should not, of course, imagine the devil to be walking around in the street with horns and a tail. Oh, but he does walk around. Quote, they never know the devil is about, not even when he has them by the collar. Close quote. Modern abstract thinking immediately needs an apology, even if someone knows instinctively what is most urgently needed. But there is a good and real instinct for the present time behind this cry for the devil. People should not simply grow blindly, as if asleep, into what iron necessity demands of them in the immediate future, which is to use the messengers of the devil in our work, in laboratories, workshops, banks, and everywhere else. They have to use them so that civilization may progress, but they must know the devil They must know that the keys which are used, say, to unlock the vaults, have the devil's power in them. 
Ricardo Huch knows this instinctively, and people need to know it, for only knowledge will take us into the future in the right way. It is of immense importance that there are people who, out of instinct, point to the need which exists to know the devil and not walk past him fast asleep, for he is getting more and more powerful. Perhaps there is something else that is characteristic. I mention it only in passing. In Paradise, too, it was a woman who instinctively allowed the functions of the devil to enter into Paradise. I think it is not much to the credit of men in our civilization that they are still calling this kind of thing superstition and refuse to have nothing to do with it, once again leaving it to a woman. It may indeed be characteristic that a woman, Ricardo Huch, is calling for the devil just as once in paradise it was Eve who let in the devil. This merely as a passing comment. It is the devil who will and must be the bearer of our future civilization. This is a harsh truth, but it is important. It is intimately bound up with the fact that destructive powers will have to enter into the future progress of civilization. Above all, and I will speak of this tomorrow, Destructive powers will have to enter into the whole field of education, and especially the education of children, unless the matter is taken in hand with wisdom. Because of the general trend of civilization and the customary practices and emotions of people, destructive powers will also enter more and more into the whole social sphere. They will, above all, bring more and more destruction into the actual relationships between people. Humanity should seek to bring Christ's words to realization. Quote, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Close quote. Technological and commercial progress will not bring this to realization, but rather, where two or more want to fight and assault each other in my name, there am I in the midst of them. This will happen more and more in the social life. And because of this, there is a general difficulty today in presenting truths which will bring people together. Let us conclude by being clear in our minds, at least for the moment. We shall continue with the subject tomorrow and the day after, about the frame of mind in which people generally receive truths. People do not like to be told truths today because they simply do not believe truth to be something which comes to human beings directly from the world of the Spirit. Modern people believe truth must always be something grown in their own garden. People in their twenties have their own point of view. They do not need to be convinced of a truth. They do not need to have the truth revealed to them. They have their own point of view. And someone who has eagerly fought for the truth, a young fellow of 24, just finished at university, where he may have attended lectures on philosophy, he has his point of view and enters into discussion with another who has just as eagerly fought for his own truth. Each of them believes that the absolute certain truth grows in his own garden, even if the soil has not been prepared. People are not inclined to receive truths. They announce themselves the possessors of truth. This is the characteristic element in the present time. Ricarda Huch has put it rather nicely. She points out that in the period of enlightenment in Europe, our present state of mind, or call it what you will, which is absolutely awash with chauvinism, was preceded by Nietzscheanism, which was far more sublime than anything connected with native pride and chauvinism. Many, many people became followers of Nietzsche, and it was he who set up the ideal of the, quote, tawny beast, close quote. People actually had little idea of what this meant. Ricardo Huch says, people who did not even have what it takes to be a decent pet rabbit fancied themselves as tawny beasts of the kind Nietzsche presented. There you have the modern bourgeois point of view. One does not have what it takes to be a decent rabbit, but if someone establishes a high ideal, that is how they like to see themselves. One considers oneself to be this without doing anything to achieve it. People do not feel they need to develop, for they cannot bear the idea of being something in the future. They want to be something now. This splits them apart into human atoms, 
each with his own point of view and with no one able to understand anyone else. There in this mood, where no one can understand anyone else, you see the destructive powers at work in human society. This is driving people apart. It was, of course, the devil who presented people with the temptation to be tawny beasts. They did not actually become such beasts. But even so, the 19th century impulses which destroy social life in the 20th century have certainly taken root. We will continue with this tomorrow. The end of Lecture 4 You are listening to Rudolf Steiner Audio.com. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness. This is Lecture 5 entitled Changes in Humanity's Spiritual Makeup given in Dornach on the 7th of October 1917. The spiritual constitution is such today that we are getting to know grave and significant truths and insights, as you have seen. I have had to emphasize that the insights which humanity currently finds acceptable will not be adequate for the future, but we must know the reasons why such insights are not adequate. If we are to connect ourselves in all seriousness and dignity with the impulses which really have to be given for the further evolution of humanity. What I want to say today is perhaps best understood if I start by going back to the fourth post-Atlantean period. As you know, this began in the 8th century before the mystery of Golgotha and ended in the 15th century after the mystery of Golgotha, when human beings essentially related to the environment, the outside world, in a very different way from the way in which we inevitably must do today. I have often stressed that human evolution has to be taken seriously. Souls change much more than we believe, and it is part of the sheer modern laziness of mind to think that the inner life was just the same in ancient Greece, say, as it is today. Today I will merely consider one aspect of this, the relationship to the world around us. Lazy thinkers will say, the Greeks and the Romans perceived the world around them, and we, too, perceive the world around us. There is no appreciable difference. Oh, but there is an appreciable difference. It is actually true to say that today, at the beginning of the fifth post-Atlantean period, people perceive the world around them, insofar as it is perceptible to the senses in quite a different way from the ancient Greeks, for example. The Greeks also saw colors and heard sounds, but they still saw spiritual entities through the colors. They did not really think spiritual entities, for these made themselves known to them through the colors. In my book titled Riddles of the Soul, I attempted to make this peculiarity of the Greeks into a thread running through the whole book. Modern people think thoughts. The Greeks did not think thoughts in the same degree. They saw the thoughts which came to them out of the world they perceived around them. Instead of merely being blue or red, the blue and the red in the world around them told them the thoughts which they would then think. This created an intimate relationship to the world. It also created an intense feeling of being connected with an environment which had spiritual qualities. The nature of the human constitution was totally different in the fourth post-Atlantean period, and perceptions were therefore different. In the evolution of the present earth, distinction must be made between major epochs, a general description of which is given in title Occult Science. First and Second Age, Lemurian Age, Atlantean Age, our own post-Atlantean Age, and two which are to follow. We may say that during the Atlantean Age, both the earth and humanity had reached their midpoint. Up to then, everything was growth and development. In some respect, this has not been the case since the Atlantean Age. 
It certainly is no longer the case where the earth is concerned. When we walk on the soil today, I have mentioned this on a number of occasions, we are walking on something which is crumbling away. It is no longer something that is growing as it was in early times. Before and until the middle of the Atlantean age, the earth was much more of a growing, sprouting organism. It then started to develop cracks and fissures, we might say, and it was only then that the rocks of today, with their cracks and fissures, developed. This is something known not only in anthroposophy today. You find an excellent description of the breaking up, shattering of our present-day earth in Edward Soyce's outstanding scientific work titled The Face of the Earth. It might be Edward Seuss, I'm not sure if that's a German word, end of the side. Using broad brush strokes, he presents the outer conformation of the earth today, its face as it were, by outlining the properties of minerals, rocks, and the different formations to be found both on and in the earth, as well as the properties of organic life forms in the realm of the earth. Basing himself entirely on scientific facts, Soyce comes to the conclusion that the earth is decaying and crumbling away. This, however, is also true for all physical creatures which inhabit the earth. They are on the downward curve of evolution and have been so, essentially, from the middle of the Atlantean age. Evolution does, however, go in waves and it is possible to say that the fourth post-Atlantean period, the Greek and Roman civilization, was a kind of recapitulation of what existed in the Atlantean age. Up until the time of ancient Greece, therefore, it was not so clearly evident that humanity was on the downward curve of evolution. It was a feature of ancient Greece that the inner life was still in complete harmony with physical development. I have spoken of this before. That harmony was, of course, greatest in the middle of the Atlantean age, but it was recapitulated in ancient Greece. The total human constitution of the ancient Greeks has been discussed on a number of occasions, especially in our characterization of Greek art, which we know to have come from quite different impulses than the art of later periods. The Greeks still had an inner feeling for the etheric in the human form. They did not need the models we need today because they felt the form inside themselves. We are thus able to say that until the time of ancient Greece, the living human body was determined and maintained by the immediate environment. Human beings were intimately bound up with the space immediately around them. This changed with the beginning of the fifth post-Atlantean age. Strange as it may seem to you, it is nevertheless true to say, we really are no longer in this world to take care of our own organization. We do still incarnate, but no longer in order to take care of our own organization. This organization evolved until the middle of the Atlantean age or until ancient Greek times. Then, human bodies were as perfect as they can be during time spent on earth. It will not be until the Jupiter epoch that humanity achieves a higher level of physical perfection. Now, we are really here to be part of a downward curve of evolution, to incarnate in order to learn and experience all manner of things by the very fact that we are in bodies which are dying increasingly crumbling and withering away. I am using fairly radical terms. The fact is, however, that anything we inwardly develop and inwardly are will no longer become part of the outer physical body to the same extent as it did in the past. The consequence of this will be all kinds of changes in development. In March this year, a very important person died in Zurich. Franz Brentano. You will find a memoir in my book titled Riddles of the Soul, which is due to appear shortly. The book will have three parts and an appendix. In the first part I am discussing the relationship between anthropology and anthroposophy, 
In the second part, I am showing the attitude of modern scholars, in quotes, to anthroposophy, giving Dessoir as an example. And in the third part, I intend to show how Franz Brentano, a man with a fine mind, was held in thrall by modern science, but nevertheless came as close as anyone can get to anthroposophy with his psychology. The appendix will give brief outlines of aspects which in the present situation can only be touched on, though they might well provide the subject matter for several volumes. I have made it into a number of short chapters in the new book because the times are getting more and more difficult today, and the situation does not permit a more extensive treatment. With some of the things which are written in this manner for the present time, One does have the feeling that one is in a way writing something of a testament. Those who are inwardly conscious of the whole weight of present events will no doubt know what I mean. One of the many things Franz Brentano's sensitive mind has produced is a treatise on genius. Oddly enough, Brentano is actually showing that there is no such thing as genius, demonstrating over and over again that a genius has the same inner qualities and impulses as anyone else, that memory and the ability to make connections are merely more flexible and comprehensive in the case of a genius, etc. Franz Brentano creates an idea of genius which differs a great deal from the usual idea. We have to admit that our usual idea of genius tends to be pretty vague, like all the stereotyped ideas people have today. In general terms, we may say that Brentano's characterization of genius does not agree with the idea of a genius as it has existed until now. It does, however, agree with what genius will be in the future, for it will not be the same in the future. In the past, people were geniuses because their souls still had the power through heredity or education, to send impulses into the physical body which caused the intuitions, inspirations and imaginations of a genius to arise unconsciously. The power of genius was, therefore, available when the body was still in the ascendant. In future, bodies will be in the descendant and the power will no longer be available. Anything resembling genius in the future will arise because the individuals concerned, whom we may also call geniuses, see more deeply into the spiritual world which is all around them. Thus the impulses will not come from their unconscious physical aspect, but out of deeper insight into the world of the spirit. The changing nature of genius provides an excellent demonstration of the break which has occurred between evolution as it was in the past and evolution as it will be in the future. We might say that in the past genius arose from the body, but in the future this will be replaced by something which comes from insight into the realm of the spirit. A mind sensitive to present developments like that of Brentano would be aware of this, such as Zeus looking at the earth realized that it is now in the process of dying. Readers aside, I'm altering my pronunciation. I apologize. Of, uh, it's like Dr. Seuss, S-U-E-S-S. I'm not sure how that is in the German. I'm thinking Seuss, but uh, it might be English or something. End of aside. What lies behind it all? The fact that human beings now relate to their environment in a different way. The space around us no longer speaks to us in the way it did when human bodies were fresh, as it were. The world around us is one of space, but it no longer yields up the spiritual element. Colors no longer speak to us as elements filled with spirit. Sounds no longer reveal the spirit that is in them. They have become substantial. And human nature has become more inward. It is strange to say, is it not, that the superficial human beings of the present time really and truly have become more inward. On the other hand, human beings of today may be said to be superficial because in their present incarnation their inner constitution is such that they simply cannot reach their own inner being. 
they do not become aware of their inner nature. They do not gain the power to know themselves. They do not discover what they really are. Someone who sees the world with the eye of the Spirit, EYE, sees many people today who are simply who simply are not themselves. Bodies are walking around, and the soul is not entirely inside them. Why? Because it is no longer the soul's task to enter fully into the body, which is beginning to crumble away. Instead, the soul's task is to prepare for what will happen on Jupiter. Our souls are even now making preparations for the future. This is the situation we must penetrate with a perceptive mind. We are entirely constituted to hear the words of a cosmic spirit, quote, My kingdom is not of this world. Close quote. But it will be a long time before human beings are prepared to grasp this truth. Yet in spite of our outward superficiality, we are truly less and less of this world. This, however, should not be confused with something else. People might well believe they could now walk around like Nietzsche's followers who called themselves, quote, tawny beasts, close quote, saying, we are in the world of the spirit, we do not belong to the physical world. The answer to this must be, the part of yourself of which you have knowledge does belong to the physical world. The rest is occult, it is hidden. Nevertheless, we have, to, we have the task of using all our powers of insight and all our inner strength to become aware of the essential element in us which can no longer give itself completely to the body nor penetrate the whole body. We must see ourselves as candidates for the Jupiter age. This will only happen gradually, however. For the time being, human beings still continue in what they receive from their environment. It means that they continue in something which is below them. With every incarnation we withdraw more and more from the body, so that to some extent we are hovering above it. If this were not the case and people had to depend entirely on being like the ancient Greeks, the prospects for the further development of humanity would be dire indeed. Strange as it may seem, conscientious occult research aiming to penetrate the laws of evolution reveals a truth which may well cause dismay at first sight. It shows that in a time not all that far ahead, possibly as early as the seventh millennium, all women will be infertile on earth. The withering and crumbling of human bodies will go so far that this will happen. Just think, if the relationships that can only come into their own between the inner life and the physical body were to continue unchanged, people would no longer find anything to do on earth. The fact is that women will no longer be able to have children, even before the earth has gone through all its stages. Human beings, therefore, have to find a different way of relating to earthly existence. The final stages of earth evolution will make it necessary for them to do without physical bodies and yet be present on earth. Existence holds more mysteries than people would like to think when they base themselves on the primitive ideas of modern science. There was an instinctive feeling for this in the twilight of the fourth and the dawn of the fifth post-Atlantean age. Things were said then which relate to developments in our own age. They could not be understood, however, and people often did not even properly understand human nature. Think of the seemingly brutal teaching of St. Augustine, for example, and also of Calvin, that some people were destined to be blessed, others to be condemned, some to be good, therefore, and others evil. Such was the doctrine. It seems brutal. And yet seen in the right light, such doctrines do not seem entirely wrong. Many things which seem wrong are also to some extent relatively right. Knowledge of human nature at the time of St. Augustine and in the centuries which followed did not actually relate to the human mind and spirit. As you know, the human spirit was decreed to be non-existent at the Council of Constantinople. 
but to the human being who walks the earth. Let me try and put as clearly as I can what this is really about. You may meet one person and then another, and in St. Augustine's terms we might say, this one is destined for good and that one for evil. But only the outer physical body, not the individual personality. The latter was not even discussed in Augustine's day. If you have a number of people, you may say, but it only has come to have meaning in more recent times, and it would have been meaningless at the time of the ancient Greeks. These are human souls. They do, of course, fashion their own destinies. No impulses come to them from predestination, but they dwell in bodies destined for good or evil. As earth evolution progresses, human beings will be less and less able to develop their souls parallel to their bodies. Why, then, should it not be possible for an individual to incarnate in a body, the whole constitution of which destines it for evil? The individual can still be good inside such a body, but the connection with the physical has become less close. This, then, is another awkward truth, but a truth which we must make our own. In short, human beings are becoming more and more inward, and we must seriously come to realize that during the final epochs of earth evolution they will withdraw from the outer physical body. It will, however, need the brutal reality of the facts to get human beings to accept these things, and this can only be gradually, as I have said on a number of occasions. The facts will force them to know these things. Looking at the way people appear on the outside today, we get one image. Looking at the way they do not immediately appear on the outside, we get another image. Today the two images are no longer in complete agreement, and they will agree less and less as time goes on. It is really necessary for people today not to rely entirely on outer appearances if they want to form an idea. They have to base their ideas on the things which influence human beings out of the spirit. In the future, ideas like these will be particularly vital in everything connected with politics, the social sciences and so on, and especially also the sphere of education. Ideas coming from the natural and not from the spiritual world can no longer abs adequately meet human needs. Hence the inadequate political and social theories we have today. People want to base their judgment only on their physical environment. They do not want to be inspired by anything of a spiritual nature. This is the reason why their theories and political programs are so inadequate. We are living in an age when programs like the one which Woodrow Wilson is presenting are no longer appropriate. The age demands world programs created out of other depths. It will need the assistance of the Spirit to make world programs today. People have not yet reached the point, however, where they can really be conscious of the truth of everything I have just told you. They are lumbering behind. They have been people of the fifth post-Atlantean age for a long time, but they still want to think like people of the fourth post-Atlantean age. That was right, it was great and truly in harmony in ancient Greek times, it is utterly wrong, however, to think like a Greek today. The Greeks were given everything they needed from their environment, an environment which no longer exists today. In many respects, one, first of all, notes a form of hatred or dislike arising, hatred being merely another aspect of fear. When it comes to looking at, excuse me, when it comes to taking an inward look at the human being. People want to limit themselves to the outer aspect. And so we get echoes of the past that are nothing but echoes of a time when human beings were not fully in control of their lives. A very interesting phenomenon, one I would ask you to take a really good look at, is the following. Imagine we have a number of people putting their heads together in a meeting, let us say. Illuminated minds are meeting all the time nowadays. Well, the actual spiritual element has already separated to some extent, 
It really is no longer entirely present in those heads, for it has become inward. If there are thinkers present at the meeting, even superficial thinkers, the real heads are hidden from view. The people who are sitting there are not aware of them. And so it may be that you get meetings or individuals with old ideas running on like clockwork in those visible physical heads. These people have no idea of the demands of our time. But their automatic minds may bring up all kinds of echoes from the past. It is interesting that such things happen every now and again. In 1912, a science called eugenics was established in London. People tend to use highfalutin names for anything which is particularly stupid. The ideas you find in eugenics really came from people's brains and not from their souls. What are the aims of this science? To ensure that only healthy individuals are born in future and not inferior ones. Economics and anthropology are to join forces to discover the laws according to which men and women are to be brought together in such a way that a strong race is produced. People are really beginning to think in this way. The ideal of the London Congress, which was chaired by Darwin's son, was to examine people of different classes to see how large the skulls of the rich were compared to those of the poor, who have less opportunity for learning, how far sensibility went in rich and poor, how far the rich could resist getting tired, and how far the poor would do so, and so on. They want to gain information on the human body in this way, which may at some future date enable them to establish exactly the following. This is how the man should look, this is how the hu woman should look, if they are to produce the true human being of the future. He should have such a capacity for getting tired, and she such a capacity. This size skull for him, and a matching size for her, and so on. Those are the rumblings, natural rumblings, in brains which are emptied of soul. Ideas rumbling about which had reality in the Atlantean age. Then there really were laws which enabled people to determine size, growth, and all kinds of things by cross-breeding and the like. It was a science that was widespread in Atlantean times, and as I mentioned yesterday, sorely misused. Atlantean science worked on the basis of physical relationships, and it was known that if such a man was brought together with such a woman, differences between men and women were much greater at the time, the result would be such and such a creature, and then a different variety could be produced, just as plant breeders do today. The mysteries brought order into this cross-breeding, where related and different elements were brought together. They established groups and withdrew anything which had to be withdrawn from humanity. The blackest of black magic was practiced in Atlantean times, and order was created by establishing classes and taking these matters out of human control. This was one of the factors which led to the nations and races of today. The issue of the nation as an entity is coming up again in our present time. It is an echo of the soulless brain from Atlantean times. There is so much talk about national issues today, but it is only the body speaking. The spirit has withdrawn and already belongs to a totally different world today. There you have the discrepancy between the reality and the speechifying about the principle of nationality, in quotes, which goes on today. This will never lead to anything good. If politics are based on issues relating to nations, which are no longer issues of the day because the soul belongs to entirely different orders and realms than those which come to expression in our physical nature, this will inevitably take us into chaos over and over again. All this must be known, and it can only be known through anthroposophy. Those rumblings in the brain emptied of soul are the reason why ideas that human beings should be produced on the basis of certain laws are now coming up again. Something else also reveals the rumblings of outdated ideas. 
ideas which can still be active in dried-up brains, but which no longer come from the soul. The soul needs to be made strong so that anthroposophy can enter into it. Then people will speak out of their individual reality again. You have no doubt heard of all the nonsense we get now, with all kinds of different people shown to be what they are in the light of psychopathology. All it needs is for someone to write a decent poem. The doctor will immediately tell you what illness he has. So we get all kinds of treatises on Victor Scheffel from the psychiatrist's point of view, on Nietzsche from the psychiatrist's point of view, and on Conrad Ferdinand Meyer from the psychiatrist's point of view. Reading between the lines, we feel the authors of these books are saying, pity he did not get treatment in time. If he had had treatment at the right time, someone like Conrad Ferdinand Meyer, for example, would not have written the kinds of things he has written, for they are entirely written out of a diseased state. It is very much in the spirit of our time that no attention is paid to the growing inwardness of individual human beings. Sometimes this must inevitably have the effect, especially in someone like Conrad Ferdinand Meyer, of the outward physical body showing signs of disease so that the inner life can achieve the highest spiritual level in a work of art, quite independent of the physical body. I am not bringing these things up in order to criticize them. From the purely medical point of view, they are, of course, correct. There is nothing to be said against them. It is equally possible to do something else from a purely medical point of view. You can take the Gospels and show from a number of things that Jesus Christ, that strange individual, existed because some quite specific pathological elements had come together. Such a book has in fact been written, and anyone can read it. Another book shows that everything which came from the individual called Jesus could only have come from this individual because he was suffering from a particular disease. We must penetrate all these things with our understanding if we are to enter into present developments. I especially want to discuss the education issue in this context to show you that today growing children cannot be considered in a way which focuses only on things which come to outward expression. If we were to do so, our efforts at education would sometimes simply fail to reach the element which is now becoming more and more inward. Such things are not properly taken into account today. And this is why there is so little understanding and so much Philistinism. In some respects, Philistinism is the opposite of a true understanding of human nature, for Philistines always like to stick to the norm. Anything which does not fit in with this is considered abnormal but this will not help us to understand the world around us and, above all, other human beings. One of the things we should encourage in our anthroposophical society is to learn to understand human beings so that we may give due regard to the individual nature of others. Individuals differ much more from each other than one thinks, for the human soul no longer relates entirely to the body, and this makes human beings very complex today. This, of course, has other consequences, though the matter is dealt with rather clumsily today. We must hope that anthroposophy will help people become less clumsy about it. Just consider, in ancient Greece the whole body was filled with the whole soul, and they were in agreement. Today this is not the case, for the bodies are partly empty. I am not saying anything derogatory about empty heads, They will stay empty as part of evolution. In reality, however, nothing stays empty in this world. The heads are merely empty of something which was destined to fill them at another time. Nothing is ever completely empty. With the human soul withdrawing more and more from the body, the body is increasingly in danger of being filled with something else. And if human beings are not prepared to take up impulses which can only come from spiritual knowledge, the body will be filled with demonic powers. Humanity is facing a destiny where the body may be filled with aramonic demonic powers. 
So we have to add to what I said yesterday about future development. There will be people in future who are, you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry in ordinary life, which is something determined by social circumstances. But their bodies will be empty to such an extent that a powerful Aramanic spirit can live in them. One will be meeting Aramanic demons. Human beings will not be what they appear to be. The individual person will be deep down inside and outwardly one will get a totally different picture. This shows the complexity of life to come. It is reasonable to say that there will be situations in future when it will be difficult to know who one is dealing with. Ricardo Huch's longing for the devil really arises from what will be coming in the future. The institutions and ideas, especially the social ideas people have today, are abstract and crude. They are clumsy in the face of the complexities that are lying ahead. And because people are not able to have ideas or concepts about the true nature of things, they are sliding more and more deeply into chaos. The events of the war make this quite clear. Chaos is arising because reality has changed. Reality is becoming fuller and richer than anything people are able to think of or create in their heads. And we shall have to be clear in our minds that we are faced with a choice. To go on beating each other to a pulp, shooting at one another in the way we do now, because we do not know how to bring order into the world, or start to develop concepts and ideas to match the complexity of the situation. A spiritual movement must exist where people seek to develop concepts which meet the real situation. There will be vast numbers of people in future who want to stick to the rumblings of the past. Today they are still in the minority. Their concepts, ideas and actions will be based on the outside world around them and on the fact that their bodies are being filled with the Aramanic spirit which wants them to form such ideas. We should not fool ourselves, for we are, for we are faced with a quite specific movement. At the Council of Constantinople it was decreed that the spirit did not exist. It was dogmatically stated that the human being consisted only of body and soul and it was heresy to speak of a human spirit. In the same way, attempts will be made to decree the soul, the inner life, as non-existent. The time will come, and it may not be far off, when quite different tendencies will come up at a congress like the one held in 1912, and people will say, it is pathological for people to even think in terms of spirit and soul. Sound, in quotes, People will speak of nothing but the body. It will be considered a sign of illness for anyone to arrive at the idea of any such thing as a spirit or a soul. People who think like that will be considered to be sick, and you can be quite sure of it, a medicine will be found for this. At Constantinople the spirit was made non-existent. The soul will be made non-existent, with the aid of a drug. Taking a, quote, sound point of view, close quote, people will invent a vaccine to influence the organism as early as possible, preferably as soon as it is born, so that this human body never even gets the idea that there is a soul and a spirit. The two philosophies of life will be in complete opposition. One movement will need to reflect how concepts and ideas may be developed to meet the reality of soul and spirit. The others, the heirs of modern materialism, will look for the vaccine to make the body, in quotes, healthy, that is, makes its constitution such that this body no longer talks of such rubbish as soul and spirit, but takes a sound view of the forces which live in engines and in chemistry and that planets and suns arise from nebula in the cosmos. Materialistic physicians will be asked to drive the souls out of humanity. People who think that playful ideas will help them to look ahead to the future are very much mistaken. We need serious, profound ideas to look ahead to the future. Anthroposophy is not a game, 
not just a theory. It is a task that must be faced for the sake of human evolution. The end of Lecture 5 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness. This is Lecture 6, entitled The New Spirituality, given in Dornach on the 8th of October, 1917. If we are to continue in the right way today, we must consider something of the nature of the human being and how human beings are part of historical evolution. First of all, we consider the fact that human beings have the power or the gift of the intellect. What does this mean? It means that we are able to form ideas. For the moment, we need not reflect on where these ideas come from. The life of thought is with us whenever we are in waking consciousness. And we also feel, for instance, that when we talk, stand, excuse me, when we walk, stand, or do something else, we are guided by our thoughts, by something which exists, first of all, in the mind. Later on we shall discuss if this really is the case. For the moment I really want to establish what fills the conscious mind in everyday life. It is our thoughts. But when it comes to the world of thought as such, the matter is really quite different. And we shall not understand how human beings relate, really relate to their thoughts unless we first consider the true nature of the world of thought. In reality, we are always, wherever we are, whether sitting, standing, or lying down, not only in the world of air and light, and so on, but also in a world of surging thoughts. You will find it easiest to get an idea of this if you look at it like this. When you walk on earth as an ordinary physical human being, you are also a breathing human being, walking in a space filled with air. And in more or less the same way, you move in a space filled with thoughts. Thought substance fills the space around you. It is not a vague ocean of thoughts, nor the kind of nebulous ether people sometimes like to imagine. No, this thought substance is actually what we call the elemental world. When we speak of entities which are part of the elemental world in the widest sense of the word, They consist of thought substance, actual thought substance. There is, however, a difference between the thoughts flitting around out there, which really are living entities, and the thoughts we have in our minds. I have spoken of this difference on a number of occasions. In my book, due to be published shortly, and which I mentioned yesterday, you will find further references to this difference. You may well ask yourself, if there is such an elemental principle out there in thought space, and if I, too, have thoughts in my head, what is the relationship between the two? To get the right idea of how your own thoughts relate to the thought entities out there, you have to visualize the difference between a human corpse which has been left behind when someone has died and a living person who is walking about. The kind of thoughts you have to consider in this respect are the kind you gain from the world you perceive with the senses when in waking consciousness. Our own thoughts are actually thought corpses. This is the essential point. The thoughts coming from the world we perceive with the senses and drag around with us when in waking consciousness are thought corpses, thoughts that have been killed. Outside us they are alive, which is the difference. We are part of the elemental world of thought insofar as we kill its living thoughts when we develop ideas on the basis of what our senses have perceived in the world around us. Our thinking consists in having those corpses of thoughts inside us, and this makes our thoughts abstract. We have abstract thoughts because we kill living thoughts. It is really true that in our state of consciousness we walk around bearing thought corpses, 
which we call our thoughts and ideas. This is the reality. The living thoughts in the outside world are certainly not unrelated to us. There is a living relationship. I can demonstrate this to you, but do not be frightened by the grotesque nature of this unaccustomed idea. Imagine you are lying in bed and it is morning. You can get up in two different ways. Ordinarily, you are not aware of the difference between them because you are in the habit of making the distinction and, anyway, you do not pay attention to this particular moment of getting up. Nevertheless, you can get up out of habit without thinking about it or you can actually produce the thought, I am now going to get up. There are people, however, who get themselves up out of sheer habit, and yet there is just a touch of the idea, I am going to get up now. To repeat, many people do not make the distinction, but it can be made in the abstract, and the difference is enormous. If you get up without giving it a thought, out of sheer habit and training you are following impulses given by the spirits of form, the Elohim, when they created human beings as dwellers on earth at the beginning of earth evolution. So, you see, if you switch off your own thinking and always get up like a machine, you are not getting up without thought having gone into it, but it is not your own thought. The form of movement involved in getting up involves thoughts, objective, not subjective, inner thoughts. These are not your thoughts but those of the spirits of form. If you were a terribly lazy person who really did not want to get up at all, if it really was not in your nature to get up and you would only get up on reflection, against your nature, out of purely subjective thought, you'd be following aramonic tendencies. You would be following only your head and therefore aramon. As I said, the distinction is not made in ordinary life. And everything else we do is really done in the same way as our getting up. Human beings truly are made up of two entities which can be outwardly distinguished as the head and the rest of the body. The human head is an extraordinarily significant instrument and much older than the rest of the body. The construction of the human head is such, I spoke about this last year, that the basic shape arose during moon evolution, though the head has, in fact, come down through Saturn, Sun, and moon evolution. Humans would look quite different if they still had the shape they had during moon evolution. In very general terms, we might say people would look like specters, with only the form of the head emerging somewhat more clearly, which was the original intent. The rest of the body was not meant to be as visible as it is now. These things have to be considered, otherwise we cannot really understand human evolution on earth. The rest of the body was meant to be purely elemental by nature. In the head, everything would come into effect which has come down as moon existence, transformed by earth. Let us call it A. But this inherited moon existence, transformed by earth, is the actual human being. For the human being is really a head with only a very insignificant attachment. The rest of the human being, let us call it B, and to begin with, let us simply consider it to be this elemental, airy principle, is a manifestation of the higher hierarchies, from the spirits of form downward. The right and only way of seeing the human being is to realize that everything shown here as B has been created by the cosmic hierarchies. The human being, which has evolved from the time of Saturn, emerged against the background of the cosmic hierarchies. If you visualize the essential nature of the parts of the human being which are not head, you must think of it as all spirit, or at least all air, Then you have the body of cosmic hierarchies, and there's a drawing. However, Luciferic seduction entered into the whole process of evolution. The outcome was that this whole, more elemental body, condensed to become the rest of the human body, which of course also had an effect on the head. 
This will give you an idea of the true nature of the human being. Apart from the head, which is their own, having come from earlier evolution, human beings would be an outward manifestation of the Elohim if their bodies had not become sensuous flesh. It is entirely due to the temptations of Lucifer that this outward manifestation of the Elohim has condensed to become flesh. Something very strange has arisen as a result, an important secret to which I have referred a number of times. What has happened is that the human being has become the image of the gods in the very organs which are normally called the organs of his lower nature. This image of the gods has been debased in human beings as they are on earth. The highest principle in human beings, the spiritual principle coming from the cosmos, has become their lower nature. Please do not forget that this is an important secret of human nature. Our lower nature, which is due to Lucifer's influence, was actually destined to be our higher nature. This is the contradictory element in human nature. Rightly understood, it will solve countless riddles in the world and in life. We are thus able to say, in the course of human evolution, man has, thanks to the Luciferic element, made the part of him that should be constantly emerging from the cosmos into his lower nature. Many historical phenomena will find their explanation if you consider that this was known to the leaders of the ancient mysteries, people who were not as facetious, cynical, and narrow-minded as people are today. Certain symbols taken from the lower nature and used in the past, symbols that today are merely seen as sexual symbols, are explained by the fact that the priests who used them in the ancient mysteries did so in order to give expression to the higher reality of the lower nature of man. You can see how sensitive we have to be in dealing with these things if we are not to be facetious. Modern people slip easily into facetiousness because they cannot even imagine that there is more to human beings than mere sensuality which in fact is the Luciferic element in our higher nature. Thus historical symbols are easily given entirely the wrong interpretation. It takes some nobility of spirit not to interpret the old symbols in a lower sense, even though they often can be interpreted in that way. With this, you will also begin to realize that if thoughts from the elemental world come to us, they are living thoughts, not abstract dead ones that come from the head. They must be coming out of the whole human being. Mere reflection will not achieve this. Today the idea is that we only arrive at our thoughts by reflection. Today the idea is, if human beings will just reflect, they can think about anything, providing the things they want to think about are accessible. This is nonsense, however. The truth is that the human race is in a process of evolution and the thoughts developed by Copernicus, for example, or Galileo at a particular time could not be reached by mere reflection before that time. You see, people fabricate the thoughts they have in their heads. But when a thought which marks a real change arises in world history, this thought is given by the gods and through the whole human being. It flows through the human being, overcoming the Luciferic element, and only reaches the head out of the whole human being. I think this is something you can understand. In certain ages, particular thoughts just have to be waited for and expected. Then human beings are not merely reflecting, nor is something conveyed through their eyes or ears, but inspiration comes from the world of the hierarchies, and it comes through the whole essential human being, which is the image of the hierarchies. If you consider this, some of the things I said yesterday can also tell you a great deal. In the present age, from the fifth post-Atlantean age, we are living much more inwardly than before. In ancient Greek times, for example, when the outer environment provided much more that was spiritual. This inwardness of life, 
relates to the process in which thoughts come up through the whole human being. In earlier times, in the fourth post-Atlantean age, the relationship between human beings and the gods was much more of an exterior thing. Today it has become much more intimate. Human beings are always associating with the gods. Their heads do not normally know anything about this, however, because they only hold human thoughts, or rather, the corpses of thoughts. Human beings always associate with the gods as whole human beings, and this association is more intimate today than it was in the past. Even the nature of clairvoyance is such that the relationship to the gods and to disembodied spirits is altogether different from what it was before. When a human soul associates with spirits or with the dead, the association is very is a very subtle one. It is more or less similar to the way in which our own thoughts associate with our own will in the soul. It is very intimate. And this intimacy belongs to the present age. It corresponds to the essential nature of human beings here on earth and also to that of the dead, of those who are going through the gate of death to enter the world of the spirit at this time. This intimate association has become possible because in some ways the relationship between man and cosmos has changed. If the relationship which some human beings have to the world of the spirit comes to conscious awareness, it shows itself to be a much more intimate one, even today, than it was before. Certain abilities had to be lost so that this intimate association with the gods could develop. During the times of ancient Greece and Rome and after, right into the Middle Ages, people still had direct perception of spiritual elements in the world around them. As I said, they did not merely see physical colors in the way we do today or hear physical sounds, but perceived spiritual elements in colors and sounds. They were also able to use the element which for us has turned into chaotic dreams as a means of entering into the world of the spirit, and they did so in a way that was much less subtle than is possible today. It was relatively easy to approach the spirits and the dead in the past. Today our ordinary dreams no longer have the same quality, though this did continue well into the Middle Ages. Some people still had it for a long time afterward. Those earlier people also perceived, as in a dream, all that happened around them in the elemental thought world of which I have spoken. They were not yet cut off from that surrounding world, and their own essential nature still extended into it. People were aware of this and acted and behaved accordingly. Today these things are, of course, considered to be an old superstition. Yet when something significant occurs in connection with this old superstition, modern science does not know what to do with it. Let me give you just one example. Kaiman, I'm going to pronounce that Kaiman, C-I-M-O-N, a well-known historical figure, had a friend called Astyphilus who knew how to interpret dreams. Astyphilus was able to interpret dreams intellectually, When Cayman had dreamt of a vicious, yapping dog before the Egyptian campaign, Astyphilus forecast his death, saying, You have dreamt of a vicious, yapping dog. You will die in this campaign. The story was told by Horace. A modern sage who has written about dreams, though in materialistic terms, does, of course, believe that Cayman had an ordinary dream and Astyphilus was a mountebank, who interpreted dreams. Yet he also makes a strange comment, uh, quote, chance willed it, however, that his prophecy came true, close quote. I could show you books which give irre- irre- irrefutable evidence of prophecies which have come true, but people will say, quote, chance willed it, close quote. This is one of many examples. People imagine that the inner life has always been the same as it is today and that there has been no development in the inner life of man. Thus the outer senses 
perceived more of the spiritual, and at the same time, the relationship with the surrounding elemental thought world was in a way based more on images. Dreams still had the quality of images which pointed to the future. Just as memory relates to the past, so the images pointed to the future, though not in the same way, of course. The constitution of the human soul was therefore entirely different in the past. Blurred dream images came into everyday sensory perception, images which nevertheless related to real happenings in the elemental world. We might put it like this. The physical world of sensory perception had not yet condensed and become solid and mineral in quality. Everywhere color and sound still sparkled with spiritual qualities. At the same time, people still had the ability to live in waking dreams, and these were reality in the elemental, objective world of thought. Then humanity was deprived of this relationship with the outside world in order to establish and strengthen human freedom. The inner life became more intimate in the way I have described. There is something we must consider which is most important. We can use the powers of the normal intellect to reflect on the phenomena belonging to the world of nature, but we cannot use this intellect to reflect on social phenomena. People believe that the way of thinking, which enables them to reflect on the events of the physical world, can also be used to establish social laws and political impulses. They are actually doing so now, but the laws and impulses are of correspondingly poor quality. The kind of thing you find in Roman history, and you would also find it in later history, if it had not all been turned into romance, for instance, that Numa Pompilius took his inspiration from a nymph called Egeria in certain matters of state, indicates that in those days people appealed to the gods when matters of state had to be dealt with. They would not have thought it possible to create political structures merely by thinking about them. Today the idea is that individuals are not able to do this but if you multiply the individual by so and so many times, then it can be done. So if you have a modern democracy and an enlightened parliament, 300 heads are able to achieve by reflection what a single head cannot do, of course. This goes against one of Rosiger's statements, which I have quoted a number of times. Quote, One's a human being. If there are several, you've people. If you have lots of them, their beasts, close quote. But surely it is not what you would do in practice. And just imagine what the whole enlightened modern world would say if news were to get around, not in the old form, but in a new one, that Woodrow Wilson had taken his inspiration for some decree or other from a nymph. These things have changed, even if they are not exactly more intelligent. It will, of course, be difficult to grasp but it is something we have to realize, that real and appropriate ideas concerning social structures will only come when people appeal again to the spirit. They are not forced to do so, and the form will be different. But this appeal to the spirit must be made again. Otherwise, everything people produce by way of political principles, social structures and ideas will be mere nothingness. There has to be living awareness of the fact that we live in the world of elemental thought and have to take our inspiration from it. People are still able to laugh about such things today, but humanity will have to struggle through pain and suffering to gain awareness of inspiration in the creative sphere of the social order. Here we have an even more subtle indication of something that will become more and more necessary for humanity people will have to realize that they must now prepare themselves to make a connection again with the world of the Spirit, so that they may bring into the kingdom of this world a kingdom which is not of this world, but is present everywhere in the kingdom of this world. Only then will salvation come for a social sphere where chaos now reigns. 
It will, however, be necessary for people to overcome the unease and reluctance they feel about concerning themselves with the intimate relationship between man and world. In the more important fields of human activity, people will have to go more deeply into the nature of this relationship as it was in the fourth post-Atlantean age. This will give them the necessary orientation so that they can really see how human beings related differently to the world around them than they do now. It is possible to study this, but we must overcome this mythology, mythology in the bad sense, we call the study of history today. We need to consider historical reality, going back at least as far as the mystery of Golgotha, and this will be possible if the study of external history is enriched by the study of spiritual science. People will simply have to make the effort to enter into a study of spiritual science. The whole way of thinking, of course, is such nowadays that people often feel everything to be utterly grotesque when they begin to enter into the world of the spirit. People instinctively think that things will look just the same there as they do in the physical world. All they are prepared to accept is that they will find a more refined, subtle form of this world, and they fail to understand that they will find it completely different, so much so that even the smallest detail will come as a surprise. Let us assume a modern philosopher, your normal kind of university professor, were to have some kind of inspiration. It would be a small miracle, but let us assume such a miracle were to happen. So that for five minutes he were in a position to ask the world of the Spirit if he was a true philosopher with a true inner vocation. What do you think the answer would be? He would be given an image. This would be the right answer, only it would need to be correctly interpreted. This is really true. I am telling you something that has happened innumerable times. The answer would be that the philosopher is given ass's ears, and the interpretation of this would be, quote, I am indeed a real philosopher, close quote. This is not a joke. The point is that some ideas mean one thing in the physical world and exactly the opposite in the spiritual world. In the physical world, it is not a distinction to have ass's ears. In the spiritual world, having ass's ears as an image is worth much, much more than the highest distinction ever awarded to a professor of philosophy. But imagine someone who is only used to the physical world and who suddenly, as I said, by a miracle, becomes clairvoyant and sees himself wearing ass's ears. He would think he was being made a fool of, that he was being taken in. And he would immediately call this an illusion. Things are different in the world of the spirit, down to the last detail. And it is necessary to translate everything we meet there in order to find the right correspondence and interpretation in the physical world. I was not simply telling a joke when I spoke of those asses' ears. If you read the writings of ancient times, you will find the dreams dreamt by philosophers to convince them of their inner vocation. The dream I have described is quite typical of that kind of thing. Philosophers had to see themselves with asses' ears to be convinced of their vocation. People will inevitably be surprised and taken aback when they want to get acquainted again with the specific nature of the spiritual world. Reading title The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, Anno 1459, you will sometimes feel that the grotesque things said in it are enough to make you laugh, yet they are deeply significant. For the path to which the work refers should not be considered in a sentimental way, but with a certain superior humor. As I have said, later times also have events analogous to Numa Pompilius receiving instruction from Egeria. These things are no longer made known, which is, of course, the reason why history has become mere conventional fiction. Consider, it was as late as the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century when Jacob Burma had his profound intuitions truly great, tremendous, grand visions, which contained intuitions from an earlier time. 
His followers included many people who lived in later times. One of the last to be consciously a follower of Jakob Burma was St. Martin. He based himself entirely on Jakob Burma, especially in his book, uh, it's in French here, I'll give it a try, titled Des Erreurs et de la Vuit, sorry, the errors maybe of something, sorry, though it is a somewhat dematerialized Burma. Still, he had enough of what had come through from older times to realize if one wants to have ideas concerning social structures, if one wants to have real, effective political ideas, these must not merely be thought up. They must have come from the spiritual world. In his book, St. Martin presents not merely ideas concerning the world of nature and its progress, and of history and its progress, but also quite specific political ideas. Today, when states are the only kind of political structure, one would call them ideas on the political state. His discussions do, however, include one idea of special significance, and it is characteristic that this is in the forefront of his political ideas. St. Martin refers to, quote, original human adultery, close quote, which he says took place at a time when sexual relations did not yet exist between male and female on earth. He is, therefore, not referring to adultery in the usual sense. He means something quite different, something he keeps deeply veiled, and to which the Bible refers with the words, quote, The sons of the gods saw how beautiful these daughters were, and they took them for themselves, such women as they chose. Close quote. This event brought chaos to the world of Atlantis. There was also a mysterious connection between this and the way in which human beings had made their elemental spiritual nature sensual. All one can do is hint at the event which St. Martin calls original adultery. He, too, was merely hinting at it. It is evident that St. Martin realized that to consider politics one must not merely take account of outer human situations, as people do today, but find a way of going back to earlier times when one had to go beyond the world of the senses and into the world of the spirit if one wanted to know anything about the human being. The principles of political thinking must be evolved out of the world of the spirit. St. Martin still knew this at the end of the 18th century, he only died in 1804, and what he said in Des Erreurs et de la Vuit has also been translated into German. It is not without interest to say this, because a certain cleric who is against we who want to serve the life of the Spirit here in Dornach, he lives quite near to here, has said that in the face of all this folly, people should remember plain, simple Matthias Claudius, and he quoted a verse by Claudius in his support, it was Matthias Claudius, however, who translated St. Martin's Des Erreurs et de la Vuit in order to make the spiritual science of that time accessible to his people. The gentleman in question therefore demonstrated his colossal ignorance where Matthias Claudius is concerned, quite apart from the fact that he quoted only one verse. If he had quoted the preceding verse, he would have contradicted himself. Still, he was satisfied with the one verse which he thought suited his purpose, which was to quote something against anthroposophy. As late as the 18th century, St. Martin knew that if we are to have fruitful political ideas, there has to be a bridge between human thoughts and the spiritual influences which come from higher worlds. No previous century has been as God-forsaken, really, as the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. It is important to realize this. Nor was any earlier century so vain and so proud of being God-forsaken. Still, if people were to read about the statesmanship advocated by St. Martin, I think all those clever people who now get together and want to guide the destinies of the world would feel their stomachs turn. For it is the tendency today to get to know as little as possible about the real world around us. It is, of course, possible to erase from our minds the thoughts which come from the living spirit, and we can decide to work only with thought corpses. People's actions do not relate to this, however, but become part of a web of living thought. 
And when people with thought corpses refuse to enter into those living thoughts, the outcome will be chaos. This chaos has to be overcome, which calls for the clear insights of which I have spoken before, as well as in these lectures. It does, however, require a complete change of direction from what is considered to be right today and the absolute ideal. Above all, this change of direction will have to come soon. And it would be best if it were to come right now and be as widespread as possible in the field where educators are appointed for both young and old. There is no other field where humanity has entered as deeply into materialism as it has in education. Let me conclude by presenting a thought which will be occupying us in the days ahead, for it is very interesting and very important for all humanity. I would like to present it in such a way, however, that you will be able to turn it over in your own inner mind for a few days. You will then be better prepared to consider this thought. The children who are born today, we must consider them in the knowledge that the outer form is withering and splitting up as I have shown in these days. But deep inside is the true human being. This no longer comes to outward expression in the way it did until the 15th century. We will have to get more and more used to the thought that especially in the case of children, the inward human being cannot be fully revealed by the way people present themselves, nor by the way they think and the gestures they make. In many respects, these children are something quite different from what comes to outward expression. We even know extreme cases. Children may appear to be the worst of rascals, and yet there is so much good in them that they will later be the most valuable of human beings. But you will also find many children who are very good and not the least bit bad. Never putting a finger in their mouths nor thumbing their noses at people, they will study well, perhaps be good bank managers one day or good school teachers according to present-day ideas and indeed good lawyers. But forgive these harsh words. They will not be good people because they cannot achieve inner harmony between themselves and the true world around them. It is specifically in the field of education and training where the principle must be established that people are very different inside today from what they appear to be. It will therefore be necessary in future to appoint teachers on entirely different principles, to be able to see into something which is inside and does not come to expression on the outside requires something of a prophetic gift. Examinations for prospective teachers must therefore be organized in such a way that candidates with intuitive and prophetic gifts do particularly well. Candidates who do not have such gifts must be made to fail their exams, however great their knowledge. The last thing we do today is to consider the prophetic gifts of people who are to become teachers. We still have a long way to go with regard to many things that will have to be done. Yet the course of human evolution will eventually force people to accept such principles. Many of the materialists of our age would, of course, consider it a crazy notion to say that teachers should be prophets, but it will not be forever. Humanity will be forced to recognize these things. The end of Lecture 6 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness. This is Lecture 7, Working from Spiritual Reality, given in Dornach on the 12th of October, 1917. To get even closer to the problems we have opened up in these lectures, I want to make some incidental comments today. You probably know the amusing experiment so often done by conjurers. They show the audience some heavy weights and the effort required to lift them. To make the thing more credible, the pretend weights usually have figures written on them, so and so many hundredweight or kilogram or whatever. Having made enormous efforts and slowly lifting the weights so that the audience can admire his muscular strength, the conjurer then suddenly lifts them up high or may even bring on a small boy who will trot off swinging the weights, for the hole is made of cardboard. 
It is merely that the shape and the figures have been Im- imitated to give the impression that those are real weights. This experiment will frequently come to mind for anyone who has a little bit of spiritual science and who learns what people, even the more intelligent ones, are saying or writing about historical events or historical figures. This applies even to biographers and historians who, according to current opinion, are doing their work extremely well. If you have training in spiritual science, you may be entirely satisfied with the descriptions which are given for a time. But when you go over it all in your mind again, it does seem as if a child might as well come and run off swinging all this stuff. Perhaps there are not very many people who feel like this, though I have found something like it at an instinctive level with quite a number of people when it comes to the historical writings one gets today. The whole of Roman history, and particularly also Greek history, which is written today, comes under this heading, and I am forced to say that historians dealing with one particular field, people whom I, highly, whom I respect highly, nevertheless leave me with this impression. I have enormous respect for the historian Hermann Grimm, as will be evident from several of my lectures. But when I take up his books on Goethe, Michelangelo or Raphael, these figures seem as if they had no real weight, comparatively speaking, as if they were but darting shadows. The whole of Grimm's Goethe, the whole of his Michelangelo, are merely figures from a magic lantern, for these too have no weight. What is the reason for this? It is that people who are merely equipped with the education, the intellectual content of our present time, do not have a real idea of the true reality, even though they generally think they are describing such a reality. People are infinitely far away from the true reality today because they do not know the element which is always around us and gives spiritual, if not exactly physical, weight to the figures. Luther is being presented in hundreds, if not thousands, of ways during these weeks, all very erudite, of course, for today's writers generally are most erudite. I am quite serious about this. But the Martin Luther described by our contemporaries is like the image we have of the weight made of cardboard, for the element which lends weight to a figure is missing. You may say, If one is sitting on a chair and watching the man lifting weights, it looks exactly the same whether the weights are made of cardboard or are real weights. You could even paint the scene. It would look the same. The painting could be perfectly true, even if the weights lifted by the model were made of cardboard. The descriptions given by historical figures like Luther, excuse me, the descriptions given of historical figures like Luther, may be eminently true, and the individuals who are so proud of their realism may have succeeded extremely well in using numerous details, numerous characteristic and significant things to create a sophisticated image. But the image does not necessarily correspond to reality, because the spiritual weight is lacking. If we really want to understand Luther today, we must know the inner quality of his true nature, quite independent of our own point of view. We must know he lived a short time after the dawn of the fifth post-Atlantean age, but that all the impulses of the fourth post-Atlantean age were alive in his heart and mind. He was out of place in the fifth post-Atlantean age, for he felt, thought, and reacted like someone from the fourth post-Atlantean age. The task facing him belonged to the fifth post-Atlantean age, which then was just beginning. And so the beginning of the fifth post-Atlantean age, the horizon of that age, sees an individual whose inner impulses really came from all the qualities of the fourth post-Atlantean age. The prospect of what was to come in the fifth post-Atlantean age lived in Luther's soul at an unconscious, instinctive level. 
That age was to bring all the materialism which could only arise for humanity in post-Atlantean times and would gradually penetrate every human sphere. To put it as a paradox, paradoxes never represent the actual facts, of course, but we are able to deduce the facts from them, we might say. Luther was entirely rooted in the fourth post-Atlantean age when it came to the impulses in his heart and mind and feelings. And this meant that he did not really understand the innermost nature of the materialistic human beings of the fifth post-Atlantean age. He certainly had an instinctive, more or less unconscious, inner grasp of the conflicts which would arise between the people of the fifth post-Atlantean age and the outside world, of how they would act in that world and be caught up in its works. Yet all this was really of no concern to him, because his feelings were those of the people who had lived in the fourth post-Atlantean age. Hence his insistence that no good would come of being connected with the works of the world and being involved in the world. You must distance yourselves from these works and from everything which exists in the outside world and find the way to the world of the spirit solely in your heart and mind. You must build your bridge between the spiritual and the earthly world not on the basis of what you are able to know but what you are able to believe. It must grow from your inner mind and soul. Because he was not connected with the outside world, Luther emphasized that the relationship with the spiritual world was a purely inward one based on faith. Or consider this. In some respects, the world of the spirit lay open before Luther's inner eye, E.Y.E. His visions of the devil do not need to be explained in the way Ricardo Huch explains them in her book, which otherwise has considerable merit. There is no need to make excuses for his visions of the devil by saying that he did not believe in a devil with horns and tail walking around in the street. Luther really had the devil appear to him. He knew full well the nature of this aramonic spirit. To some extent, the spiritual world still lay open before his mind's eye as it had done for the people of the fourth post-Atlantean age, and it lay open specifically for the phenomena which were, in fact, to be of the essence in the fifth post-Atlantean age. The Aramonic powers were preeminent in the fifth post-Atlantean age, and Luther saw them. People of the fifth post-Atlantean age are, characteristically, under the influence of these powers, but not able to see them. Luther, however, was an individual of the fourth post-Atlantean age, displaced into the fifth, and he saw those powers and therefore gave them such emphasis. This is the concrete situation as regards the spiritual world, and Luther cannot be understood unless this is taken into account. If you go back to the 15th, 14th, 13th, and ultimately the 12th century, you will always find that people understood the conversion of matter. Anything written about this at a later date was largely fraudulent, because the real secrets were lost with the end of the fourth post-Atlantean age. But not everything written is fraudulent, and some of the things which were said were true, though they are difficult to find. What has been written is not exactly outstanding, however, especially anything printed at a later time. Yet, at the time when the secrets of alchemy were known, which was during the fourth post-Atlantean age, church people were well able to speak of the transubstantiation of bread and wine into the body and the blood, where there were definite ideas connected with these words. Luther was caught up in the thinking and inner responses of the fourth post-Atlantean age, yet he lived in the fifth post-Atlantean age. He had to separate transubstantiation from the process of physical conversion of matter. So what did the sacrament of this transubstantiation become for him? It became a process which occurs entirely in the realm of the spirit. Nothing is transformed, he said, but when the faithful receive the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Christ enter into them. 
Everything Luther said, thought, and felt was said, thought, and felt by someone whose heart and mind belonged to the fourth post-Atlantean age. He clung to the spiritual connection between man and the gods, which belonged to the fourth post-Atlantean age, taking this with him into the godless fifth age, an age of materialism, empty of spirit, without faith and without understanding. Now, Luther has weight, and we understand why he said the things he said. We know it quite apart from the impression he makes on us today. We see him standing in the outside world, and he is like the real weight, not the cardboard one. Hundreds or thousands of modern theologians or historians may now come and give their impressions. These will not give us the man, someone with real weight, they will only give us the kind of thing produced by someone who is not holding up a real weight, but one made of cardboard. You see now what really matters at the present time. We must labor to gain awareness of the factors which give the world around us spiritual weight, and be aware of the fact that the Spirit is alive in everything, and that this Spirit can only be found with the help of anthroposophy. You can collect all the documents you want and scribble endless notes on Luther. You can present an accurate picture as far as the outer aspects are concerned. But to stay with our analogy, you will always have a cardboard figure unless you are truly able to look for the things that give the figure real weight. Now you may well say it seems hard to say to compare the work of some of the most erudite people to cardboard weights. And even if this were so, their work was really beautiful and satisfying in many ways. Is all this to be changed? Could we not go on enjoying their work? You see, two questions arise for people in the present-day state of consciousness, questions which may well touch us deeply. Why did the spiritual world demand that these people should have the instincts which have led to such works? Well, these things really point to something which is very widespread today and closely bound up with human nature. As I have already mentioned, we are living at a time when certain truths have to become known, which are not welcome truths. Yet anyone who can read the signs of the times knows that they have to become known. In the first part of my essay on title The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, written for the next issue of the journal Das Reich, I have touched lightly on some of these truths. Just a short while ago it was still taboo for those in the know to speak of these things in public. Today one must speak of them, even if this may cause problems. A short passage in my essay relates specifically to what I am going to say now. Is it not true that as we move about in this world, we do not have full and real knowledge of the things which are immediately around us, at least not to begin with? I think this is something anyone can quite easily establish for himself. We mainly use our sense of sight as we move through the world. But if we did not have other kinds of experiences as well, we would never know with complete certainty if something we see weighs a great deal or only little. We would have to pick it up to check the weight. Think of how many things there are where you cannot know if they are heavy or light as air until you pick them up. And finally, when you know that something is not as light as air, this knowledge has not come from looking at it, but from having lifted something like it before. You do not even think about it, but unconsciously, instinctively come to the conclusion. If it looks the way such things always look, it will also weigh the same. Just looking at objects, therefore, provides you with nothing at all. What does looking at objects provide? Illusion. If you regard the world with just one of the senses, you are deceived wherever you go. You only escape the illusion because you are unconsciously and instinctively drawing on experience. The whole world is really trying to deceive us, even in the world we perceive around us with the senses. The illusion may be very naturalistic nowadays, 
painters and sculptors who aim to present something to just one of the senses fail to realize that they are merely presenting maya, illusion. For the more you try and present something realistically for just one of the senses, the more you are presenting maya. This is necessary, however, for if it were not for this illusion, we would not be able to progress in conscious awareness. We owe our progress in consciousness to this illusion. To stay with my original analogy, if all objects appeared in their true weight, even when they were just perceived by the eye, EYE, if I were to feel the burden of their weight as I looked upon around me, I would quite obviously be unable to develop conscious awareness of the outside world. We owe our consciousness to this illusion. It lies at the root of all things which make up our consciousness. We have to be deceived in order to progress in consciousness, for our consciousness is the child of illusion. To begin with, however, the illusion must not enter into human beings or they will become unsure. The illusion remains beyond the threshold of conscious awareness. The guardian makes sure that we do not realize how the world around us is deceiving us at every step. We fight our way upward because the world does not reveal its weight to us and in this way lets us rise above it and be conscious. Consciousness also depends on many other things, but it mainly depends on the fact that the world around us is full of illusion. Yet, necessary as it may be for illusion to be there for a time, so that consciousness may arise. It is also necessary that when consciousness has developed, we rise above the illusion, particularly in certain areas. Because it is based on maya, on illusion, our consciousness cannot gain access to true reality. Over and over again it would have to be subject to the kind of confusion I have mentioned. And so there must be alternating periods periods when weightless situations and people are presented and periods when the weight, the spiritual weight, is perceived. We are now facing the latter kind of period with regard to major world events as well as everyday events. We have to see through the things which seriously come into consideration in this respect. One thing is particularly important. When the world looks to the East now, to what really lives in the east of Europe today. The people of Central Europe and America see the east of Europe exactly like someone who is looking at weights made of cardboard. They do not see the true spiritual weight of it. And indeed, neither do the people who actually live in Eastern Europe have a real idea of the spirit which lives there. We can see Luther as an individual whose inner life belonged to the fourth post-Atlantean age, but who himself lived in the beginning of the fifth post-Atlantean age. In the same way, the world must come to see the true nature of the spirit in Eastern Europe, for this is how we should actively consider these things in the fifth post-Atlantean age. If you take everything I have said about Eastern Europe in lectures and lecture cycles, how the spirit self is actively seeking to develop and how it must unite with the consciousness soul of the West. And if you add the fact that impulses for the sixth post-Atlantean age are in preparation in the East of Europe, then you have something which will lend weight to the East of Europe. If on the other hand you take all the statements people make today, however erudite, then you have weights which may just as well be made of cardboard. However, we cannot buy or sell maya, illusion. We can only buy and sell real objects. You would say, quote, thank you very much, close quote, if your grocer were to put cardboard weights rather than real ones on the scales. You would certainly demand real weights, not just some which look as if they were real. All political principles and impulses discussed with reference to Russia will be nothing. They will be null and void unless they come from the awareness gained by knowing what gives spiritual weight. 
The way people talk today, you would really think that they are putting cardboard weights on the scales of world history. However, once awareness has come, it must not be used in the old, lackadaisical and slovenly way, but must address itself to reality, not just to outer illusion. A transition will have to be made from the familiar, comfortable way of looking at things to one which is much more alive in its concepts. These will, of course, be less comfortable, for they also shake us awake. Life will be less comfortable with the views which have to be taken in future. Why is this so? Let me give you an analogy which will probably also take you aback. I am not going to flinch, however, and I will say these things irrespective of what individual people may feel about them. As I have mentioned in earlier ages, including the fourth post-Atlantean age, powers were available to humans which have been transformed into something else today. As I said, clairvoyance has become something different today. It is based on different things. Certain things can no longer be as they were, even as late as the fourth post-Atlantean age, and one of these is the following. In the fourth post-Atlantean age, people only know tales about it today, and of course they do not believe them. There was an ordeal by fire. To prove guilt or innocence, people were made to walk a red-hot grid. If they got burned, they were considered to be guilty. If not, if they walked across without being harmed, they were considered to be innocent. People consider this to be an old superstition today. But it is true. It is one of the abilities people had in the past and are no longer able to have today. In those days, human nature had this quality. Innocents who were utterly convinced of their innocence and knew themselves to be in the protection of the divine spirits at such a solemn moment people who were so firmly connected with the spiritual world in their consciousness that the astral body would be taken out of the physical body, could walk across the embers with their physical bodies. It really was so in the past. This is the truth. It is really a good thing for you to be fully and completely clear in your minds that this old superstition is based on truth, though of course it is not a good idea for you to go and tell the vicar all about it. These things have undergone a transformation. In the past, individuals who had to prove their innocence in a particular way could be made to walk the embers on occasion. You can, however, be quite certain that, generally speaking, people were afraid of fire even then. They did not enjoy walking over red-hot grids. Even in those days, it would generally make them shudder, except for those who were able to prove their innocence in this way. But some of the power which carried people through the embers in those days has now become more inward in the sense I spoke of in my last lecture. The clairvoyance of the fifth post-Atlantean age, the connection with the world of the spirit, is based on the same powers, except that the powers which formerly enabled people to walk through fire have been transformed and become more inward. If one wants to be in touch with certain factors which belong to the world of the spirit, one has to overcome much the same reluctance as had to be overcome when people went through fire. That is the reason why many people fear the spiritual world today as much as they fear fire. We cannot really say people are just speaking figuratively when they say they are afraid of getting burned. They really are afraid. This is the reason for the opposition to anthroposophy. People are afraid of getting burned. Yet the progress of time demands that we gradually approach the fire and do not shy away from reality. The new inwardness of life of which I have spoken has many factors which demand that we gently draw closer to the world of the spirit, gently for the time being. Later it will be stronger and stronger in all spheres, but especially in the field of education. In the sphere of education, people will have to realize that quite different factors need to be considered than those which arise from the great climax now reached in the age of materialism. The realization must come that many of the things 
which from the materialistic point of view are eminently right, though the point of view is based on the senses and hence on maya, illusion, must be set aside and the opposite put in their place. Today it is considered important, especially in the field of education, to train teachers by teaching them as much method as possible. All the time, it is said, this must be done like this and that must be done like that. The aim is to develop well-regulated ideas of how one should educate. People love the idea of the regulative ideal. They would like to have the image of the ideal teacher and then always have such a teacher. But they only have to think a little bit about themselves and the issue will be clear. Ask yourself with as much self-knowledge as you are able to muster what has become of you, up to a certain point we can all see what has become of us, and then ask yourself who the teachers, the educators were who influenced you when you were young. Or if this is a problem, try and think of a well-known and reasonably important person and then consider the teachers of that individual to see if you can somehow connect the significance of those teachers with the achievements of the individual. It would be interesting if biographers told us more about the teachers. Some interesting things would then emerge. But we would not be able to find out much about what those teachers did to make the individuals in question what they were. In most cases, we would have the situation we have in the case of Herder, who achieved much. One of his best-known teachers was headmaster Hermann Grimm. He was in the habit of tanning the boys' backsides as hard as he could. Herder's achievements did not come from having his backside tanned. He was a good boy and had few beatings. The teacher's general inclinations, therefore, did not have any effect on him. A nice story is told of the, this teacher, and it is really true. On one occasion, he gave a terrible beating to a boy in Herder's class. Later, the boy was walking in the street when a man who had brought calfskins skins and sheepskins from the country asked him, quote, Tell me, boy, where can I find someone who will bark tan these skins for me? Close quote. Quote, ah, said the boy, go to Mr. Grimm. He is good at it. Close quote. And the man actually went and rang Mr. Grimm's doorbell. That taught the headmaster a lesson. But you see... Herder did not become a great man because his teacher had this inclination. You will find many such things if you look into the education of individuals who later became great people. Something else, however, which relates to something much more subtle will be important. It will be important that the question of karma or destiny is taken into account, especially with regard to education and teaching methods. The people with whom my karma brought me together in childhood and youth certainly are important. And a tremendous amount depends on it that in our teaching we are aware that we and our pupils have been brought together. You see, much depends on a particular quality of mind and attitude. Take the things we are already able to say about education today from the point of view of anthroposophy and you will find this to be wholly in accord with what I have said. It really has to be emphasized today that for the first seven years, up to the changing of the teeth, children want to imitate everything, and during the next seven years, until they reach puberty, they must submit to authority. We, therefore, have to do things which the children can imitate in the right way. Children will, of course, imitate everybody, but they do so especially with their teachers. They also believe everybody from their seventh to fourteenth year, but they should do so especially when it comes to their teachers and educators. We will know how to behave if we are constantly aware of the idea of karma, but we must have a real inner connection with this. Whether we are particularly good at teaching something or perhaps less good is not really so important. Even completely inept teachers may on occasion have a tremendous influence. Now, in the age of inwardness of which I have spoken, the question as to whether we are the right teacher or educator depends on the way in which we were connected with the child's soul before either of us, teacher and child, were born. 
The difference is merely that we teachers have come into the world a few years earlier than the children. Before that we were together with them in the world of the Spirit. Where does the desire to imitate come from, this tendency to imitate after we are born? We are imitators in our early years because we bring the tendency to imitate with us from the world of the Spirit. And whom do we like best to imitate? The individual who gave us our qualities in the world of the Spirit, from whom we took something when we were in that world, be it in one particular field or another. The child's soul was connected with the soul of the teacher before birth. The connection was a close one. Later the outer physical being who lives in the physical world merely has to follow this line. If you do not merely take what I am saying as an abstract truth, but let it enter fully into your soul, you will find it has tremendous significance. Just think of the truly serious mood, the profundity of feeling which would come if in the field of education people lived with the idea you are now showing the child something which it accepted from you in the world of the spirit before it was born. Just think if this were to be the real impulse. It is much more important that such a mood, such a feeling is brought to the task, rather than teaching people how to do this and how to do that. This will follow if the atmosphere is right between teacher and pupil, and if teachers are truly conscious of the great task life has given them. Above all, there has to be this truly serious mood, it is poison to demand that children should understand everything, as it is often demanded today. I have frequently pointed out that children cannot understand everything. From their first to their seventh year, they cannot understand at all. They imitate everything. And if they do not imitate sufficiently, they will not have enough in them later which they can use. From their seventh to the fourteenth year, they must believe. They must be under the influence of authority if they are to develop in a healthier, healthy way. These things have to be made part of human life. It is generally considered most important today to understand everything. We are not even supposed to teach the children their tables without their understanding it. But they do not understand anyway. Such an approach makes children into calculating machines rather than sensible people. They are supposed to accept the intellect, which is in the elemental environment of which I have spoken, rather than develop their own understanding. This happens a great deal nowadays. Instead of helping the mind of the individual to develop, efforts are actually in progress to make it the ideal to inculcate the elemental intellect, which is outside the human being, so that children are caught up in the elemental world. Many instances can be seen today where we can actually say, these people are not thinking for themselves. They are thinking in the general thinking atmosphere, as it were. And if something of an individual nature should come up, its origins are not in the divine element which can be perceived in human nature. Human beings must enter into truly living ways again, even in their understanding of the world. As I have said, this is more difficult than working with mere corpses of ideas. Humanity must once again find a living approach, and people must realize that dead truths cannot govern life. Only living truths can do so. The following is a dead truth. We are supposed to train human beings to be intelligent human beings. Therefore, as dead truth says, we must cultivate the intellect as early as possible for this will produce intelligent people. This is errant nonsense, however. It is as much nonsense as it would be to train a one-year-old to be a shoemaker. People will, in fact, be intelligent only if they are not given intellectual training too early. It is often necessary to do the opposite of what we want to achieve in life. We cannot eat our food raw, but have to cook it first. And if this cooking process were to include the processes which are involved in eating, we might perhaps save ourselves the effort of eating. 
You cannot make people intelligent by cultivating the intellect as early as possible, but only by cultivating in them, when very young, the faculties which will later have them prepared to be intelligent. The abstract truth is, the intellect is cultivated via the intellect. The living truth is, the intellect is cultivated by healthy belief in rightful authority. Both parts of the statement have quite a different content in the living truth compared to the dead abstract truth. This is something humanity will have to come to realize more and more as time goes on. It is awkward. Consider how comfortable it is to have a goal and to achieve this can be achieved by and to believe this can be achieved by doing exactly what the goal says. But in life one has to do the opposite. This is certainly awkward. It is the challenge of our time that we must find our way to reality and life. This is what we must eminently make our own. There is need for this in both the great and the small things in life. You will not understand this age. You will be doing things as wrong as they can possibly be done unless you consider this. People have no idea today of how immensely abstract they are with everything forced always into the same mold. But the reality is not produced in the same mold, for it is in constant metamorphosis. The modified vertebrae which form part of the human head look very different from the vertebrae which make up the spine. Let me give you an example taken from everyday life. Imagine someone on the teaching staff of a university who teaches something which I or someone else must go against. I would, of course, make every effort to show that the things this person teaches are wrong, wanting to do my duty. I would go to any length to show that he is wrong and everything he says, well, to put it bluntly, is balderdash. This is one side of the matter. Now let us assume the individual concerned found himself in a situation where the authorities wanted to dismiss him from his post or discipline him in some way. Well, of course, I would stand up for him in every possible way against his dismissal or disciplining, but this would not be a question of the content of his teaching, but of ensuring academic freedom. For as long as we are dealing with people's theories, we have to fight. When it comes to an external institution, the fight ends and may even be transformed into coming to the individual's defense. It has to be realized that it is abominable if someone lets his opposition to someone induce him to take an active part in disciplining such a person. Let us assume, however, the individual concerned was a lecturer or professor of economics or politics and were appointed to hold a government office. What would our attitude be then? it would have to be such that one got him out of that office as quickly as possible, for there his theories would cause real damage. In anything we do, we must relate to the immediate living reality and not let ourselves be ruled by concepts. In the sphere of concepts, on the other hand, it is important to take a good hard look at the concepts we use. I have given this example to demonstrate the difference between dealing with reality and dealing with concepts. People who do not make this distinction will find it quite impossible to live with the tasks of the immediate future. They will at best be Wilsonians. What matters is to consider carefully what lives in reality and what one has to have by way of convictions in the sphere of concepts. This is particularly important in the education of the young. Teachers in training are weighed down today with all kinds of principles as to how they should teach, how they should educate. In the immediate future, this will become much less important. The important thing will be for them to get to know human nature and the different ways in which it comes to expression. They have to become psychologists in a most subtle way and really know the human soul. The relationship of the teacher to the pupil must in future be something analogous to clairvoyance. Teachers may not be fully conscious of this and it may only live instinctively in their souls, but they must instinctively, at a level close to prophecy, have a picture of what wants to emerge from the individual 
who is to be educated. Then a strange thing will happen, peculiar as it may sound today. The teachers of the future will dream a great deal of their pupils, for the prophecies will be wearing the garment of dreams. The pictures we see in our dreams arise only because we are not used to connecting our dreams with the future. We dress them in elements remembered from the past, as in a garment. In reality, dreams always point to the future. Yes, it is indeed true that the inner life will have to be changed, especially in those who educate the young. This is the most important aspect. Of course, everybody is more or less involved in educating the young, with just a very few exceptions, and it must therefore also hold true in a more general sense that we must have understanding for the karmic connections, as I have mentioned. Tremendously much will depend on this becoming general knowledge. The present generation is mainly educated to think in abstract terms and keeps confusing abstract and living ways of thinking. This is why it is so rare for anyone to support someone with glowing enthusiasm. For having his own concepts, he dislikes those of the other person, and it suits him rather well if others come and put the other person out of action. These, however, are the very things which can teach us, and there can be no better education for people but to find ways in which they can stand up for their opponents with ever-increasing enthusiasm. This should not be forced, of course. People are friends or enemies today on a purely abstract basis. There is no point in this, however. Only the realities of life have a point to them, and they are given by life, not by our sympathies and antipathies. We should still have those sympathies and antipathies, but the pendulum should not merely swing up in one direction, but also go down and in the opposite direction. Humanity must learn to live on two levels at once. In dualism, to enter into profound thought and where reality demands this, to pour ourselves out over reality. Today people want to take their thought forms into everything connected with real life. and They are only prepared to put up with reality if it fits in with their own thought forms. Uniformity is what they are after. But uniformity cannot be justified in the light of the Spirit. This is impossible. The world cannot be easy and comfortable the way it is in reality. Not everyone will have the kind of face we like and find sympathetic. But it is wrong to let our actions toward others be determined by our personal sympathies and antipathies. Other impulses must come into play. People find it difficult to manage today because they look at the world and if they do not find it in accord with their sympathies and antipathies, then in their view everything is crooked and awry and quite wrong and they are governed by just one impulse, that the world ought to be different. This is one thing which has to be said. On the other hand, we must not allow this to take us to the opposite equally lackadaisical extreme where we say that one should not be too fussy and just take the world as it is. This would be equally wrong. There are situations in life when serious objections must be raised, and this is what should be done. It means that due recognition must be given to reality. What really matters is the pendulum swing between a clear-minded inner life in well-defined concepts and loving care extended to the phenomena of the world. Anthroposophy can show the way if we have the right attitude to it. But this, too, is something which has to be learned. The truths which are won from the world of the spirit are like communications, even for clairvoyant individuals. If we treat, th treat these truths in the same way we treat the facts of the outside world, which are accessible to our unrefined senses, we are being unfair to spiritual science. The whole of spiritual science is open to our understanding. But it is wrong to ask the spiritual scientist, quote, yes, but why, close quote, each time he says anything, for these are communications he has received from the spiritual world. And if I say, quote, Jack Miller has told me this or that, close quote, it is pointless to say, quote, and why did he tell you this, close quote. He simply told me the question as to why has little relevance. 
The things which come from the spiritual world must be considered as communications of this kind. It is important to under- understand this. We shall continue with this tomorrow. The end of Lecture 7 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness. This is Lecture 8, entitled Abstraction and Reality, given in Dornach on the 13th of October, 1917. You will have gathered, from what I said yesterday, that at the present time we must come to realize the distinction between abstract and purely intellectual thinking and thinking which is based on reality, in order to relate our thinking to the reality. The natural tendency is to make our thinking incontrovertible, as free from contradictions as we can make it. But the world is full of contradictions, and if we really want to grasp reality, we cannot throw a general standard form of thinking, like a net, over everything, in order to understand it. We have to consider everything on an individual basis. The greatest defect and deficiency in our time is that people are literally inclined to think in abstractions. This takes them further away from reality. We now come to the application of this to reality itself. Please consider this carefully. I am going to say something rather strange, for I have to apply unrealistic thinking to reality. Unrealistic thinking is, of course, also part of reality. The unrealistic thinking, which has developed over the last three or four centuries, and the fact that, as such, it has become part of reality in human life, has resulted in an unreal structure which is always self-contradictory. People are doing all right, one might say, with regard to the physical and material world, for the physical world ignores them and they can, therefore, have as many wrong ideas as they like. This makes them, forgive the paradoxical way of putting this, into billy goats who keep butting against the brick wall of reality with their horns in their insistence on thinking about the physical world in abstract terms. We can see this with many ideologies. They keep coming up against the brick wall of reality, and they are sometimes just as stubborn as goats these ideologies. The situation is different, however, when it comes to social and political life. Here the human thoughts of every individual enter into the social structure. We do not come up against a reality that will not yield. In this case we create the reality. And if this goes on for a few hundred years, the reality will be what you may expect it to be. It will be full of contradictions. Reality itself comes to realization in structures which do not have the power of reality in them. As a result, there are upheavals such as the present catastrophic war. Here you have the connection between the inner life of people who lived in a particular age and the outer physical events of a time which comes a little later. It is always the situation that anything which emerges in the physical world has first lived in the spirit, and this also applies where humanity is concerned, with things living first in human thoughts and then in human actions. And we can see how abstract thinking has penetrated into reality if we look at the present time where this shows itself in its true form, that is, in this case, in its untrue form, which is its true form. The reality is in many ways seen in an abstract way. People look at it as if they were watching the conjurer I spoke of yesterday and the weights which have no weight, with the conjurer behaving as if they weighed many kilograms. The most significant characteristic of many of the concepts held today is their poverty. People like to take things easy today, as I have said so many times, and they want their concepts to be as straightforward as possible. This, however, makes them rather limited. Now, limited concepts do prove adequate, 
when one is dealing with the superficial aspects of the physical world, the mere surface of that world, which is the only thing modern people want to consider, in spite of all the advances. Magnificent discoveries have been made in recent times about physical phenomena, but the concepts used to explore them are relatively limited. The desire for limited concepts or concepts of limited content has also crept into all philosophical and ideological thinking. We see philosophers today who are literally craving such limited concepts. The most limited concepts, with practically no content, are tossed about over and over again. They are often quite pretentious, but they do not contain anything which has real weight. Widely used ideas today are the eternal, infinity, unity, the significant compared to the insignificant, general, particular, and so on. People like bandying these about. The more abstract, the better. This creates a peculiar situation with regard to reality. People no longer see the living reality in anything and lose all feeling for what reality really has to offer. Merely observe the present situation and you will find this everywhere. Let me tell you about something that is really worrying. A present-day philosopher has been considering the question as to whether it is possible to have an opinion regarding the length of time for which this war will continue. It is a vital question. I think you will agree. But it is a question which needs to be decided by using real concepts, which have content and are full of life. It cannot be decided by using generalized abstract ideas of world and temporality, general and particular, and so on. This kind of generalized philosophizing will get us nowhere with regard to the concrete issues. The philosopher concerned found, as many people find, that it does not matter if the war continues for any length of time, for this will for this will be the only way of achieving permanent peace, as they call it, and let us have paradise on earth. You will remember I compared this with the idea that the best way of making sure no more crockery is broken in the home is to break all the crockery in the first place. This is more or less the conclusion reached by people who say the war must continue until there is a prospect of permanent peace. The philosopher, therefore, applied his ideology to the question, an ideology which, in his opinion, deals with the most sublime which in our time means the most abstract, ideas. And what did he say? Believe it or not, he said, compared to the eternity it takes to create satisfactory conditions for humanity, what does it matter if a few more tons of organic matter perish in the fields of battle? What are a few tons of organic matter compared to life eternal, to human evolution? Close quote. Those are the achievements of abstract thinking when it is addressed, addressing itself to reality. And we have to draw people's attention to how horrific this is, for they do not feel it on their own. We can only be in constant amazement at how these things escape attention and fail to give much cause for thought. Fundamentally speaking, such ideas are part of the present-day desire for ideologies. This has given rise to the most abstract of abstract ideas, which, however, can only be applied to the dead, inorganic, mineral world. If philosophers apply such ideas not only to the sphere of life, but also to that of the soul and spirit, it is only to be expected that they come to this kind of conclusion. In the realm of dead matter, human beings do, of course, have to apply the principle Quote, what are so and so many hundredweight of material compared to what will be the end result? Close quote. It would be impossible to do any building, for instance, if we were obliged to leave everything untouched. Yet we must not apply to human life what applies only to the lifeless, inorganic world. The concepts developed in modern science apply only to the inorganic world, but people are all the time applying them elsewhere and the problem is that no one notices. Opinions of the kind that the war should not be brought to an end until the above-mentioned prospect is there 
are saying exactly what the philosopher put so brutally, although it would seem to him that he put it in a very superior way. Others simply feel embarrassed about saying such things, but the philosopher hides the brutality behind beautiful words. Yes, he puts things in a very superior way, juggling with ideas like eternity and temporality, the human being forever evolving, the transient temporal reality of so and so many tons of organic matter. But he ignores the fact that eternity, infinity, lives in every human being and that every single human being is worth as much as the whole inorganic world taken together. These things also provide the background to the forms we are now seeking to develop here on this hill. For art too has gradually been caught up in an ideology which is without weight and without reality. We have to come to the true nature of things again, and this is only possible if we come to the spirit. We therefore need different forms from those one generally sees in the world of art today. In other words, our age must once again become creative and do so out of the spirit. This goes against the grain with many people today, but try and understand the enormous extent to which our whole ideology has gradually entered more and more into the lifeless sphere because it has only been considering that sphere. Look at the buildings and at the other works of art produced in the 19th century. Really, all one gets is old styles rehashed over and over again. People have built in the classical style, the Renaissance and the Gothic styles, always something which is no longer alive. They have not been able to work with the elements which live in the present. This is what we must achieve. It will create a completely new spirit. It will involve many sacrifices. But something like the house which has been built outside, which has new forms created out of the concrete itself, is a pioneering effort. And it matters not only that these forms have been thought, but also that the opportunity has, was made to produce such a building. These things must be considered and given their full weight. Otherwise, there can be no comprehension of what we intend to create on this hill. The nature of the whole is such that the forms now coming into existence here contradict and are in utter conflict with the forms created in the rest of the world today. Quote, to understand the present time, close quote, this phrase has been like a thread running through everything I have been saying to you since my return. It does, however, mean that rather than take it easy, we have to put in a lot of effort, effort of thought, effort of feeling, effort of will to experiment, in the desire to understand the present time. And we must have the courage to make a complete break with some of the things that belong to the past. Fundamentally speaking, the people who are considered to be most enlightened today are often working with old ideas without really knowing how to use them to good purpose. Let me give you an example. I am sure that here in Switzerland, too, you will have heard and read a lot about a book which was no doubt also given pride of place in local bookshop windows, for it has made a profound impression in the present time. I am especially pleased to be able to speak of something that comes from our friends and not only our enemies, so that no one should think there is a personal bias. The book on the state as a life form was written by the Scandinavian writer Rudolf Kellen, one of the few who have shown an interest in my writings and commented on them in a positive way. So I think it will be obvious that there is no personal bias in what I am going to say about this book, but I believe it is something which has to be said. The book is a good example of the inappropriate ideas people have in the present time. An attempt is made to see the state as an organism. This is the kind of thing people do when they use the ideas current in our time to grasp anything that needs to be grasped in mind and spirit. It is good to be able to say this is an erudite, scholarly and truly profound individual, someone who really cannot praise enough, we really cannot praise enough, but 
At the same time, we are going to show the true nature of the completely inappropriate idea on which the book is based. This is the kind of contradiction in which we find ourselves all the time. Life is full of contradictions. Abstract and incontrovertible ideas will not do if we want to take hold of life. We should not immediately think that someone whom we have to fight is an idiot. It is also possible to see someone whom we have to fight as a most erudite and thoroughgoing scholar, as indeed is the case with the author about whose work I am speaking. What Kellen is doing is rather similar to what the Swabian, now I do not know what to call him, the Swabian scholar or the Austrian minister of state, for he was both, Scheffler, Scheffler in his day made a thorough attempt to see the state as an organism and individual citizens as the cells in this organism. Hermann Barr, I have spoken of him before, wrote a refutation of Scheffler's book. The title of the book was Die Aussichtslosigkeit der Sozialdemokratie. Sorry about that. Translates as Social Democracy, Outlook Nil. The refutation was entitled Die Einsichtslosigkeit des Herrn Scheffler. Translated, translates as Mr. Scheffler, Insight Nil. A brilliant little book. He called it a bit of naughtiness in a recent lecture. It is still quite a brilliant piece of work, written in his youth. Scheffler, therefore, did something rather like Kellen in, is doing now. Kellen, too, is trying to present every state as an organism, with the individual citizen as its cells. Citizens as its cells. We do, of course, know quite a few things about the way in which cells function in an organism and about the laws which pertain in an organism and this transfers quite prettily to a state. People like to use such comparisons in areas which their minds are unable to penetrate. Well, the method of comparison can be applied to anything. If you like, I can easily develop a complete little science based on the comparison between a swarm of locusts and a double base. You can compare anything to anything in the world, and comparisons will always prove fruitful. But the fact that we are able to make comparisons certainly does not mean that we are dealing with reality in making them. It is especially important to have a tremendous sense of reality when creating analogies, otherwise they will not work. When we create an analogy, we are apt to find ourselves in the situation which some people experience as a harsh destiny in the days of their youth, when, forgive me, we instantly fall in love with the analogy we have created. Analogies which come to mind and really are obvious do have the drawback that we fall in love with them. This has its consequence, however, for we grow blind to any argument against the conclusions which may be drawn from the analogy. And I must say, when I had read Kellen's book, I realized, as soon as I considered it in the light of reality, that it has been written right now, during this war. To write such a book about the state as an organism did not seem entirely unrealistic to me. You only need to look around you a little and you realize, even if it may not be literally so, that wars are fought in such a way that bits are cut off from the state which are in combat, and one bit is put here and another there, bits are cut off and put somewhere else. This aspect of war does matter, at least to a lot of people. Now, if we were to compare states to organisms, we should at least try and take the analogy so far that one would also be able to cut bits off one organism and give them to a neighboring organism. This is something people should realize, but they do not because they have fallen in love with the analogy. There are many other examples I could give, and, uh, and these would probably amuse you a great deal and make you laugh heartily, and you would then no longer consider the individual concerned to be as erudite as I do consider him to be. I do indeed consider him to be the most erudite and truly profound. How can it happen that someone may be erudite and a real scholar, and nevertheless build a whole system on a completely inappropriate idea. Well, you see, the reason is that the analogy created by Kellen is correct. 
You will now say that you no longer know which way to turn. First I tell you the analogy is utterly inappropriate, and then I tell you it is correct. Well, in saying that it is correct, I meant that it can certainly be made. What matters, however, is what we are comparing. You always have two things in an analogy. In Kellen's case, the state and the organism. Things must always be presented in accord with their true nature. The state exists, and the organism, too, exists. Neither of them can be wrong. Only the way they are brought together is wrong. The point is that what is happening on earth can certainly be compared to an organism. The political events on earth can be compared to an organism. But we must not compare the state to an organism. If we compare the state to an organism, this makes individual human beings into cells, which is simply nonsense, for it will get us nowhere. It is, however, possible to compare political and social life on earth to an organism, but it is the whole earth which must be compared to the organism. As soon as we compare the whole earth, that is, human events all over the earth, to an organism, and the different states, not the people, to different kinds of cells, the analogy is true and it is valid. If you take this as your basis and then observe how individual states relate to each other, you will have something similar to the cells which make up the different systems in the organism. What matters, therefore, is that we apply any analogy we have chosen to create at the right level. Kellen's and also Scheffler's mistake was to compare an individual state to the whole organism, when in fact it can only be compared to a cell, a fully developed cell. Life on the earth as a whole can be compared to an organism, and then the comparison will prove fruitful. I think you will agree that the cells of the organism do not walk past each other in the way individual people do in a country. Cells adjoin. They are neighbors. And this also holds true for individual states, which are indeed like cells in the total organism of life on earth. You may well feel that something is missing in what I have been saying. If your sense of pedantic accuracy, and this too has its justification, begins to stir in your hearts as I say these things, you will no doubt say I ought to give you proof that the life of the whole earth must be compared to the organism and an individual state to a cell. Well, the proof of the pudding lies in the eating. It does not lie in the abstract deliberations, which we can also go into, but in taking the thought to its conclusion. If you do so with regard to Kellen's idea, you will always find that it cannot be taken to its conclusion. You will keep running into a brick wall, and you will have to turn into a goat, otherwise you cannot take it to its conclusion. Yet, if you take the thought to its conclusion for the life of the whole earth, you will find that it works, that you gain useful insights, and it makes a good regulative principle. You will come to understand many things, even more than I have already indicated. People are abstractionists today, and one feels like saying that if you have a dozen people, thirteen of them would think as follows. I know the figures do not fit, but the real situation is such today that it is practically true. If you take the case where Kellen compares the individual state to an organism, and if we are countering this by saying that in reality one must compare political and social life all over the globe to an organism, these thirteen people out of a dozen will believe the analogy to be valid for all times. For if someone establishes a theory about the state, then this theory must apply in the present time, in Roman times, and even in Egyptian and Babylonian times, for a state is a state. People base themselves on concepts today, but not on, real on the reality. But truly, this is not how things are. In this respect, too, humanity is going through a process of evolution. The analogy I have given is only valid from the 16th century onward. Before then, the globe was not a coherent whole. It, was a, it, it has only come to be a coherent political whole from then onward. America, the Western Hemisphere, simply did not exist for any political life which might have been a coherent whole. 
by creating a proper analogy, you immediately also see the tremendous break that exists between more recent life and life in the past. Insights based on reality always bear fruit, compared to concepts not based on reality, which are sterile and do not bear fruit. Every insight based on reality takes us a step further. We gain more than its immediate content, and it takes us forward in the real world. This is what is so important. It is what we must concentrate on. Abstract concepts are like this. We have them, but the reality is outside and does not care a hoot about this abstract concept. Concepts based on reality hold within them the whole active inner life, which is also their outside, life that chumbles and churns in every part of the real world out there. People are made uncomfortable by this. They want their concepts to be as quiet and colorless as possible and are afraid they will get giddy if their concepts have inner life. Concepts without inner life do, however, have the disadvantage that the reality can be there in front of our eyes and yet we do not see the most important element in it. Reality is also full of concepts and ideas. It is really true what I said here a few days ago. Elemental life goes on out there, and it is full of concepts and ideas. I also said that abstract ideas are mere corpses of ideas. It can happen that people who only like corpses of ideas will speak and think in them, whereas reality comes to quite different conclusions. It lets events take quite a different course from anything human minds are liable to come up with. For three years now we have been caught up in terrible events, which can teach us a great deal. We must be awake and following events, however, and not asleep. It is really something to marvel at, negatively speaking, that so many people are still asleep to the reality of these terrible events, and still have not come to the realization that events which have never happened before in the world evolution of humanity demand that we develop new ideas, which also have not existed before. Let me put this more accurately in symbolic form. We may certainly say that some individuals had a notion that this war was coming, and they may have had it for many years. Generally speaking, it can be said, however, that with the exception of certain groups in the Anglo-American world, the war was completely unexpected. With those who had an idea of its coming, the idea sometimes took a very odd form. One idea, which could be found again and again, came from economists and politicians who were deep thinkers. I assure you I am not being ironical, I am completely serious about this, and was based on careful deductions made with reference to certain events. These people proceeded in a very scientific way, combining, abstracting, and making all kinds of syntheses, and finally arrived at an idea which one really did come across for a long time, even at the time when war broke out. It was that in the light of the present world situation, of economic factors and the trade situation, this war could not possibly go on for more than four or six months. This was a truth fully supported by factual evidence, and the reasons given were far from stupid. They were perfectly good reasons. But how does reality compare to the whole tissue of reasons put together by those clever economists? Well, you can see what is happening in reality. What is the point, I ask you, when such a situation arises? The point is that we must draw the right conclusions from such a situation, so that the war actually teaches us something. What is the only possible conclusion from what I have given as a symbol? You see, I have merely given one glaringly obvious instance. I could tell you of many other and similar views which have also fallen foul, to put it mildly, of the real events which have occurred in the last three years. What then is the only real conclusion? It is that everything from which the wrong conclusions were drawn must be thrown overboard and we must say to ourselves, our thinking has been divorced from reality.
We have developed a system of ideas and then applied this abstract, unrealistic system to reality, which made reality become untrue. We must therefore break with the premises on which our apparent conclusion was based, for this conclusion destroys the real world. One can make a strong point of saying these things to people today, but whether they will also take it as a strong point is another question. Something that was just as intelligent as the politician's idea of the potential duration of the war, again I am not being ironical, were the reasons given by an enlightened group of medical men when the first railways were being built in Central Europe. Speaking on the basis of medical knowledge at the time, not just a single eccentric, but a whole group of medical men, I have spoken of this before, said that the railway should not be built because the human nervous system would not be able to cope with them. This is on historical record. It happened in 1838. Not so long ago, therefore, the professional opinion was that railways should not be built. If, however, people were to build railways after all, so the document says, high board fences should be put on either side of the tracks so that the farmers would not see the trains passing by and suffer concussion as a result. Yes, it is easy to laugh afterward when reality has ignored such arguments. People laugh about it afterward, but there are some elemental spirits who laugh about human folly when it is being committed, or indeed even before scientists come up with such foolish notions. We must break with anything where the opposite has proved true. Reality is contradicting theory, and the life of the last three years, as it has been all over the world, is contradiction come to realization. We must take a new look at events, for the present time is challenging us to make a radical revision of our views. It is actually difficult to take such a train of thought through to its conclusion once it has been started. Humanity is not sufficiently free-thinking today to allow these thoughts to reach their conclusion. Anyone who has a sense for reality, for what really happens all around us, can of course see that the conclusions are being drawn in the real world outside. It is just that people will not get this into their heads. There is an enormous difference in this respect between the West and the East. Last year I discussed the profound difference between West and East with you from all kinds of different points of view, pointing out, for example, that the West is mainly talking of birth and of claiming rights. Look at Western views. Birth and origin is the principal idea in science. It has given rise to Darwin's theory on the origin of species. We might also say, in ideological terms, the theory of birth and origin in practical terms, the idea of human rights. In the East, in Russian life, which is little known to us, we find reflections on death, on the human goal extending into the world of the spirit, and on the concept of guilt and of sin in terms of practical ethics. Read Soloviev. His works are now readily available. Such contrasts may be found in most areas, and we do not grasp reality unless we take full note of them. Emotions, sympathies and antipathies prevent people from considering the things which matter. As soon as sympathies and antipathies are aroused, people will not even let the truth get near them. In the same way, people who have fallen in love with a particular analogy fail to see the contradictions. People hold anything they love for the absolute truth, they cannot even imagine that the opposite may also be true, though from a different point of view. Let us consider the West, and specifically the Anglo-American West, for the rest are mostly repeating what they are saying. Which point of view, or ideal, as people also like to call it, is all-pervading, particularly in Wilsonianism? It is that the whole world should be the same as these Western nations have been in recent centuries, they developed their own ideal system, calling it by different names, such as, in quotes, democracy and the like. And other nations are very, much, are very much at fault because they have not developed the same system. It is only right and proper that the whole world should adopt their system. 
The Anglo-American view is this, quote, What we have developed, what we have become, is right for all nations, great and small. It creates the right political situation and makes the people happy. This is how things should be everywhere, close quote. We hear it being proclaimed, it is the gospel of the West. No one even considers that such things are only relative and that they develop mainly on the basis of emotions and not, as people believe, of pure sense and reason. Take care, of course, not to squeeze these words too much, for squeezing the last out of a word is something which often leads to misunderstanding today. People might think, for instance, that I want to hit out at the American people or the Anglo-American peoples when I speak of Wilsonianism or Lord Georgianism. This is not at all the case. I am deliberately calling it Wilsonianism because I mean something quite specific. But far be it from me to mean something which you could simply call Americanism. This is another case where one has to concentrate on the real situation. Some of the tirades to have come from Mr. Wilson in recent times did not even originate on American soil. We cannot even do Mr. Wilson the honor of calling his tirades original. They are worthless and untrue, and they are not even entirely original. The strange thing is that a writer in Berlin, someone with considerable acumen, has written articles which were Wilsonian without being Wilson's. They did rather well, these articles, though not in Germany. They did well in the American Congress, and you find them included page by page in the proceedings of Congress, because they were read out at Congress meetings. Some of Wilson's more recent tirades may be found in those pages. Some of the fabrications Wilson produces against Central Europe have their origin there. So they are not even original. It should be rather interesting, quite a joke in fact, when future historians look at the proceedings of the American Congress and find there was a time when those gentlemen decided not to present their own brilliant ideas, but to read out the articles by the writer in Berlin, and those pages were then included in their proceedings, with, quote, proceedings of the American Congress, close quote, written on the cover. What really interests us, however, is the reason why the Americans liked those articles. Well, it is because they really say that one can feel perfectly comfortable on a chair which one has occupied for centuries, and where one is now able to sit and tell the world, quote, you should all sit on chairs like this, and everything will be fine, close quote. This is what you get in the West. The East, Russia, has also come to a conclusion but not by way of a concept. The people there are not yet theorists, for they have their reality. The conclusion they have drawn is a different one. They never dreamt of saying, quote, what we have been doing for centuries must now be the salvation of the whole world. We want people to be the same as we have been, close quote. It would have been, it would have been possible to find a pretty word for what has been going on for centuries in Russia, Pretty words can always be found, even if the reality is about as horrible as you can imagine. If you pay for it with American money, it will just cost so and so many dollars, and you can reinterpret the most golden of ideas as ethical ideals. This, however, is not what happened in the East, for there a real conclusion was reached. People did not say, quote, the world should now accept what we have had so far, close quote. Instead, the real conclusion which I touched on earlier was drawn, that the premises do not have to be correct. Something has been set in motion, though it is as yet far from what it will be one day. But this does not concern us. I do not want to express an opinion on the one or the other. I merely want to show how great the contrast is. If you consider the contrast, you get a colossal picture of the reality between the West, where people swear on anything which has to do with their past, and the East, where people have broken with everything that was their past. If you consider this, you are not at all far away from the real causes of the present conflict. Neither will you be far away from something else to which I have drawn attention before. 
The war is actually a war between West and East. The middle is simply being ground to dust between the two, merely because West and East cannot come to terms. The middle is suffering because of the dis- of disagreement between West and East. But does anyone want to pay heed to such a colossal truth? Did the events of March 1917 cast a light on the enormous contrast between West and East? Last year we had the ideologies of the West and the East written up on this blackboard. World history has been teaching us from March this year, and humanity will have to learn and come to understand. If they do not, quite different, even harder times will come. It is not a question of knowing things in an abstract sense, but above all of calling for a changing of ways, for an effort to be made. The old easy ways must go, and a spiritual approach must be seen to be the right way. And the effort must be made to find energies through spiritual science, not the kind of mere satisfaction where people say, quote, wasn't that nice? I feel really good, close quote, and float around in cloud cuckoo land where they gradually go to sleep in their satisfaction at the harmony which exists in the world and the love of humanity which is so widespread. This was very much to the fore in the society endeavor headed by Mrs. Besant. Many of you will remember the many protests I made against the precious sweetness and light that was particularly to be found in the Theosophical Society. High ideals were dished up liberally and internationally in the sweetest tones. All you heard was, quote, general brotherhood, close quote, quote, love of humanity, close quote. I could not go along with this. We were seeking real concrete knowledge about what went on in the world. You will remember the analogy I have often used, that this sweetness and general love seem to me like someone who keeps on encouraging the stove which is supposed to heat the room. Quote, Dear stove, it is your general stove duty to get the room warm, so please make it warm. Close quote. All the male and female aunts, it seemed to me, were presenting the sum total of theosophy in those days in sweet words of love for humanity. My answer at the time was, quote, you have to put coal in the stove and put in wood and light the fire. Close quote. And if you are involved in a spiritual movement, you must bring in real concrete ideas. Otherwise you will go on year after year with sweet nothings about general love of humanity. This general love of humanity has really shown itself in a very pretty light in Mrs. Besant, the leading figure in the theosophical movement. It is, of course, more of an effort to deal with reality than to waffle in general terms about world harmony, about the individual soul being in harmony with the world, about harmony in the general love of humanity. Anthroposophy does not exist to send people off to sleep, but to make them really wide awake. We are living at a time when it is necessary for people to wake up. The end of Lecture 8 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness. This is Lecture 9, entitled The Battle Between Michael and the Dragon, given in Dornach on the 14th of October, 1917. It is necessary to let certain fundamental truths of spiritual development come to mind whenever you have gained some material, as we may call it, by way of knowledge and the like, for this will allow you to penetrate those fundamental truths more deeply. In the last days we have considered all kinds of ideas which may explain the events of our time, at least to some extent. We have therefore acquired a number of ideas concerning present developments. We can put these together with fundamental truths which we already know from certain points of view but which can be penetrated more deeply if we approach them again following further preparation. I have frequently spoken of the significant break which occurred in the spiritual development of the peoples of Europe and America in the middle of the 19th century, and especially in the 1840s. I have pointed out that this was the time when the materialistic point of view came to its peak, 
with a peak was reached in what we may call a way of grasping dead outer facts with the intellect, refusing to enter into living reality. Let me read that part again. I think there's a word missing. I have pointed out that this was the time when the materialistic point of view came to its peak, with a peak that was reached in what we may call a way of grasping dead outer facts with the intellect, refusing to enter into living reality. The deeper sources of such events, and today we are very much involved in their after effects, which will continue to have an influence for a long time to come, must be sought in the world of the spirit. And if we investigate the processes in that world, which have come to outer expression in the event of which I have just spoken, we have to point to a struggle, a real war in that world, which began then and came to a certain conclusion for the world of the spirit by the autumn of 1879. To have the right idea about these things, you must visualize a battle which continued for decades in the spiritual worlds from the 1840s until the autumn of 1879. This may be called a battle which the spirits who are followers of the spirit belonging to the hierarchy of archangels, whom we may call Michael, fought with certain Aramonic powers. Please consider this battle to have been in the first place a battle in the spiritual world. Everything I am referring to at the moment relates to this battle fought by Michael and his followers against certain Aramonic powers. A good way of strengthening this idea, especially if you want to make it fruitful for your life in the present time, is to have it in your mind's eye that, EYE, that the human souls who were born exactly in the fifth decade of the 19th century actually took part in this battle between Michael's followers and the Aramonic powers when they were in the spiritual world. If you think on this, it will give you a great deal of understanding of the outer and inner destiny experienced by these individuals, and above all of their inner constitution. The battle thus took place in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and came to a conclusion in the autumn of 1879, when Michael and his followers won a victory over certain Aramonic powers. What does this signify? To see something like this in the right way, we can always call on an image which humanity has known throughout its evolution, the fight between Michael and the dragon. This image has come up again and again in the course of evolution. We may characterize it by saying that every battle between Michael and the dragon is similar to the one in the 1840s, but it is about different things, harmful and damaging things. We may say that a particular crowd of Aramonic spirits seek over and over again to bring something into world evolution, but they are always overcome. And so they also lost the battle in the autumn of 1879, and as I said, this was in the spiritual world. But what does it signify that the powers of the dragon, this crowd of Aramonic spirits, are driven down into the human realms, banished from heaven to earth, as it were? Losing the battle means they are no longer to be found in the heavens, to use the biblical term. Instead, they are to be found in the human realms, which means that the late 1870s were a particular time when human souls became subject to Aramonic powers with regard to certain powers of perception. Before this, these powers were active in the spiritual realms and therefore left human beings more in peace. When they were driven out of the spiritual realms, they came upon human beings. And if we inquire into the nature of the Aramonic powers which entered into human beings, when they had to leave the realms of the spirit? The answer is, the Aramonic materialistic view with its personal, mark this well, its personal bias. Materialism had, of course, reached its peak in the 1840s. But in those days, its impulses were more instinctive in humans, 
where the crowd of Aramonic spirits still sent their impulses from the spiritual world into human instincts. From the autumn of 1879 onward, these Aramonic impulses, powers of perception and of will, became the personal property of human beings. Before this they were more of a general property. Now they were transplanted to become personal property. We are thus able to say that due to the presence of these Aramonic powers from 1879 onward, personal ambitions and inclinations to interpret the world in materialistic terms came to exist in the human realm. You only have to trace some of the events which have arisen because of personal inclinations since then to understand that they resulted when the archangel Michael drove the dragon, that is, the crowd of Aramonic spirits, from the realms of the spirit, from the heavens, down to earth. This occurrence has profound significance. The people of the 19th century and of our own time are not inclined to pay attention to such occurrences in the spiritual world and to the way in which they relate to the physical world. Yet the ultimate reasons and final impulses for events on earth can only be found if one knows the spiritual background. It has to be said that it takes a fair amount of materialism, even if dressed up as idealism, to say, quote, in terms of eternity, what does it matter if so and so many tons of organic matter will perish as the war is allowed to continue? Close quote. One has to feel the extent to which such a view has its roots in Aramanism, for its roots truly are in the realms of inner response. The philosopher Henri Lichtenberger's philosophy of tons of organic matter is one of many examples which may be quoted to show the specific forms taken by the Aramanic way of thinking. The deepest impulse which has been living in many human souls since 1879 is therefore one which was cast down into the human realms. Before that it lived as Aramanic power in the world of the spirit. It is helpful to look for other ways of strengthening the idea in our minds by using concepts from the material world, using them essentially as symbolic images. What happens today more at the level of soul and spirit had more of a material bias in very early times. The world of matter is also spiritual. It is merely a different form of spirituality. If you were to go back to very early times in evolution, you would find a battle similar to the one I have just described. As already mentioned, these battles have recurred over and over again, but always on different issues. In the distant past, the crowd of Aramonic spirits were also cast down from the spiritual worlds into the earthly realm when they had lost such a battle. You see, they would return to the attack again and again. After one of these battles, for example, the crowd of Aramonic spirits populated the earth with the earthly life forms which the medical profession now calls bacilli. Everything which has the power to act as a bacillus, everything in which bacilli are involved, is the result of crowds of Aramonic spirits being cast down from heaven to earth at a time when the dragon had been overcome. In the same way, the Aramonic Mephistophelian way of Thinking has spread since the late 1870s as the result of such a victory. Thus we are able to say that tubercular and bacillary diseases come from a similar source as the materialism which has taken hold of human minds. We can also compare the occurrences of the last century with something else. We can point to something which you know already from title Occult Science, the withdrawal of the moon from the sphere of earth evolution. The moon was once part of the earth. It was cast out from the earth. As a result, certain moon influences took effect on earth. And this too followed a victory won by Michael over the dragon. We are therefore also able to say that everything connected with certain effects 
relating to the phases of the moon and all impulses which reach the earth from the moon have their origin in a similar battle between Michael and the dragon. These things really do belong together in a way. And it is extremely useful to consider this, for it has profound significance. Some individuals develop an irresistible hankering for intellectual materialism, which arises from being in league with the fallen Araman. They gradually come to love the impulses which Araman raises in their souls, and indeed consider them to be a particularly noble and sublime way of thinking. Once again, it is necessary to be fully and clearly aware of these things. Unless they are in our conscious awareness and we have clear insight, we cannot make head or tail of events. The danger inherent in all this must be looked at with a cool eye, as it were, and a calm heart. We have to face them calmly. We shall only do so, however, if we are quite clear about the fact that a certain danger threatens human beings from this direction. This is the danger of preserving what should not be preserved. Everything which happens within the great scheme of things does also have its good side. It is because the Aramonic powers entered into us when Michael won his victory that we are gaining in human freedom. Everything is connected with this, for the crowd of Aramonic spirits has entered into all of us. We gain in human freedom, but we must be aware of this. We should not allow the Aramonic powers to gain the upper hand, as it were, and we should not fall in love with them. This is tremendously important. There always is the danger of people continuing in materialism, in the materialistic, aramonic way of thinking, and carrying this on into ages when, according to the plan of things, it should have been overcome. The people who do not turn away from the aramonic, materialistic way of thinking and want to keep it would then be in league with everything which has come about through similar victories one over the dragon by Micaiah. They, therefore, would not unite with spiritual progress in human evolution, but with material progress. And a time would come in the sixth post-Atlantean age when the only thing to please them would be to live in something which will have been brought about by bacilli, these microscopically small enemies of humanity. Something else also needs to be understood exactly because of its logical consistency and indeed its greatness, the scientific way of thinking too is in great danger of sliding into the aramonic way of thinking. Consider how some scientists are thinking today in the field of geology, for instance. They study the surface formation of the earth and the residues and so on to determine how certain animals live or have lived in the different strata. Empirical data are established for certain periods. Scientists use these as a basis for their views as to what the earth looked like thousands and millions of years ago, arriving, for instance, at the nebula, at the nebular hypothesis of Kant and Laplace. They also develop ideas as to the future evolution of the earth, and from the physical point of view these are quite correct. They are often utterly brilliant but they are based on a method where the evolution of the earth is observed for a time and then conclusions are drawn millions of years before and millions of years afterward. What is really being done in this case? It is the same as if we were to observe a child when it is seven, eight or nine years old taking note of how its organs gradually change or partly change and calculate how much these human organs change over a period of two or three years. When we, we then multiply this to work out how much these organs change over a period of centuries. So we can work out what this child looked like a hundred years ago, and going in the other direction we can also work out what it will look like in a hundred and fifty years. It is a method which can be quite brilliant, and is in fact the method used by geologists today to work out the primeval conditions of the earth. It was also used to produce the hypothesis of Laplace. 
exactly the same method is used to visualize what the world is going to be like according to the physical laws which can now be observed. But I think you will admit that such laws do not signify much when applied to a human being, for example. A hundred years ago the child did not exist as a physical human being. Neither will it exist as a physical human being in a hundred and fifty years' time. The same applies to the earth with reference to the time scale used by geologists. The earth came into existence later than Tyndall, Huxley and Haeckel and others reckon. Before the time comes when you can simply paint the walls of a room with protein and have enough light to read by, the earth will be nothing but a corpse. It is quite easy to work out that one day it will be possible to use physical means to put protein on a wall where it will shine like electric light so that one can read the paper. This is bound to happen as part of the physical changes, no doubt. But in fact the time will never come, just as it will never happen that in a hundred and fifty years' time a child will show the changes, calculated from successive changes, seen in its stomach and liver in the course of two or three years, between the ages of seven and nine. Here you gain insight into some very strange things we have today. You can see how they clash. Think of a conventional scientist listening to what I have just been saying. He will say this is sheer foolishness. And then think of a spiritual scientist. He will consider the things the conventional scientist says to be foolish. All the many hypotheses concerning the beginning and the end of the earth are indeed nothing but foolishness, even though people have been utterly brilliant in establishing them. You see from this how unconsciously human beings are, in fact, being guided. But we are now in an age when such things must be perceived and understood. It is necessary to link such an idea with the other ideas we have characterized today. A time will come when we must have transformed our materialistic ideas to such an extent that we can progress to a more spiritual form of existence. But by then the earth will have been a corpse for a long time. It will no longer support us and incarnations in the flesh such as we seek today will no longer be sought. But the individuals who have become so tied up with the materialistic way of thinking that they cannot let go of it will still sneak down to the earth and find ways of involving themselves in the activities of bacilli, the tubercle bacillus and others. But bacillary entities which will be rummaging through every part of the earth's corpse. Today's bacilli are merely the prophets, let us say, of what will happen to the whole earth in the future. Then a time will come when those who cling to the materialistic way of thinking will unite with the moon powers and surround the earth, which will be a burnt-out corpse together with the moon. For they all want for all they want is to hold on to the life of the earth and remain united with it. They do not want to take the right course, which is to progress from the earth's corpse to what will be the future soul and spirit of the earth. In our time particularly, all these things are having an effect on many such admired, brilliant ideas and moral impulses. People christen everything moral impulse nowadays in which the aramonic and materialistic powers are alive. These have the capacity to develop into the impulses which act as numerous ties to hold human beings to the earth of their own will. It is important, therefore, to turn our attention to these things, and it is really most necessary to pay real heed to some highly respected elements which are taken as a matter of course today such as certain laws of nature. Anyone who does not accept them is called an amateur and a fool. Certain moral and political aspirations are taken as a matter of course. Great uh, Wilsonaids are proclaimed with regard to them. All these things have the potential to develop into something that can be characterized in the way I have just done. I had my reasons for saying that the people who had a part 
in the beginning of the battle in the 1840s, were in a special position. They were placed on earth at that time. And we can understand a great deal of the inner life of these people, especially those who were active in mind and spirit, and of their doubts and their inner battles. If we consider the impulse they brought from the life of the spirit in the 1840s into the second half of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Something else also relates to this, something which should not be overlooked today, but very often is. It is the belief that spiritual entities and their activities have no part in human affairs. People do not like to speak of events in human affairs having spiritual causes. Anyone who knows the real situation, however, is well aware that psychic or spiritual influences from the spiritual world on human beings here in the physical world are in fact particularly powerful at the present time. It is not at all uncommon to find people today who will tell you that a dream or something like a dream, they do not normally understand what is going on, but these are always non-physical elements, drove them to a particular course of events. Psychic influences of this kind play a much greater role today than materialists are prepared to believe. Anyone who has the opportunity to go into such things will find them at every turn. If you were to take the published works of today's better poets and do a statistical analysis of how many poems have come into existence in a way for which there is a rational explanation, and how many by an inspiration, a definite spiritual influence from the other world, with the poet experiencing it in a dream or something similar, you would be surprised how great is the percentage of direct influences from the spiritual world. People are influenced by the spiritual world to a much greater extent than they are prepared to admit. And the human actions performed under the influence of the spiritual world are indeed significant ones. Now and then the question comes up, quote, Why was a particular newspaper started? Close quote. The individual who started it had a particular impulse from the spiritual world. If he trusts you enough to speak openly about his impulses, he will speak of a dream when you ask about the real origin. This is why some time ago I had to say here that when historians come to discuss the outbreak of this war in time to come and use the documents of our civilization in the same way as did Ranke and other historians who went by the documents, they will never write about the most important event, which is something that happened under the influence of the spiritual world in 1914. Things go in cycles or periods. Anything which happens in the physical world is really a kind of projection or shadow of what happens in the spiritual world, except that it would have happened earlier in the spiritual world. Let us assume this line here, and there's a figure, was the line or plane separating the spiritual and the physical worlds. What I have just said could then be characterized as follows. Let us assume an event, for example the battle between Michael and the dragon happens, first of all, in the spiritual world. It finally comes to an end when the dragon is cast down from heaven to earth. On earth, then, the cycle is brought to completion after a time interval which approximately equals the time between the beginning of the battle in the spiritual world and the time when the dragon was cast down. We might say the dawn, the very beginning of this battle between Michael and the dragon, was in 1841. Things were particularly lively in 1845. It is 34 years from 1845 to 1879. And if we move on 34 years after 1879, we come to the mirroring event. You get 1913, the year preceding 1914. You see, the developments which started in the physical world in 1913 are the mirror image of the prime reasons for the spiritual battle. And now, consider 1841 to 1879 to 1917. 1841 was the crucial year in the 19th century. 1917 is its mirror image. 
if one realizes that the exertions of the crowd of Aramanic spirits in 1841, when the dragon started to fight Michael in the spiritual world, are mirrored right now in 1917, much of what is happening now will not really come as a surprise. Events in the physical world can really only be understood if one knows that they have been in preparation in the spiritual worlds. These things are not being said to worry people or put strange notions in their heads. They are meant as a challenge to see things clearly, to resolve to make the effort to look into the spiritual world and not to sleep through events. This is why it has become necessary in the field of anthroposophical development to say over and over again that there is need to be watchful, to take note of what is happening, and not let events go by unnoticed. It is sometimes only possible to say what I mean by using an analogy. Yesterday I spoke of the way in which the people in Eastern Europe draw conclusions from such events. If we here in the West want to find out what actually lives in the East European soul, the best way is to study the works of the philosopher Soloviev, though there are serious limits to what we can learn in this way. Real insight can only be gained from what has been said for many years in lectures and lecture courses given within the anthroposophical movement on destiny and the true nature of the Russian spirit. But by turning our attention to the philosopher Soloviev, it is possible to express by means of an analogy what one really wants to say in this case. As you know, Soloviev died at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century and has therefore been dead for a long time. Western people did not bother much with his philosophy. They had little opportunity to get to know it and little effort was made to study Soloviev as a representative of Eastern Europe. At best, we have the situation of the professor who some years ago had an idea that it was not exactly right for a professor of philosophy to know nothing about Soloviev. You know the story. So he let someone write a doctoral dissertation, saying to himself, he can study the work of Soloviev and I can read his dissertation. I merely want to use the point at issue as an analogy, therefore. I should like to put it like this. If we were to say that hypothetically Soloviev were alive today and had known this war and the events taking place in Russia, what would he, a Russian, have done? The answer, of course, can only be hypothetical, but it is a reasonable assumption that Soloviev would have found a way of removing everything he had written before the war and would have written new works he would have realized that it was necessary to revise his views completely, for his views were based on the time when they were written. He would thus have drawn the same conclusion as the whole of Eastern Europe. It seems paradoxical to say something like this, but if one reads Soloviev today, it is best to be clear in one's mind that little would have, that little would have Soloviev's absolute approval today. It would be a sign of being wide awake to make a fundamental revision of ideas which carried the greatest weight at the time but have since been reduced to absurdity. 2 plus 2 equals 4 would still be 2 plus 2 equals 4, but other things must certainly be revised. And we are only awake in our time if we are aware of this need for revision. In this year of 1917, 38 years after 1879, with 1879, 38 years after 1841, something important is being asked of humanity. What matters today is not what people did in 1914, but that they get themselves out of this situation. The problem we have to face now is how to get out of it again. And unless people realize that the old ideas will not get us out of it, and that new ideas are needed, the result will be failure. Anyone who thinks we shall get out of this with the old ideas is barking up the wrong tree. The effort must be made to gain new ideas, and this is only possible with insight into the spiritual world. It has been my intention today to give you something of a background 
to much of what I have been saying in these last days. You see, if one deals with spiritual life in concrete terms, it is not enough to have the general twaddle which is so popular with the people who believe in pantheism and similar philosophies, that there is a spiritual world, that the spirit is behind all physical things. Talking about the spirit in vague general terms will get you nowhere. We must consider specific spiritual events and spiritual entities which are beyond the threshold. Events in this world are not merely general, but quite specific, and they are concrete and specific in the other world. I do not think that there are many who, as they get up in the morning, would think, quote, If I step outside the front door, I shall be out in the world. Close quote. They would not say this, but they will have ideas about something specific they are going to encounter. In the same way, we shall only manage to deal with the deeper sources of human and world evolution if we are able to visualize the things which are beyond the threshold in a specific and concrete way and not just refer to them in general terms such as universal, providence and the like. Much, much can be felt when we look at the figures 1841 and 1917 in the diagram. But our inner response to this has to be alive in us if we are to understand what is really happening. The end of Lecture 9 You are listening to Rudolf Steiner Audio.com This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness. This is Lecture 10 entitled The Influence of the Backward Angels given in Dornach on the 20th of October 1917 It cannot be said that our present age has no ideals. On the contrary, it has a great many ideals, which, however, are not viable. Why is this so? Well, imagine. Please, forgive the somewhat bizarre image, but it does meet the case. A hen is about to hatch a chick, and we take the egg away and hatch it out in a warm place, letting the chick emerge from the egg. So far, so good. But if we were to do the same thing under the receiving part of an air pump, and therefore in a vacuum, do you think the chick emerging from the egg would thrive? We would have all the developmental factors which evolution has given, except for one thing, somewhere to put the chick for it to have the necessary conditions for life. This is more or less how it is with the beautiful ideals people talk about so much today. Not only do they sound beautiful, but they are indeed ideals of great value. But the people of today are not inclined to face the realities of evolution, though the present age demands this. And so it happens that the oddest kinds of societies may evolve, representing and demanding all kinds of ideals, and yet nothing comes of it. There were certainly plenty of societies with ideals at the beginning of the 20th century, but it cannot be said that the last three years have brought those ideals to realization. People should learn something from this. However, as I have said a number of times in these lectures, last Sunday, the 14th of October, I sketched a diagram to show the spiritual development of the last decades. I asked you to take into account that anything which happens in the physical world has been in preparation for some time in the spiritual world. I was speaking of something quite concrete, namely the battle which began in the 1840s in the spiritual world lying immediately above our own. This was a metamorphosis of the battles which are always given the ancient symbol of the battle fought by St. Michael against the dragon. I told you that this battle continued until November 1879, and after this Michael gained the victory, and the dragon, that is the Aramonic powers, were cast down into the human sphere. Where are they now? Now consider this carefully. The powers from the school of Aramon which fought a decisive battle in the spiritual world between 1841 and 1879, 
were cast down into the human realm in 1879. Since then their fortress, their field of activity, is in the thinking, the inner responses and the will impulses of human beings. And this is specifically the case in the epoch in which we now are. You must realize that infinitely many of the thoughts in human minds today are full of aramonic powers, as are their will impulses and inner responses. Events like these which play between the spiritual and the physical worlds are part of the great scheme of things. They are concrete facts which have to be reckoned with. What good is it to get bogged down in abstractions over and over again and to say something as abstract as, quote, human beings must fight Araman, close quote. Such an abstract formula will get us nowhere. At the present time, some people have not the least idea of the fact that they are in an atmosphere full of spirits. This is something which has to be considered in all its significance. If you consider just this, that as a member of the Anthroposophical Society, you are in a position to hear of these things and to occupy your thoughts and feelings with them, you will be aware of the full seriousness of the matter and that you have a task today, depending on your particular place in this present time, which is so full of riddles, so much open to question and so confused. You have to bring to this the best kinds of feelings and inner responses of which you are capable. Let us take the following example. Suppose a handful of people who have naturally come together and become friends know of the spiritual situation I have described and of other similar ones, whilst many other people do not know of them. You can be sure that if this hypothetical group of people were to decide to use the power they are able to gain from such knowledge for a particular purpose, the group, as its followers, though these would tend to be unaware of this, would be extremely powerful compared to people who have no idea of this and do not know and do not want to know of such things. Precisely such a group existed in the 18th century and still continues today. A certain group of people knew of the facts of which I have spoken. They knew that the events I have described as happening in the 19th and on into the 20th century would happen. In the 18th century, this group decided to pursue certain aims which were in their own interests and to work toward certain impulses. This was done quite systematically. The masses of humanity go through life as if asleep, without thought. They are completely unaware of what is going on in groups, some of them quite large, which may be right next door. Today, more than ever, people are much given up to illusion. Just consider the way in which many people keep saying today, quote, It is amazing how effective modern communications are and how this brings people together. Everybody hears about everybody else. This is totally different from the way it was in earlier times. Close quote. You will recall all the things people tend to say on the subject. But we only need to take a cool, rational view of some specific instances to find some very odd things going on in modern times. Who would believe, for example, I am merely giving an illustration, that the press which understands everything and goes into everything, would ever fail to make new literary works widely known. You would not think, would you, that profound, significant, epoch-making literary works would remain unknown. Surely we must hear of them in some way or other. Well, in the second half of the 19th century, the press, as we call it today, with due respect, was in the early stages of becoming what it is today. A new literary work appeared at that time which was more epoch-making and of more radical importance than all the well-known authors taken together, people like Spielhagen, Gustav Freitag, Paul Heise, and many others whose works went through numerous editions. The work in question was 
Dreizehn Linden by Wilhelm Weber, and it really was more widely read in the last third of the nineteenth century than any other work. But I ask you, how many people in this room do not know of the existence of Wilhelm Weber's title Dreizehn Linden? You see how people live alongside each other in spite of the press. Profoundly radical ideas are presented in beautiful poetic language in Dreizehn Linden. And these are alive today in the hearts and minds of thousands of people. I have spoken of this to show that it is entirely possible today for the mass of people to know nothing of radically new developments which are right on their doorstep. You may be sure, if there is anyone here who has not read Dreizehn Linden, and I assume there must be some among our friends, that these individuals must nevertheless know three or four people who have read it. The barriers separating people are such that some of the most important things simply are not discussed among friends. People do not talk to each other. The instance I have given concerns only a minor matter in terms of world history, but the same applies to major matters. Things are going on in the world which many people fail to see clearly. Thus it also happened that in the 18th century a society spread certain views and ideas which were taking root in people's minds and became effective in achieving the aims of such societies. The ideas entered into the social sphere and determined people's attitudes to others. People do not know the sources of many things that live in their emotions, inner responses and will impulses. Those who understand the processes of evolution do know, however, how impulses and emotions are produced. This was the case with a book published by such a society in the 18th century. Perhaps not the book itself, but the ideas on which it was based. The book shows the way in which Araman is involved in different animals. The Aramonic spirit was, of course, called the devil then, and it was shown how the devil principle comes to expression in different ways in individual animal species. The age of enlightenment was at its height in the 18th century, and of course enlightenment still flourishes today. Really clever people, many of them to be found as members of the press, managed to turn it into a joke and say, once again, excuse me, quote, once again some, uh, I'm putting a dot, dot, dot here, has written a book to say that animals are devils, close quote. Ah, but to spread ideas like these in such a way in the 18th century that they would take root in the minds of many people and in doing so take account of the true laws of human evolution, that really had an effect. For it was important that the idea that animals were devils should exist in many minds by the time Darwinism came along. And the idea would then arise in many 19th century minds that people had gradually evolved from animals. At the same time, large numbers of other people had the idea that animals were devils. A strange accord was thus produced. As this really happened, it was perfectly real. People write histories about all kinds of things, but the forces which are really at work are not to be found in them. We need to consider the following. Animals can only thrive if they have air, not in the vacuum to be found under the receiver of an air pump. In the same way, ideas and ideals can only thrive if human beings enter into the real atmosphere of a spiritual life. This means, however, that spiritual life must be encountered as a reality. Today, people like generalities better than most other things and they easily fail to notice that since 1879 Aramonic powers have been forced to descend from the spiritual world into the human realm. This is a fact. They had to penetrate human intellectuality, human thinking, responses, and perceptions. And we will not find the right attitude to those powers by simply using the abstract formula, quote, those powers must be fought. Close quote. Well, 
what are people doing to fight them? What they are doing is no different from asking the stove to be nice and warm, yet failing to put in wood and light the fire. The first thing we must know is that, seeing that these powers have come down to earth, we must live with them. They exist and we cannot close our eyes to them, for they will be more powerful than ever if we do this. This is indeed the point. The Aramonic powers which have taken hold of the human intellect become extremely powerful if we do not want to know them or learn about them. The ideal of many people is to study science and then apply the laws of science to the social sphere. They only want to consider anything which is, in quotes, real, meaning anything which can be perceived by the senses, and never give a thought to the things of the spirit. If this ideal were to be achieved by a large section of humanity, the Aramonic powers would have gained their purpose, for people would then not know they existed. A monistic religion similar to Haeckel's materialistic monism would be established and proved to be the perfect field for the work of these powers. It would suit them very well if people did not know they existed. They could then work in the subconscious. One way to help the Aramonic powers, therefore, is to establish an entirely naturalistic religion. If David Friedrich Strauss had fully achieved his ideal, which was to establish the narrow-minded religion which prompted Nietzsche to write an essay about him, the Aramonic powers would feel even more at ease today than they do already. This is only one way, however. The Aramonic powers will also thrive if people nurture the elements which they desire to spread among people today, prejudice, ignorance, and fear of the life of the Spirit. There is no better way of encouraging them. Just think how many people there are today who actually make it their business to foster prejudice, ignorance, and fear of the spiritual powers. As I said in yesterday's public lecture, the decrees against Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, and others were not lifted until 1835. This means that until then Catholics were forbidden to study anything relating to the Copernican view, and so on. Ignorance in this respect was actively promoted and gave an enormous boost to the Aramonic powers. This was a real service given to those powers, for it gave them the opportunity to make thorough preparations for the campaign that would start in 1841. A second statement should really follow the one I have just made, to render it complete. However, this second statement cannot yet be made public by anyone who is truly initiated into these things. But if you get a feeling of what lies behind the words I have spoken, you may perhaps gain an idea of what is implied. The scientific view is entirely aramonic. We do not fight it by refusing to know about it, however, but by being as conscious of it as possible and really getting to know it. You can do no better service for Araman than to ignore the scientific view or to fight it out of ignorance. Uninformed criticism of scientific views does not go against Araman, but helps him to spread illusion and confusion in the field which should really be shown in a clear light. People must gradually come to the realization that everything has two sides. Modern people are so clever, are they not? infinitely clever, and these clever modern people say the following. In the fourth post-Atlantean age, in the time of ancient Greece and Rome, people superstitiously believed that the future could be told from the way birds would be flying, from the entrails of animals and all kinds of other things. They were silly old fools, of course. The fact is that none of these scornful modern people actually know how the predictions were made, and everybody still talks just like the individual whom I gave as an example the other day, who had to admit that the prophecy given in a dream had come true, but went on to say, well, it was as chance would have it. Yet conditions were such in the fourth post-Atlantean age that there really was a science which considered the future. 
then people would not have been able to think that the kind of principles which are applied today would achieve anything in a developing social life. They could not have gained the great perspectives of a social nature, which went far beyond their own time, if they had not had a science, in quotes, as it were, of the future. Believe me, everything people achieve today in the field of social life and politics is actually still based on the fruits of that old science of the future. This, however, cannot be gained by observing the things that present themselves to the senses. It can never be gained by using the modern scientific approach. For anything we observe in the outside world with the senses makes a science of the past. Let me tell you a most important law of the universe. If you merely consider the world as it presents itself to the senses, which is the modern scientific approach, you observe past laws which are still continuing. You are really only observing the corpse of a past world. Science is looking at life that has died. Imagine this in our field of observation, and there's a figure shown in diagrammatic form. This is what we have before our eyes, our ears, and other senses. Imagine this. There's a yellow circle. To be all the scientific laws capable of being discovered. These laws do not relate to what is in there now, but to what has been there, what has been and gone and remains only in a hardened form. You need to find the things that are outside those laws, things which eyes cannot see and physical ears cannot hear. A second world with different laws, and there's a maw of a circle. This is present inside reality, but it points to the future. The situation with the world is just like the situation you get with a plant. The true plant is not the plant we see today. Something is mysteriously inside it which cannot yet be seen and will only be visible to the eyes in the following year, the primitive germ. It is present in the plant, but it is invisible. In the same way, the world which presents itself to our eyes holds the whole future in it, though this is not visible. It also holds the past, but this has withered and dried up and is now a corpse. Everything naturalists look at is merely the image of a corpse, of something past and gone. It is also true, of course, that this past aspect would be missing if we considered the spiritual aspect only. However, the invisible element must be included if we are to have the complete reality. How can it be that people, on the one hand, set up Laplace's theory and, on the other hand, talk about the end of the world in the way Professor Duar does? I spoke of this in yesterday's public lecture. He construes that when the world comes to an end, people will read their newspapers at several hundred degrees below zero in the light of luminous protein painted on the walls. Milk will be solid. I would love to know how people are going to milk such solid milk. Those are completely untenable ideas, as is the whole of Laplace's theory. All these theories come to nothing as soon as one goes beyond the field of immediate observation, and this is because they are theories of corpses, of things which are dead. Clever people will say today that the priests of ancient Greece and Rome were either scoundrels and swindlers, or that they were superstitious. For no one in their right mind can believe it is possible to discover anything about the future from the flight of birds and the entrails of animals. In time to come, people will be able to look down on the ideas of which people are so proud today. They will feel just as clever then as the present generation does now in looking down on the Roman priests conducting their sacrifices. Speaking of Laplace's theory and of Duar, they will say, those are strange superstitions. People in the past observed a few millennia in earth evolution and drew conclusions from this as to the initial and final states of the earth. How foolish those superstitions were! 
Imagine the way in which those peculiar superstitious people spoke of the sun and the planets separating out from the nebula and everything beginning to rotate. The things they will be saying about Laplace's theory and Dewar's ideas concerning the end of the world will be much worse than anything people are saying today about finding out about the future from sacrificial animals, the flight of birds, and so on. They are so high and mighty. These people who have entered fully into the spirits and attitudes of scientific thinking and looked down on the old myths and tales. Quote, Humanity was childish then, with people taking dreams seriously. Just think how far we have come since then. Today we know that everything is governed by a law of causality. We've certainly come a long way. Close quote. Everyone who thinks like this fails to realize one thing. The whole of modern science would not exist, especially where it has its justification, if people had not earlier thought in myths. You cannot have modern science unless it is preceded by myth. It has grown out of the myths of old, and you could no more have it today than you could have a plant with only stems, leaves, and flowers, and no root down below. People who talk of modern science as an absolute, complete in itself, might as well talk of a plant which is alive only in its upper part. Everything connected with modern science has grown from myth. Myth is its root. There are elemental spirits which observe these things from the other worlds and they howl with hell's own derision when today's mighty, clever professors look down on the mythologies of old and on all the media of ancient superstition, having not the least idea that they and all their cleverness have grown from those myths and that not a single justifiable idea they hold today would be tenable if it were not for those myths. Something else, too, causes those elemental spirits to howl with hell's own derision, and we can say hell's own, for it suits the Aramonic powers very well to have occasion for such derision. And this is to see scientists believe that they now have the theories of Copernicus, they have Galileo's ideas, they have this splendiferous law of the conservation of energy, and this will never change and will be the same for ever and ever, a short-sighted view. Myth relates to our ideas, just as the scientific ideas of the 19th and 20th centuries relate to what will be a few centuries later. They will be overcome just as myth has been overcome. Do you think people will think about the solar system in 2900 in the way people think about it today? It may be the academic's superstition but it should never be a superstition held among anthroposophists. The justifiable ideas people have today, ideas which do indeed have some degree of greatness in the present time, arose from the mythology which evolved in the time of ancient Greece. Of course, nothing could possibly delight modern people more than to think, ah, if only the ancient Greeks had been so fortunate as to have our modern science. But if the Greeks had had our modern science, then there would have been no knowledge of the Greek gods, no world of Homer, Sophocles, Aeschylus, Plato, or Aristotle. Dr. Faust's servant Wagner would be a veritable Dr. Faust himself compared to the Wagners we would have today. Human thinking would be dry as dust, empty and corrupt, for the vitality in our thinking has its roots in Greek and altogether fourth post-Atlantean mythology. Anyone who considers mythology to have been wrong and modern thinking to be right is like someone who cannot see the need for roses to grow on bushes, making it necessary for us to cut them if we want to have a bouquet. Why should they not come into existence entirely on their own? So you see, the people who consider themselves to be the most enlightened today are living with entirely unrealistic ideas. The ideas evolved in the fourth post-Atlantean age seem like dreams 
rather than clearly defined ideas to the people of our present age, yet that particular way of thinking has provided the basis for what we are today. The thoughts we are able to evolve today will in turn provide the basis for the next age. They can only do so, however, if they evolve not only in the one direction where they wither and dry up, but also in the direction of life. The breath of life comes into our thinking when we try and bring the things which exist to consciousness, and also when we perceive the element which gives us a wide-awake mind and makes us into people who are awake. Since 1879, the situation is like this. People go to school and acquire scientific attitudes and thinking, Their philosophy of life is then based on this scientific approach, and they believe only the things which can be perceived in the world around us to be real, whilst everything else is purely imaginary. When people think like this, and infinitely many people do so today, Araman has the upper hand in the game, and the Aramanic powers are doing well. Who are these Aramanic powers which have established their fortresses in human minds since 1879? They are certainly not human. They are angels, but they are backward angels, angels who are not following their proper course of evolution, and therefore no longer know how to perform their proper function in the spiritual world that is next to our own. If they still knew how to do it, they would not have been cast down in 1879. They now want to perform their function with the aid of human brains. They are one level lower in human brains than they should be. Monistic thinking, as it is called today, is not really done by humans. People often speak of the science of economics today, a science in which it was said at the time when the war started that it would be over in four months. I mentioned this again yesterday. When these things are said by scientists, it does not matter so much if people merely repeat them, they are the thoughts of angels who have made themselves at home in human heads. Yes, the human intellect is to be taken over more and more by such powers. They want to use it to bring their own lives to fruition. We cannot stand up to this by putting our heads in the sand like ostriches but only by consciously entering into the experience. We cannot deal with this by not knowing what monists think, for example, but only by knowing it. Excuse me, we we cannot deal with this by not knowing what monists think, for example, but only by knowing it. We must also know that it is Araman science, the science of backward angels who infest human heads. And we must know about the truth. And the reality. Of course, it can be said like this here, using the appropriate terms, Aramonic powers, because we take these things seriously. You know that you cannot speak like this to people outside, for they are totally unprepared. This is one of the barriers which divide us from others, but it is, of course, possible to find ways and means of speaking to them in such a way that the truth comes into what we say. If there were not a place where the truth can be said, this would also deprive us of the possibility of letting it enter into the profane science outside these walls. There must be at least some places where the truth can be presented in an honest, straightforward way. Yet we must never forget that even people who have made a connection with the science of the Spirit often have almost insuperable difficulties in building the bridge to the realm of Aramonic science. I have met a number of people who are extremely well informed in a particular field of Aramonic science, being good scientists, orientalists, etc., and had also made the connection with our spiritual research. I have gone to a great deal of trouble to encourage them to build bridges. Think of what could have been achieved if a physiologist or a biologist who had all the specialized knowledge which it is possible to gain in such fields today, had reconsidered physiology or biology in the light of the spirit, not exactly using our terminology, 
but considering those individual sciences in our spirit. I have tried it with Orientalists. You see, people may be good followers of Anthroposophy, and on the other hand they are Orientalists and work in the way Orientalists do. They are not prepared, however, to build the bridge from one to the other. This, however, is the urgent need in our time. For as I said, the Aramonic powers are doing well, yet people believe that science gives a true image of the world around us. If, on the other hand, we use spiritual science and the inner attitude which arises from it, the Aramonic powers do not do so well. This spiritual science takes hold of the whole human being. It makes you into another person. You come to feel differently, to have different will impulses, and to relate to the world in a different way. It is indeed true, and initiates have always said so, quote, when human beings are filled with spiritual wisdom, these are great horrors of darkness for the Aramonic powers and a consuming fire. It feels good to the Aramonic angels to dwell in heads filled with Aramonic science. But heads filled with spiritual wisdom are like a consuming fire and the horrors of darkness to them. Close quote. If we consider this in all seriousness, we can feel, filled with spiritual wisdom, we go through the world in a way which allows us to establish the right relationship with the Aramonic powers. Doing the things we do in the light of this, we build a place for the consuming fire of sacrifice for the salvation of the world, the place where the terror of darkness radiates out over the harmful aramonic element. Let those ideas and feelings enter into you. You will then be awake and see the things that go on in the world. The 18th century really saw the last remnants of the old atavistic science die. The adherence of St. Martin, the unknown philosopher, in quotes, who was a student of Jakob Böhme, had some of the old atavistic wisdom and also considerable foreknowledge of what then was to come, and in our day has come. In those circles it was often said, that from the last third of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, a kind of knowledge would radiate out, which had its roots in the same sources, the same soil, where certain human diseases have their roots. I spoke of this last Sunday, 14th of October. People's views would then be rooted in falsehood, and their inner feelings would come from selfishness. Let your eyes become seeing eyes in the light of the inner feelings of which we have spoken today, and let them see what is alive and active in the present time. It may well be that your hearts grow sore with some of the things you find. This does no harm, however, for clear perception, even if painful, will bear good fruit today, fruit which is needed if we are to get out of the chaos into which humanity has entered. The first thing, or one of the first things, will have to be a science of education, and one of the first principles to be applied in this field is one which is much sinned against today. More important than anything you can teach and consciously give to boys and girls or to young men and women are the things that enter unconsciously into their souls whilst they are being educated. In a recent public lecture, I spoke of the way in which our memory develops as though in the subconscious and parallel to our conscious inner life. This is something especially to be taken into account in education. Educators must provide the soul not only with what children understand, but also with ideas they do not yet understand, which enter mysteriously into their souls and this is important, are brought out again later in life. We are coming closer and closer to a time when people will need more and more memories of their youth throughout the whole of their lives, memories they like, memories which make them happy. Education must learn to provide systematically for this. It will be poison in the education of the future if later on in life people look back on the toil and trouble of their school days, on the years of education, and do not like to think back to those days. 
it will be poison if the years of education have not provided a source to which they can return again and again to learn new things. On the other hand, if one has learned everything there is to be learned on a subject, nothing will be left for later on. If you think on this, you will see that principles of great consequence will have to be the future guidelines for life, and this in a very different way from what is considered to be right today. It would be good for humanity if the hard lessons to be learned in the present time were not slept through by so many, and people would use them instead to become really familiar with the thought that a great many things will have to change. People will have to grow much Excuse me, people have grown much too complacent in recent times, and this prevents them from comprehending this thought in its full depth and, above all, also in its full intensity. The end of Lecture 10. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness. This is Lecture 11 entitled Recognizing the Inner Human Being, given in Dornoch on the 21st of October, 1917. The aim of these talks has been, and must continue to be, to show from all kinds of different aspects how people today and in the near future are moving into a period of civilization which will make special demands in different spheres of life. Speaking of processes, Deep down in the life of the spirit, I have sought to show what is happening today supersensibly, but all the same with powerful effect, especially in the present time, and which will influence the whole of human life, the whole of culture, and the whole social sphere. We have been able to gather from these considerations that human soul nature will essentially become more inward. When it is said that human soul nature will become more inward, we must not fail to realize that this growing inwardness will in many instances go hand in hand with people becoming more superficial in their intellect, for instance with regard to the sciences. This will be due to the circumstances we have already considered and others which are still to be considered. It really has to be taken into account that in reality Evolution is never as consistent as those who present the modern scientific theories of evolution would like it to be. Their ideas are not incorrect, yet ideas which are biased, even if correct, will often cause greater confusion than completely wrong ideas. They assume simple linear evolution from incomplete life forms all the way to the human being. This is not how it is, however, for in the evolution of humanity and also of the world outside the human being, a more outward stream is always complemented by an inner one. Thus we are able to say, if a particular stream continues for some time in the outside world, an inner stream will run parallel to it. And there's a drawing C figure, 11a, they say. This stream may be more material or materialistic on the outside, whilst inwardly it is more spiritual or spiritualistic. Then a more spiritualistic stream comes to the surface, and the materialistic or material stream goes down into the hidden depths of human nature. And then the situation is reversed again. The more spiritual line goes inward, and the material or materialistic one comes to the surface. In the time immediately ahead of us, Outer life will very much follow the course shown by the red line here, again in the diagram, where material events and material attitudes and considerations are concerned, and the depth of the human soul will be more spiritual. It may well be that people do not even want to know about this growing spiritual inwardness, but it will happen nevertheless. If you really dwell on this in your soul, you will be able to give due consideration to two aspects which will be extraordinarily important for the future. Remember, we said yesterday that in 1879, aramonic powers of a special kind 
descended from the heights of the spirit into the realm of human evolution, and specifically into the evolution of the human intellect and soul. These powers are here. They are living among us. They seek above all, to take possession of our heads, of anything we think and inwardly feel. They are angelic spirits, I said, who cannot continue their development in the spiritual world and want to use human heads to continue to develop in the immediate future. It is therefore particularly important that this line, again referring to the figure, of secret hidden soul development is given due attention. As I have told you, many people probably do not want to give it conscious attention. They would far rather it stayed down below, so they need only concern themselves with material things. If it is not given attention, those aramonic powers will take hold of this very process of growing inwardness. This is one thing we must take into account. We must be ready to face the danger soon to come in the evolution of civilization and stand guard in our most holy inner human reality against the influences of our harmonic powers. Educational issues will be particularly significant in the immediate future. The inwardness of the human soul will be most significant during childhood and youth in the near future. Perhaps it is difficult to believe this today. But the time has long since come for us to say, the children and young people we see do not show their true nature in what we see on the outside. We see the red line here, but beside it runs the blue one, a hidden inner life in which we must pay re- to which we must pay real attention. Teachers must pay attention to it, lest they surrender it to the harmonic powers. Education and training will have to change completely in many respects in the near future. Let us consider the origin of the principles in our present system of education and training. Certain things always lag behind in the cosmic order. In quotes, enlightenment, as it was called, was a special feature of the 18th century. People even wanted to establish a kind of rational religion based only on human reflection on the starveling among the sciences, as I have said in my public lectures in Basel. The way people feel they must behave toward growing children and young people in education and training has entirely come out of this stream of rationality. Always do everything in such a way that the child can immediately understand. Children should never experience anything deeper than they are able to understand. It will have to be realized that this is the worst possible way of providing for the life of a human being, for it takes us to a truly disastrous extreme in human life. Just consider this. If we make every effort to give children only such things as are in accord with their level of understanding, things they can grasp, we do not give them anything for later life when they are supposed to have deeper understanding. Care is taken, so to speak, to ensure that for the whole of their lives they have nothing but the understanding of a child. This approach has already borne fruit, and the fruits are what you would expect. Much of the thinking in our present-day civilized world, where people consider themselves to be so wise and enlightened, remains at a childish level. No one in the newspaper world is, of course, going to admit that the thinking in their world is largely childish, but it is true, nevertheless. Essentially, this is connected with the fact that only the child's understanding is addressed. This then remains the same throughout life. Something quite different will have to be done. We must fill our souls, especially if we are educators, with the inner awareness, the consciousness, that a mysterious inwardness reigns in a child, and we must present to the child's heart and mind much that will only be understood later on in life, not in childhood. Later in life, they can then recall these things from memory and say to themselves, this is something you heard or learned on that occasion. Now, at last, you are able to understand many of these things. 
Nothing will be better for the soundness of human life in the future than for individuals to recall things they were told in childhood and then be able to understand them. When people are able to live with themselves in such a way as to recall from memory the things they could not understand before, this will be the source for a healthy inner life. People will be spared the inner emptiness which enters into so many hearts and souls today and causes them to end up in institutions. There, souls which have remained empty and barren inside, because education has failed to give them anything that can be recalled later on in life, may be offered something from outside. Something else needs to be considered in this context. Because of the circumstances I have spoken of in recent times, people of our present age have lost awareness of the close connection between human beings and the universe. People today believe they are just hunks of meat walking on this earth or traveling in a railway carriage. They will not always admit this, of course, but this is, in fact, what they have in mind. It is not true, however. Human beings are closely bound up with the whole universe, and it is good to bring this clearly to mind again by considering the following. Consider the earth. The moon moves around it. Let us say this is the orbit of the moon. The earth is, of course, anything but the abstract mineral entity imagined by modern mineralogists, geologists, and physicists. It is very much alive. And we can observe many forms of existence in connection with the earth. For the moment, let us merely consider the currents which move around the earth all the time. They move around it in all kinds of directions. They are etheric and spiritual by nature and have a real substantial effect. Something is always present in these currents. It is good to consider the source and origin of these currents. We shall be going into more detail as time goes on. For today I merely want to make some preliminary statements. If you read my occult science, titled Occult Science, you will find that in very early times the earth and the sun were one. Our present-day earth has been eliminated from the sun. These currents are remnants from the life of the sun. Sun life is still present in the earth. Yet the moon too was one with the earth in the past, and the moon which orbits the earth today also has currents within it. Those currents are remnants from a later time, from moon evolution. We thus have two kinds of currents, and we may call them sun currents and moon currents. They take quite a different course, and they are a living reality. Let us assume a creature walking this earth in a certain way has sun currents passing through it. These pass through easily. Let us assume another creature is constructed in a different way so that the sun currents pass through it, coming from one side and moon currents from the other. Sun currents are not limited to specific places and actually pass through everything. They can therefore pass through this creature in one direction. Thus there can be currents, excuse me, thus there can be creatures on earth who have only the sun current passing through them in one direction, and there may be others who have the sun current pass through them in one direction and the moon current in another. Animals are creatures which can only have the sun current going through them. Imagine a four-legged creature, excuse me, animal. As it walks, its backbone is essentially parallel to the earth's surface. The sun current, which has now become an earth current, can continually pass through this backbone. This creature then is related to the earth. It is different with human beings. In the living human body, only the head has the position held by animals. Think of a line drawn from the back of the head to the forehead. It is the direction of the animal's backbone. And the same sun current passes through the head. The human backbone, on the other hand, is lifted out of the currents which run parallel to the earth, including the sun current which has become earth current, being lifted out, human beings are in a position, parenthesis, this does of course depend a great deal on the geographical latitude and so on, but it is also what makes people different from each other, close parenthesis, 
where under certain conditions the moon current goes through them, not through the head, however, but through the backbone. The difference between animals and humans is tremendous. The cosmic current which passes through the animal backbone passes through the human head. The old moon current, which does not relate to anything in the animal, passes through the human backbone. The human backbone even reflects its relationship to the moon current in its composition. For human beings have approximately as many vertebrae as there are days in a month, between 28 and 31 vertebrae. The reason why the figure is only approximate will be considered at a later time. The whole life of the human backbone, and indeed of the human breast, is intimately bound up with the life of the moon. Hidden beneath the life of the sun, which relates to sleeping and waking and takes twenty-four hours, lies the rhythmical life of the moon. This is a basic reflection on the relationship between the human being and the whole universe. For just as the currents passing through the human backbone are part of the current which relates to the life of the moon, so other currents in the human being relate to the other planets in our solar system. All these things are utterly real. In modern science they have been completely abandoned and no one even ventures to consider these relationships. In consequence, scientists are not able to appreciate that the conscious human life which is outwardly apparent here on earth goes hand in hand with an unconscious life which is connected with the human breast and arises from mysterious inner depths. This must be especially taken into account in times like those which lie ahead. It must be especially taken into account in the sphere of education, for otherwise the adversarial, aramonic powers will take hold of the unconscious life. It would be utterly disastrous if people were to fail to note that part of their inner life, the part which is in the process of becoming more inward, the blue line in the diagram, is in danger of falling prey to the aramonic powers, unless it is taken up in full consciousness and deepened through the insights of a spiritual science in which courage is taken actually to say something about realities which outer science is unable to discover. We must look at this in entirely concrete terms. Consider the way outer science is going. It is entering into all kinds of abstractions and indeed is most useful when it enters into all kinds of abstractions. People will need this science for their outer life. It must become part of human civilization. To use the outer scientific culture, such as it is now, in education will be particularly detrimental in the immediate future. To teach children abstract notions of nature and the laws of nature which people need to know will become an absurdity in the near future. On the other hand, it will be important, I can always only give examples, to consider the lives of animals in a loving way, with their special conditions of life described to give the children a real picture of how ants behave in their communities, how they live together, and so on. As you know, the beginnings of this are to be found in Brehm's title Tierleben, though they are not fully developed. Such symbolized stories of life in the animal world need to be more and more fully developed. Individual stories should be told in a truly thoughtful way, rather than dishing up elementary zoology to children in the dreadful way it is done now. We must tell them of the special things the lion does, and the fox, the ant, the lady bird, and so on. It is of no real consequence if the details which are told actually happen or not. What matters is that they are thoughtful and come from the heart. The kind of extract of natural history which is dinned into children today should only come in later years. Children must first of all be able to take delight in stories which represent individual aspects in the lives of animals. It will be particularly important to consider plant life in such a way that one has many stories to tell about the relationship of the rose to the violet, 
of shrubs to the weeds which grow around them, and long stories about the spirits leaping above the flowers as one walks through a meadow and the like. This is the botany children should be told. And they should be told of how certain green-colored crystals which dwell in the earth behave toward colorless crystals, or a cubic crystal to an octahedral one. Instead of the abstract crystallography which is dished out to children who are still quite young, much to their detriment, we should have a symbolistic presentation of the life of the crystals down in the earth. Our views on everything which goes on in the depths of the earth can only be fruitful if we make them fruitful with the descriptions which are given in our anthroposophical literature. It will not be enough just to list items. These things must be the stimulus and give us ideas so that we can tell many stories about the life shared by diamonds and sapphires and so on. Think about it and you will know what I mean. In a similar way, it will be important not to dish up those horrible abstractions which are taught as history today, but again to bring life and liveliness into the course of human history and help the children to develop a feeling for what human hearts and minds experience in the course of human evolution. Conversations which did not actually take place in the physical world will have to be invented. A conversation between an ancient Greek and someone living in the fifth post-Atlantean age, for example. To let those living human figures appear before the mind's eye, EYE, of the children will be much more useful than all the historical abstractions presented to them today. You can see where this is leading. The point is to fill the souls of children with living ideas so that the mysterious hidden undercurrent in them can be reached. Then you will see an inner life which is less arid and infertile and people who will be less nervous later in life because they will be able to recall stories which were told out of an insight into cosmic laws. They will also be familiar with the laws of nature and able to establish harmony between what was given to them in a living vital form and the laws of nature. Their minds can only grow barren if they are given the abstract laws of nature. These are a few thoughts I wanted to put to you with special reference to the field of education. It is, of course, much easier to get together in all kinds of associations today and proclaim over and over again, quote, education must be put on an individual basis, close quote, and, and other abstract formulations of this kind. Of course, this is easier than to do what is now needed, which is that people interested in education should enter into the spirit of human and natural evolution and find imaginative tales which allow the life of the spirit to be concretely grasped in exactly the form it will take in the immediate future. We will always and in every field need the stimulus of spiritual science. It alone will be able to let new life arise from the dying forms of the present life of mind and intellect. New life which can act as a stimulant in the way I have described, especially for the minds of children. Without the stimulus of spiritual science, one will be a dried up school teacher who has who also dries up the children's minds. Worst of all, people will increasingly have the idea, especially with regard to educating the young, that the best we can do with everything we learn is to forget it again as quickly as possible. If a situation is created where in later life people do not want to miss any of the things they were given in their childhood, this will not merely be a pleasure but prove a wellspring, a true wellspring of human life. I would ask you to take this to heart. Science itself also needs new stimulus. Yesterday I spoke of how difficult it is to bridge the gap between spiritual science in general and the special fields in which people are engaged in scientific life. Yet this will be absolutely one of the most essential things in future. You must have realized from some of the things said here and elsewhere that paucity and impoverishment of concepts and ideas have led to the conditions we have today. I have said 
it in my public lecture in Basel, and I have also repeated it here, that people who considered themselves competent believed when this war was started that it would last no longer than four months. They thought they had studied the social and economic structure, and they formed the idea on that basis. Their ideas of this kind did not relate to reality, and reality has proved them wrong. It is strange how little people are prepared to learn from events. Someone who had arrived at such an idea on the basis of their own scientific understanding surely ought to say to himself now, quote, The premises on which I based my conclusions were clearly quite inadequate. Close quote. Surely he must now be inclined to learn something. But he sleeps on drawing further conclusions from those same premises, which have only changed a little under the pressure of experience, because he does not want to consider the inner connections. Of course, anyone who wishes to consider the inner connections in life will have to take this hurdle, which is such a problem, particularly to people who are involved in scientific issues. The last thing they want is to be bothered in the limited field in which they are active. They do not want to establish links with related fields. This type of specialization was quite a good thing for a time. If it continues, and if our university students continue to be ruined by the bias which comes with specialization, the calamities which result when people's ideas are divorced from reality will get worse and worse. We will have people in municipal, rural and national representative bodies who simply have no real grasp of the issues that are supposed to regulate according to law law, because their ideas are too limited to encompass reality. Reality is far richer than those ideas. There can be no question, then, of being inclined to leave specialized areas as far as possible to experts, nor of using anthroposophy to satisfy subjective and egotistical needs. It has to be a matter of knowing how to unite these two opposites and let one prove fruitful for the other. Something we find again and again, you will also find it so if you were to focus your attention on these things, is that if you speak about special subject areas to people who are sincerely devoted to anthroposophy, they do find the matter rather tedious. The request is always to speak about central issues, soul, immortality, God, and so on. This will, of course, satisfy their immediate egotistical religious needs, but it leaves no opportunity to give them what is needed more than anything for the near future, namely that people make themselves a real part of this real life. This is why we must take note when someone seeks to make a real connection between impulses to look at things on the basis of spiritual science and the specialist areas. I have previously drawn attention here to the important book our friend Dr. Boos has written on the collective agreement. The book is now generally available, and I should like to draw your attention to it, for it is a perfect example of building bridges between the general approach used in anthroposophy and a whole specialist field, the sphere of law. The point is that our friends will not, I hope, consider special investigations of this kind as something outside their sphere, but rather give them their attention. For in the time which lies ahead, life itself will have to be the subject for anthroposophical consideration. If you read the book carefully and work through it, you will find aspects of everyday life are taken up in a living way, and also in such a way that one can see two things coming into play here. First, impulses to consider life in a truly comprehensive way, impulses altogether attuned to cosmic laws, and then also great historical perspectives. You will also find it infinitely helpful to consider the difference between romance contracts and agreements on the one hand and Germanic social cohesion on the other. The relationship of romance to Germanic human nature presents itself in a very profound way in a particular specialist field.
and it is important, especially with this specialist book by Dr. Roman Bus, to work one's way up to what really matters for the immediate future from the point of view of spiritual science, to bridge the gap between the life that presents itself to the senses and in which we establish our social conditions and the life which streams in from the spiritual world and lets the spirit pulse through our forms of existence. I also recommend that you read the new issue of titled Wissen und Leben, which has an article by Dr. Bus on the key issues in Swiss national policies. You will find that current political issues can also be considered from a different point of view than that of everyday journalism, if you do not mind my saying so. Awareness of the relationship between different forms of culture, such as different forms of art, for instance, and political forms, is brought out most beautifully in this essay. Having read Dr. Boos's article, which takes a serious look at Swiss national policies, and is truly in the anthroposophical spirit, you may glance at the first essay in the journal, which is on the significance of the Reformation and was written by Adolf Keller. It is an essay in the old style, even if it is thought to be in a very new style. In one and the same issue, you therefore have a justifiably, truly modern work, side by side with the most antiquated stuff. People who write such antiquated stuff do, of course, believe they are particularly clever and logical, with penetrating thoughts. The significance of the Reformation is discussed from different points of view in elevated terms, which are nothing but empty and vapid abstractions. Having read Adolf Keller's article, which is decent and well-meant and one of the best pieces of work in this field, one is tired out from being tossed hither and thither between what are again and again the same abstractions. The Reformation created freedom of initiative. Freedom of initiative arose through the Reformation. When the Reformation was in progress, free initiative came to life. One is tossed hither and thither in the typical fashion of all abstractionists, who know no better than to wallow in a few impoverished notions, having nothing to do with the real world. Here you have a typical instance of the abstract way of thinking which must be overcome. When people live with notions that have little real thought to them, yet are positively smacking their lips with pleasure because they imagine they are saying something really outstanding when they put it in a particularly abstract way. A few days ago I was sent a treatise on profound theosophical matters, which was in fact merely a treatise on the, in quotes, something, It only dealt with the, in quotes, something, the, quote, unimproved something, close quote, and the, quote, improved something, quote, uh, close quote, and how the improved takes hold of the unimproved, and how the improved something takes precedence over the unimproved something. And so, conscious and unconscious something, improved and unimproved something, going one way and then another, here again, there again, And in the final instance, you have no more than this strange modern way of working in the abstract, though here applied to things of the spirit, which likes to see itself in the abstract and in reality is flight from reality and no longer has anything to do with any kind of reality. This does, of course, have quite specific consequences. People's limited ideas make them unable to wend their way through the river of life. Their ideas are too limited to encompass the reality of life. As a result, one reads things like the following, for instance, which is on page 51 of Adolf Keller's essay, quote, Yet although this experience causes the deepest wellsprings of heart and mind to open up, it is still more than a mere upsurge of feeling. Divine and human elements are not mixed together in this. Conscience takes care this does not happen. It keeps the distance and maintains reverence. Man remains man and God remains God. The Reformation and mysticism have it in common with the relationship to God that the relationship to God is established through a personal experience. What separates them is that the Reformation experience does not come in a seething and boiling of emotions in the depths of the soul, as in the case of mysticism, but from a troubled and morally elevated conscience. Anything which is a must 
an absolute demand, holds the greatest power in the inner life. Man can only withstand this with divine help that is inwardly experienced. Close quote. Nothing but abstractions, and we are pushed hither and thither among them. Then follow the words, quote, This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Close quote. The gentleman has gone so far in his abstract thinking that he identifies the message of Jesus Christ with Jesus Christ himself. This is what one gets when abstraction is taken to its extreme. What follows is strange indeed. He has rejected mysticism. With his limited ideas, he says that the Reformation has nothing to do with mysticism, but that it creates healthy life. As if mysticism were not exactly such a living experience. But you see, his limited ideas cannot encompass reality. They are therefore used to say exactly the same about completely opposite things. Thus he rejects the, quote, seething and boiling, close quote, as something which true adherents of the Reformation should not have, for if they did, they would be mystics. Adolf Keller goes on to say, quote, this help is not merely presented outwardly, historically, or in the sacraments. It, too, can only grow strong if it is inwardly made one's own. It does not act from outside, magically, but only in so far as it may become part of our inner feelings and will and can set the soul aglow. Close quote. Thus the Reformation must not be a seething and boiling in the depths of the soul. Yet this same Reformation can only be active in the soul if it is able to set the soul aglow, that is, make it seethe and boil. You can study the whole essay like this, and nowhere does its poverty of spirit prove adequate for entering into reality. Yet writings like these are read with real passion today. People consider them most erudite. They fail to realize that they only have to read two or three lines more and they get all confused in their minds. For the same ideas have to be used for quite different things, and there is such a paucity of ideas. If, on the other hand, you study Roman Bus's beautiful essay on the key issues in Swiss national policies, I do recommend it, for it will show you how connections can be made between political life and other forms of culture, and how our ideas can really come alive and the life of ideas be enriched. How you can find an exemplary study here concerning the future of Swiss politics. You can compare this with the vapid maunderings of Adolf Keller's essay in the same issue of the journal. By spending just a single small sum, you can have the opportunity of getting old and new absolutely side by side and really see for yourselves. Sometimes I really have to take account of current issues which are in complete opposition for anthroposophy does not exist for self-indulgence at exalted levels, but to make exactly the observations which take us truly into the present, into the intents and purposes of the present time. The end of Lecture 11 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness. This is Lecture 12 entitled The Spirits of Light and the Spirits of Darkness, given in Dornach on the 26th of October, 1917. The event I have been referring to in the preceding lectures, the occasion when certain spirits of darkness were cast out of the spiritual realm and down into the human realm in the autumn of 1879, holds great importance. We have to reflect again and again what it really means to say that a battle raged for decades in the spiritual realms. The battle started in the early 1840s and ended when certain spiritual entities, which had been acting like rebels in the spiritual world during those decades, were vanquished in the autumn of 1879 and cast down as dark spirits into the realm of human evolution. They are now among us, and the effect of this is that they send their impulses into our view of the world, not only into the way we think about the world, but also into our inner feelings, our will impulses, and even our temperaments. 
human beings will be unable to get even a partial understanding of the significant events of the present time and the immediate future unless they are prepared to recognize the relationship which exists between the physical world and the spiritual world and take as much account of important events like this as they do of natural phenomena. At the present time, people generally give validity only to natural phenomena, phenomena of the physical world which are part of historical evolution. They will have to give validity again to spiritual events which can be perceived with the aid of spiritual science, for only then can the events in which human beings are caught up be really understood. With reference to this important event, it is quite easy to establish how seriously people are in error if they base themselves only on concepts and definitions when considering the world and not on direct observation of reality. One always has the feeling one ought to base oneself on defined concepts. What is Araman? What is Lucifer? What are the particular spirits in one hierarchy or another? Those are the questions we ask. And we believe that having got the definitions, we have also understood something about the way these entities work. An extreme example of the inadequacy of definitions is the following, which I have quoted before. It may not have been the ideal way of defining the human being, but it is the definition which was given in a school in Greece. The human being is a creature who walks on two legs and does not have feathers. The next time the pupil came to school, he brought a plucked cockerel, a creature who walked on two legs and had no feathers. This is a human being, he said, according to the definition. Many definitions of this kind are generally accepted. And many of our scientific definitions are, therefore, more or less in accord with the truth. We must not base ourselves on such definitions in anthroposophy, however. Perception will be poor if we base ourselves on abstract definitions. Yes, it is possible to define the term spirits of darkness, but this will not get us far. Spirits of darkness were cast down from heaven to earth in 1879. This may give a general idea of the spirits of darkness, but it does not get us far in understanding the real issue. The spirits of darkness now walking among us are of the same kind as the spirits of darkness which had been cast down from the spiritual world, that is, from heaven to earth, in earlier times. They had specific tasks to perform during the whole of the Atlantean age and right into Greco-Latin times. Let us try to use the different insights we have gained and determine the task those spirits of darkness had to perform through millennia, through the whole Atlantean age and on into Greco-Latin times. It has to be kept in mind that the great scheme of things will only work if higher spiritual entities who have the task of guiding human evolution make use of such spirits, putting them in the right place, as it were, to enable them to do what is necessary. As you will remember, the, quote, Luciferic temptation, close quote, of old, held major significance for human evolution. It did, of course, arise from Lucifer's specific aims, and from Atlantean times onward, Lucifer was in league with Araman. These spirits gave rise to counter-aims of, let us call them, good spirits, the spirits of light. Fundamentally speaking, the spirits of darkness also wanted to the best for humanity in those early times. They wanted human beings to have the capacity for absolute freedom. But humanity was not ready for this at that time, at the time. They wanted to provide humanity with impulses which would make every human being an independent individual. It was not to be, however, for humanity was not yet ready. A counterforce had to be set up by the spirits of light. This was done by taking human beings from the heights of the spirit and putting them onto the earth, which is symbolically described in the expulsion from paradise. 
In reality, human beings were being placed in the stream of hereditary traits. Lucifer and the Aramonic powers wanted every human being to be an ind- independent individual. This would have meant that people would have become spiritual very rapidly while still immature, but it was not to happen. Human beings were to be educated on earth, brought to full development through the forces of the earth. This was achieved by placing them in the stream of heredity, where they would physically descend from others. In this way they were not independent, but inherited certain traits from their forebears. They were weighed down with earthly qualities, which Lucifer did not want them to have. Anything to do with physical heredity was given to humanity by the spirits of light to counterbalance the Luciferic stream. A weight was attached to human beings, as it were, and this connected them with the earth. In everything connected with heredity, with the begetting of children, procreation, with love in the earthly sense, we must therefore see ourselves connected with the entities which are under the leadership of Yahweh or Jehovah. This is the reason why we find so many symbols of procreation and earthly heredity in the ancient religions. The laws of Judaism, which was to prepare the way for Christianity, as well as those of pagan religions, clearly show the importance attached to regulating everything to do with the laws of heredity here on earth. People had to learn to live together in tribes, nations, and races, with blood relationship as the signature for the way affairs were ordered on earth. This had been in preparation during the Atlantean Age and was to be repeated in the fourth epoch of civilization, the Greco-Latin Epoch, mainly on account of the measures taken in the third Egypto-Chaldean epoch. We can see that specifically during epochs which were to recapitulate the Lemurian and Atlantean ages, account was taken of race, nation and tribal connections in all the ways in which human affairs were ordered. In short, account was taken of hereditary traits arising from blood bonds. The priests of the ancient mysteries were mainly responsible for the ordering of affairs. Today we would say for affairs of state. And they took care to observe the way in which customs, inclinations and habits had to develop in various places to take account of blood relationships, of people belonging to a particular nation or tribe. Their laws were based on this. We shall not be able to understand what issued from the mysteries of the third and fourth post-Atlantean ages unless we consider the careful study of racial, national and tribal relationships on which the priests based the laws they made for different regions of the earth. What really counted in each individual region was to establish order in the blood relationships. In those times when the spirits of light made it their concern to order human affairs on the basis of blood relationships, the spirits of darkness, which had been cast down from heaven to earth with humanity, made it their concern to work against anything connected with heredity through blood relationship. They were the source of all rebellion against ordinances based on blood relationship in those ages and of all teachings of rebellion against heredity and against tribal and racial relationships, insisting on the independence of the individual and seeking to establish laws based on this, laws which did, of course, come from human beings, but were inspired by the spirits of darkness. Those ages extended as far as the 15th century. Echoes still persist, of course, for systems do not come to an abrupt end when there is a major break in evolution. Let me check that again. Up to the 15th century in particular, we see teachings come up which rebel against purely natural bonds, against the bonds of relationship, family, nationality, and so on. Thus, we have two streams, the protector of everything to do with blood relationship which is the stream of light. It is opposed by the stream of darkness as the protector of everything 
which wants to abandon the bonds of blood relationship and help people to be free of the bonds of family and heredity. All this does not, of course, come to an abrupt halt any more than it does in the natural world. And in 1413, the year when the break occurred which marks the boundary between the 4th and 5th post-Atlantean ages, the old ways did not stop immediately. We can see the influence of the two streams continuing right into our own time. For from the 19th century onward, from the time of the significant events I have described to you, we see something entirely different emerge. I have already made some mention of this. Angelic spirits, members of the hierarchy of the angels, have been active among us since 1879. They follow on after the old spirits of darkness, are related to these, and are of a similar kind, but have only been cast down from heaven to earth because of the event which occurred in 1879. Until then, they had their function up above, whilst their relatives, who acted in the way I have just described, have been among human beings from Lemurian and Atlantean times. Thus, there was a break in evolution in about 747 before the mystery of Golgotha. Another one came in 1413 after the mystery of Golgotha and the break which is particularly important to us in 1879. Throughout the whole of this time, spirits of darkness were active on earth, whilst certain other spirits of darkness, which are related to those down on earth, were still in the spiritual world. 1841 saw the beginning of the mighty battle of which I have spoken. Then the spirits which are related to those others descended to join them below. The power of the old rebels, of the continuing stream of spirits of darkness who had their tasks to perform from the Mourian and Atlantean times, is gradually dying down as the powers of their brothers begin to take effect. This means that from the last third of the 19th century, the situation has been completely reversed. The spirits of light who have been continuing in their activities have done enough where the establishment of blood, tribal, racial and similar bonds is concerned, for everything has its time in evolution. In the general and rightful scheme of things, enough has been done to establish what needed to be established through blood bonds in humanity. In more recent times, therefore, the spirits of light have changed their function. They now inspire human beings to develop independent ideas, feelings and impulses for freedom. They now make it their concern to establish the basis on which people can be independent individuals. And it is gradually becoming the task of the spirits who are related to the old spirits of darkness to work within the blood bonds. The function which was right in the past, or better said, belonged to the sphere of the good spirits of light, was handed over to the spirits of darkness during the last third of the 19th century. From this time onward, the old impulses based on racial, tribal and national relationships, on the blood, became the domain of the spirits of darkness, who had previously been rebels in the cause of independence. They then began to instill ideas in human minds that affairs should be ordered on the basis of tribal relationships, of blood bonds. You can see that definition is impossible. If you define the spirits of darkness on the basis of the function they had in the past, you get exactly the opposite of their function in more recent times that is, from the last third of the 19th century. In the past, it was the function of the spirits of darkness to work against hereditary traits in humanity. From the last third of the 19th century, they have been lagging behind, wanting to lag behind, wanting over and over again to make people aware of their tribal, blood, and hereditary bonds, and to insist on these. These things simply are the truth, though it is a truth which people today find extremely unpalatable. For millennia, human beings have instilled the insistence on blood bonds into themselves 
and out of sheer inertia they are letting the spirits of darkness take control of these habitual ideas. We, therefore, see insistence on tribal, national and racial relationships, particularly in the 19th century. And this insistence is considered idealistic, when in reality it is an early sign of decline in humanity. Everything based on dominance of the blood principle meant progress for as long as it was under the authority of the spirits of light. Under the authority of the spirits of darkness, it is a sign of decline. The spirits of darkness made special efforts in the past to implant a rebellious feeling of independence in human beings at the time when hereditary traits were passed on in a positive sense by the progressive spirits. In the three ages of human evolution, which now follow and will continue until the time of the great catastrophe, the spirits of darkness will make extreme efforts to preserve the old hereditary characteristics and inculcate human beings with the attitudes which result from such preservation. In this way, they introduce the necessary signs of decline into human evolution. Here is another point where we have to be watchful. In particular, it is not possible to understand the present time unless one knows the change of function which came in the last third of the 19th century. A 14th century person who spoke of the ideals of race and nation would have been speaking in terms of the progressive tendencies of human evolution. Someone who speaks of the ideal of race and nation and of tribal membership today is speaking of impulses which are part of the decline of humanity. If anyone now considers them to be progressive ideals to present to humanity, this is an untruth. Nothing is more designed to take humanity into its decline than the propagation of ideals of race, nation, and blood. Nothing is more likely to prevent human progress than proclamations of national ideals belonging to earlier centuries, which continue to be preserved by the Luciferic and Aramonic powers. The true ideal must arise from what we find in the world of the spirit, not in the blood. The Christ who is to appear in a specific form in the course of the twentieth century will know nothing of the ideals proclaimed by people today. In earlier times, Michael, the spirit from the hierarchy of archangels, was the representative of Yahweh. Thanks to the functions given to him in 1879, he will be the earthly representative, the vicar of the Christ, of the Christ impulse, to create spiritual bonds between human beings, which will take the place of the purely physical blood bonds. For only the bonds of spiritual communion will bring a progressive element into the entirely natural element of decline. Please note, the element of decline is natural. Human beings cannot remain children as they get older, and their bodies then follow a downward curve of development. In the same way, the whole of humanity has entered into a downward trend of development. We have passed the fourth post-Atlantean age and are now in the fifth. This, together with the sixth and seventh, will be old age in the present stage of world evolution. To think that old ideals can live on is no more intelligent than to think people should continue to learn their letters throughout the whole of their lives just because it is good for children to learn their letters. It would be equally unintelligent for people in the future to speak of a social structure for the whole world based on the blood bonds of nations. It is Wilsonianism, of course, but also Aramanism of the spirits of darkness. It is no doubt far from easy to accept the truth of this. It is easier today to share in the phraseologies in common use all over the world. Reality takes no account of phrases. It follows the true impulses. We shall not be able to change the labels on things which no longer hold true for the fifth, sixth, and seventh periods, even if they are still being poured into Wilsonian world programs in a form which still has power to convince a humanity that likes to take the easy way. There are still enough people 
even today, who simply do not want to get to the point where they are prepared to accept such universal human truths, which are independent of all blood bonds. These are the universal human truths because they have not come from the earth, but have been brought down from the spiritual worlds. How terrible is the reaction already occurring as almost the whole world is resisting the true progress of humanity. And the phrase, quote, freedom of nations, close quote, is used for something which goes against the stream of evolution. It has always been the destiny of mystery truths that they have had to go against the stream of comfortable ease and with the stream of evolution. And we shall have to see if there will not be at least a small group of people, free of all blood prejudices, who are able to recognize the phraseology that grows round the world today, phrases signifying that something which in spiritual terms presents itself as the event of November 1879 is now coming to the surface with might and main. The events of the present time have been foreseen by the initiates of all nations. They were foreseen and forecast. And it was said that a highly reactionary mood would bubble up from the blood and people would believe it to be highly idealistic. We must be able to observe on the large scale, as in small things. We must not allow ourselves to be deflected by the opinions and phrases one hears in the world today. We have to be able to rise a little above ourselves to understand the signs of the times. Yes, You may choose the other road and continue in your blood prejudices. You will then join the streams which lead downward. These are coming. You need to know how to be watchful where they are concerned and oppose them with elements which follow the upward trend. The downward trend comes of its own accord. We must have a feeling for life on the upward and life on the downward trend. Do not fall prey to the foolish inclination to escape from the downward trend, saying, quote, I will have nothing to do with Lucifer, nor with Araman. I have often censured this foolish inclination, for we must certainly take account of the spirits which serve the great cosmic scheme of things. Our failure to do so, assuming an attitude where they remain outside our conscious awareness, make them all the more powerful. We shall only be able to judge human affairs if we are able to take a broader view of the impulses of life in the ascendant and also in the descendant. It is important, however, to keep clear of sympathies and antipathies. Two streams have arisen in modern science. One of these I have called Gertianism, the other Darwinism. If you study everything I have written from the very beginning, you will see that I have never failed to recognize the profound significance of Darwinism. Some people were foolish enough to think I had fallen under the spell of materialism and so on when I wrote anything in favor of Darwin. We know, of course, that this was not from conviction, but had quite different reasons. And the people who say such things only need to think about it and they will know better than anyone else that they are not true. But if you really study everything I have written, you will see that I have always done justice to Darwinism, but have done so by contrasting it with Gertianism, the view of the evolution of life. I have always sought to see such things as the theory of descent in the Darwinian sense on the one hand and the Gertian on the other, as I have done so because Gertianism presents the ascending line with organic evolution raised above mere physical existence. I have often referred to the conversation between Goethe and Schiller. Goethe drew a diagram of his archetypal plant and Schiller said, That is not empiricism, learning from experience. It is an idea. Goethe's reply was, In that case I have my idea in front of my eyes. For he saw the spiritual element in everything. Goethe thus initiated a theory of evolution which holds the potential for elevation to the highest spheres, for being applied to soul and spirit. Goethe may only have made a start with organic evolution in his theory of metamorphosis, but we have the evolution of the spirit 
to which humanity must attain from this fifth post-Atlantean age onward, for human beings are becoming more inward, as I have shown. Goetheanism can have a great future, for the whole of anthroposophy is on these lines. Darwinism considers physical evolution from the physical side. External impulses, struggle for survival, selection, and so on, and in this way outlines an evolution which is dying down. Everything you can discover about organic life if you give yourself up to impulses which came up in earlier times. To understand Darwin, one merely has to make a synthesis of all the laws discovered in the past. To understand Goethe, one has to rise above this to laws which are ever new in earth existence. Both are necessary. It is not Darwinism which is the problem, nor Goetheanism, but the fact that people want to follow one or the other rather than one and the other. This is what really matters. In future, human beings, the older they get, will need to take in spiritual impulses if they want to be able to grow younger and younger and really develop their inner life. If they do so, they may have gray hair and wrinkles and all kinds of infirmities, but they will get younger and younger, for their souls are taking in impulses which they will take with them through the gate of death. People who relate only to the body cannot grow younger for their souls will share in everything the body experiences. Of course, it will not be possible to change the habit of going gray, but it is possible for a gray head to gain a young soul from the wellsprings of spiritual life. This is how human evolution will proceed in the 5th, 6th, and 7th post-Atlantean ages in terms of Darwin's gray-haired theory, if you will forgive the expression. But in order to go through the catastrophe, which is comparable to the earth's death, the catastrophe lying ahead, people must gain the power of youth, which lies in Goetheanism, in the theory of metamorphosis and of spiritual evolution. This has to be taken through the future catastrophe, just as in the case of the individual, the rejuvenated soul is taken through the gate of death. Humanity was able to unite with the earth because when it came down from heaven to earth, if we may put it like this, the spirits of darkness which came down with it laid an adequate foundation for human independence during the time when the laws of heredity, nationality and race prevailed. What Lucifer and Araman had done became a good thing in so far as humanity was enabled to unite with the earth. To show this in diagrammatic form, we may put it like this. Before Lucifer took action, humanity was united with the whole cosmos, including the earth. Human beings united with the earth because hereditary traits, original sin in biblical terms, hereditary traits in scientific terminology, were implanted into them. This made human beings, I am using crosses to indicate them, there's a diagram, part of the earth. You see, therefore, that Lucifer and Armon are servants of the progressive powers. Evolution then continued. We are now at the time when human beings live on earth and are united with it. Luciferic and Armonic spirits, spirits of darkness, have been cast down from heaven to earth. Because of this, human beings must be released from the earth, torn away from it, with part of their essential nature taken back into the spiritual world. Humanity must develop awareness of not being of this earth, and this must grow stronger and stronger. In future, human beings must walk on this earth who say to themselves, quote, Yes, at birth I enter into a physical body, but this is a transitional stage. I really remain in the spiritual world. I am conscious that only part of my essential nature is united with the earth, and that I do not leave the world where I am between death and rebirth with the whole of my essential nature. Close quote. A feeling of belonging to the spiritual world must develop in us. In earlier years, this merely cast a false shadow insofar as people did not want to understand physical life and practiced a false asceticism, believing this to consist in mortifying the physical body in all kinds of ways. 
It has to be understood that it is not through false asceticism, but by uniting themselves with things of the Spirit, with the essence of things, that people will be able to perceive themselves as not merely earthly creatures, but belonging to the whole cosmos. Gaining knowledge of the physical world has merely been a preparation for this. Just think how dependent people were on the soil where they had grown, as it were, right into the 15th century, the end of the Greco-Latin epoch, and how much their development depended on the soil. This was good, but it was not but it must not dominate our lives now. Physical science has torn human beings away from the earth in the physical sense with Copernicanism, and soul awareness must also be torn away from the earth. The earth has become a small body in space, but initially this is only in terms of space. Through Copernicanism, human beings were shifted out into the cosmos, as it were, though in entirely abstract terms. This must continue, but it should not be applied to physical life in the wrong way. The physical will take its own course. Take America, for instance, though not the population native to its soil for centuries. As you know, a new population, consisting entirely of Europeans, has arrived there in recent times. Careful observation shows that physical life continues to be bound to the soil. The Americans who are Europeans transplanted to America are gradually acquiring traits which recall the old Indian population. This has not yet progressed very far, but it is true nevertheless. The arms are a different length from what they were in Europe because these people have been transplanted to America. The physical human being does adapt to the soil. It even goes so far that there is now a considerable difference in physical form between Americans who live in the West and those who live in the East. This is adaptation to the soil. If the soul were to go along with this physical process, the American Indian culture would be revived in time, though in a European form. This sounds paradoxical, but it is true. In future, humanity cannot be bound to the soil. soil. The soul has to become independent. All over the world, people may then assume the physical characteristics given by the soil, and the bodies of Europeans may become Indianized when they go to America. But in their souls, human beings will tear themselves away from the physical and earthly element and be citizens of the worlds of the spirit. And in those worlds, there are no races or nations, but relationships of a different kind. These things must be understood today when great, tremendous events happen in the world, unless you are going to be mulish, excuse the expression, and present old, established prejudices as new ideals. The end of Lecture 12. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness. This is Lecture 13 entitled The Fallen Spirit's Influence in the World, given in Dornach on the 27th of October, 1917. We are going to continue on the same theme, as this will provide a background for the evaluation of the significant events which now present themselves to the human mind, events in which humanity is now caught up and which are more significant than is often realized today. I have sought to show that momentous occurrences in the spiritual world form the background to these events. I have also spoken of the profoundly significant battle which took place in the spiritual regions of the world between the early 1840s and the autumn of 1879. This was one of the battles which occur repeatedly in world and human evolution and are customarily represented by the image of Michael or St. George fighting the dragon. Michael won one such victory over the dragon on behalf of the spiritual worlds in 1879. At that time, the spirits of darkness who worked against the Michaelic impulses were cast down from the spiritual realm into the human realms. As I said, from that time onward, they have been active in the feeling, will, and mind impulses of human beings. 
Present-day events can, therefore, only be understood if one turns the inner eye, E-Y-E, to the spiritual powers which are now moving among us. Inevitably, the question must arise as to the actual nature of the battle which raged in the spiritual regions between the 1840s and the 1870s and of the activity of the spirits of darkness since November 1879. The story of what was behind this significant battle, or we might say behind the scenes of world history, can only unfold slowly and gradually. Today we shall, first of all, consider some ways in which a reflection of the battle was cast on human regions. I have often drawn attention to the great turning point in the evolution of modern cultural spheres, which came in the early 1840s. This was the turning point which brought the full impulse for the development of materialism. Materialism could only develop in consequence of major occurrences in the spiritual world, which then continued in a downward direction and gradually caused materialistic impulses to be instilled into humanity. If we consider how events in spiritual regions were reflected here on earth, two things are particularly evident. The first is that the truly, excuse me, the purely physical intellect and a culture based on this showed a tremendous upsurge in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, much more so than people imagine today. Future observers will see this more clearly. It is reasonable to say that anyone who studies the evolution of humanity and has an eye for more subtle elements in human life will note that there has never been such an upsurge in subtlety of conception, acumen and critical faculties for the adherence of materialism as during those decades. All the thinking I have characterized, thinking that leads to technical inventions, to criticism and to brilliant definitions, is physical thinking and is bound to the brain. A materialist who wanted to describe human evolution would have reason to say, quote, humanity has never been as clever as during those decades, close quote. It really was clever. If you study the literature, here I mean not only fine literature, you will find that at no other time were ideas so well defined and critical thinking so well developed as in those years, and this was in all kinds of areas. We see a mirror reflection develop in human souls of the aims certain spirits of darkness were seeking to achieve in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s of the last century, always hoping for victory. They sought to get possession of an ancient inheritance of humanity. This was something we referred to yesterday. Through millennia, the progressive spirits of light, guided humanity by means of blood bonds. They brought people together in families, tribes, nations, and races, uniting those who belong together on the basis of truly ancient human and world karma. With their feeling for those blood bonds, people then also had a feeling for missions which went a very long way back in the world. Missions designed to make the blood bonds, which of course came from the earth, part of the general human karma. If one turns one's attention to the spiritual world during the 1820s and 1830s, when the souls which were later to enter into human bodies were still in that world, one finds that the souls which were about to descend had certain impulses, which among other things were due to the fact that for millennia they had been bound to particular families, tribes, nations, and races each time they were on earth. From the 1840s onward, these souls were meant to make the decision to enter into particular bodies. For the spirits of light who sent their impulses into human souls were, of course, guiding human evolution according to the old blood bonds. And so the human souls in the spiritual worlds had certain impulses to follow the ancient human karma 
on entering into bodies which were to be the population in the second half of the 19th and the early 20th centuries. The spirits of light were using the old measures of controlling and guiding those souls. The spirits of darkness wanted to gain control over this. They wanted to drive the impulses of the spirits of light from those human souls and bring in their own impulses. If the spirits of darkness had won the battle in 1879, the relationship between human soul, excuse me, human bodies and souls would have been utterly different from what it actually has become in people born after 1879. Different souls would have been in different bodies, and the plan according to which human affairs on earth were ordered would have been according to the ideal of the spirits of darkness. But it is not. Thanks to the victory that Michael won over the dragon in the autumn of 1879, this could not happen. During the 1840s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, the battle was reflected on earth in the particular acumen, critical faculty, and so on, which I have described. As I have said before, mere speculation does not get us anywhere. It needs genuine spiritual observation. Speculation could never show that the very qualities of the physical intellect which I have mentioned are a reflection here on earth of the battle over reproduction, over the way in which generation follows generation. These things have to be observed. Anyone who thinks that the right connections between the physical and the spiritual worlds can be found by using the physical intellect is very much in error. This approach will normally give the wrong result because the rules of logic used are those of the physical sciences. These apply only to the physical world, however. They do not apply to the relationship between the physical and the spiritual worlds. This, then, was one way in which the battle for the blood was reflected. The other way, this again is something I have mentioned before, was the emergence of spiritualism in the 1840s and later. Certain groups, and they were far from small, sought to explore the connections with the spiritual world by using mediums, that is, essentially by physical means. If this had succeeded, if the spirits of darkness had been strong enough to gain the victory over Michael's adherents in 1879, spiritualism would have spread enormously. For spiritualism gets its impulses not only from the earth, but is also governed by the influences coming from the other world. It is important to be very clear that this is not a matter of choice. It is not possible to be easygoing and say, quote, either we accept such things or we refuse to accept them, close quote. It certainly is not like this. The things that happened in spiritualistic circles partly represented a significant intrusion of the spiritual world. They certainly arose from impulses which came from the spiritual world and were often closely bound up with human destinies. They were nevertheless a mirror reflection of the battle which had been lost in the spiritual region. This is also why spiritualism lost momentum and became so strangely corrupted after that point in time. It would have been the means by which people's attention would have been drawn to the spiritual world, and it would have been the only means if the spirits of darkness had gained the victory in 1879. If they had won, we would live in a world of indescribable acumen, which would apply to all kinds of different spheres in life. Speculations on the stock exchange which are sometimes quite dim-witted nowadays, would have been made with incredible acumen. This is one aspect. On the other hand, people far and wide would have sought to satisfy their spiritual needs by using mediums. So there you have what the spirits of darkness intended, physical acumen on the one hand, and a way of seeking connection with the spiritual world based on reduced consciousness on the other. Above all else, the spirits of darkness wanted to prevent spiritual experiences, 
living experience of the Spirit, from coming down into human souls. This was bound to come about gradually after their fall in 1879. The kind of spiritual experience which is utilized in the spiritual science of anthroposophy would have been impossible if the spirits of darkness had been victorious, for they would then have kept this life and activity in the spiritual regions. It is only because of their fall that instead of merely critical physical intelligence and the mediumistic approach, it has been and will increasingly be possible to gain direct experiences in the spiritual world. It is not for nothing that I recently told you how the present age is dependent on spiritual influences to a far greater extent than people believe. Our age may be materialistic and want to become even more materialistic, but the spiritual worlds reveal themselves to human beings in many more places than one would think. Spiritual influences can be felt everywhere, though at the present time they are not always good ones. People often find it embarrassing to admit to others their knowledge of spiritual influences, but many things they do or initiate are done because something appeared to them in a dream which was a genuine spiritual influence. Ask poets why they have become poets. Speaking of the time when they first began to be poets, they will tell you that they had spiritual experiences which came as in a dream, and this gave them the impulse to be creative. Ask people who have started journals why they did so. I am giving you facts. And they will speak of what they call dreams, though this was actually the transmission of impulses from the spiritual to the physical world. And there is much more of this, also in other areas, but people will not admit to it, for they think if they tell someone, quote, I've done something or other because some spirit or other appeared to me in a dream, close quote, the other person will call them idiots. This, of course, is not a nice thing to hear. It is the reason why we know so little about what really goes on among people today. The things which now happen sporadically in one place or another are merely the vanguard, of what will happen more and more. Spirituality will come to human beings because Michael won his victory in 1879. The fact that we have a science of the Spirit is also entirely due to this. Otherwise the truths concerned would have remained in the spiritual worlds. They could not have come to dwell in human brains and would not exist for the physical world. You have been given images which may serve to demonstrate the intentions of the spirits of darkness in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, and 70s when they fought the followers of Michael. These spirits have been down here among human beings from the autumn of 1879. They have failed to achieve their aims. Spiritualism will not become the general human persuasion People will not grow so clever from the materialistic point of view that they fall over themselves with their cleverness. The spiritual truths will take root among human beings. On the other hand, the spirits of darkness are now among us. We have to be on guard so that we may realize what is happening when we encounter them and gain a real idea of where they are to be found. The most dangerous thing you can do in the immediate future will be to give yourself up unconsciously to the influences which are definitely present. For it makes no difference to their reality whether they are recognized or unrecognized. It will be the main concern of these spirits of darkness to bring confusion into the rightful elements which are now spreading on earth and need to spread in such a way that the spirits of light can continue to be active in them. They will seek to push these in the wrong direction. I have already spoken of one such wrong direction, which is about as paradoxical as is possible. I have pointed out that while human bodies will develop in such a way that certain spiritualities can find room in them, the materialistic bent 
which will spread more and more under the guidance of the spirits of darkness, will work against this and combat it by physical means. I have told you that the spirits of darkness are going to inspire their human hosts, in whom they will be dwelling, to find a vaccine that will drive all inclination toward spirituality out of people's souls when they are still very young. And this will happen in a roundabout way through the living body. Today bodies are vaccinated against one thing and another. In future children will be vaccinated with a substance which it will certainly be possible to produce and this will make them immune so that they do not develop foolish inclinations connected with spiritual life. Foolish here, of course, in the eyes of materialists. A beginning has already been made, though only in the literary field where it is less harmful. As I have mentioned, learned medical experts have published books on the abnormalities of certain men of genius. As you know, attempts have been made to understand the genius of Conrad Ferdinand Meyer, Victor Scheffel, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer and Goethe by showing them to suffer from certain abnormalities. And the most astounding thing in this field is that people have also sought to understand Jesus Christ and the Gospels from this point of view. Two publications are now in existence in which the origins of Christianity are said to be due to the fact that at the beginning of our era there lived an individual who was mentally and psychologically abnormal. This individual went about in Palestine as Jesus Christ and infected people with Christianity. These, as I said, are the beginnings in the field of literature. The whole trend goes in a direction where a way will finally be found to vaccinate bodies so that these bodies will not allow the inclination toward spiritual ideas to develop. And all their lives, people will believe only in the physical world they perceive with the senses. Out of impulses which the medical profession gained from presumption, oh, I beg your pardon, from the consumption they themselves suffered, people are now vaccinated against consumption. And in the same way, they will be vaccinated against any inclination toward spirituality. This is merely to give you a particularly striking example of many things that will come in the near and more distant future in this field, the aim being to bring confusion into the impulses which want to stream down to earth after the victory of the spirits of light. The first step must be to throw people's views into confusion, turning their concepts and ideas inside out. This is a serious thing and must be watched with care for it is part of some highly important elements which will be the background to events now in preparation. I am choosing my words with great care. I am saying in preparation, because I am fully aware that to say in preparation, after the events which have taken place in the last three years, is something significant. Anyone who is able to see more deeply into these matters knows them to be preparations. Only superficial people can believe that this war, which is not a war of the old kind, will tomorrow or the day after be followed by a peace of the old kind. You have to be very superficial to believe this. Many will believe it, of course, if outer events appear to be in accord with the notions some people have. They will fail to realize what actually lies dormant beneath the surface. It is interesting to consider the decades from the 1840s onward, both in general and in detail. We have had a general characterization of them in these last weeks, and I have to some extent gone over this again today. A study of representative figures, the spiritual impulses which power evolution come to expression in such figures, will show that the general insights gained also prove true in individual instances. Let me give you an example which may seem to be a minor one. It is something I also mentioned last year. Numerous commentaries have been written on Goethe's Faust. Oswald Marbach's commentaries do not lack depth. They are in some respect profound. It is fair to say that the people who have been least profound are the literary historians. 
for it is their academic duty to understand such matters, which, of course, tends to be an obstacle to real understanding. Oswald Marbach wrote well about Faust, because he was not really a literary historian. He lectured on Goethe's Faust, mathematics, mechanics, and technology at Leipzig University, and at the present time the mysteries of the cosmos are easier to penetrate by studying Marbach's mechanics and technology than by applying the, in quotes, modern science of historians and literary historians. However, we do find something quite peculiar in the case of Oswald Marbach. He spoke on Goethe's Faust during the 1840s, but had ceased to do so by the end of the 1840s, nor did he speak about it in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. He only started to lecture on Goethe's Faust again in the late 70s. In between, he spoke only on mathematics, mechanics, and technology. That is, he devoted himself to the sciences which offered the best opportunity, especially at the time, to foster one's acumen and critical faculties. It is most interesting to see how he refers to this in his preface. Quote, Thirty or forty years ago, I used to lecture on Goethe's Faust at Leipzig University. The book was published in 1881. But I have only taken the subject up again in recent years, 1875. Why such a long interval? Many factors were involved, outer and inner ones, both subjective and objective. I grew older and finally old, and so did my students. Semester by semester they grew more and more morose. People were getting more clever, for, but for anyone who looked more deeply, also more morose. Open interest of the spirit in the spirit was getting less and less, and we lived in an age when usefulness counted more than beauty. For thirty years I yielded to necessity rather than to my own inclination. I put philosophy and poetry aside, teaching the exact sciences of mathematics, physics, and mechanics instead. Close quote. This was the time of materialistic acumen. One sentence in the preface is tremendously interesting, for it points directly to what mattered at this time. Marbach states that in his conscious mind he always thought he was doing exactly what he wanted to do in the past, whether interpreting Faust or lecturing on technology. However, when he took up Faust again to interpret the work, he had to confess he had been under an illusion, for he had merely obeyed the spirit of the time. It would be good if many people could realize the extent to which they are under illusions, for it was the ideal of the spirits of darkness before 1879, and has been even more so since they walk among us in the human realms since 1879, to spin a web of illusion over human beings and into human brains, and let illusions stream through human hearts. Something else is of interest when one considers such an individual, who is representative, as it were, of the influences which heaven brought to bear on earth. He says, and this is in accord with history, that in the 1840s he would mostly speak about Faust, part one, at the university, for there was no interest in part two. When he started to lecture on Faust again, and we can now say this was after Michael's victory over the dragon, his exposition would mostly be on part two, the age of acumen and critical faculties was indeed a time when access to part two of Goethe's Faust was difficult. Even today this work, which is one of the greatest affirmations of Goetheanism, is relatively little understood. Efforts at understanding are, of course, liable to make us feel ill at ease, for nowhere else is the atmosphere in which people live today treated with such humor, such irony, as in Part Two of Goethe's Faust. People live in a social atmosphere today which has been gradually evolving since the 16th century. They hail everything which has been achieved from the 16th century onward as great and glorious achievements of our time and positively wallow in those achievements. Goethe was not only a man of his time, he was inwardly able to look ahead to the 20th century and wrote part two of Faust for the 20th, 21st, 
and later centuries. This will be only understood in the future. Hidden below the surface is a humorous and ironical look at developments since the 16th century, written in grand style. Consider the way Goethe lets the much-admired advances on which civilizations live today be presented to Faust as a contrivance of Mephistopheles. Thus, not only the paper specter of the golden florin, but all the glorious developments from the 16th century onward were the creation of Mephistopheles. In time to come, humanity will see the magnificent irony with which the creations of that time are treated in Part Two of Faust. On the one hand, we have Faust in his quest for the spirit, and on the other, Mephistopheles, representative of the spirits of darkness, who invents everything humanity has come to depend on and will depend on more and more, especially in the twentieth century. Much which will help us to be on our guard may be found hidden in Part Two of Faust. It is profoundly significant. It is a profoundly significant symptom that someone who had used physics, mechanics, mathematics, and technology to learn the secrets of the age felt drawn to speak about Part Two exactly when the victory had been won over the dragon. For decades before this, he would speak only of Part One which alone could be understood at the time. We have seen, especially also in the course of last year, that anthroposophy is gradually helping us to bring life into things which Goethe was only able to present in images and to discover their deeper meaning in Part Two of Faust. Anthroposophy clearly cannot be derived from a study of Faust, but it is certainly true that anthroposophy grows a new and much clearer light excuse me, throws a new and much clearer light on the impressive images Goethe has given in Part Two, and in his magnificent discourses in Wilhelm Meister's journeyman years. Here we touch on a trend which will have to gain ground under the influence of the progressive spirits of light as time goes on, to counter the efforts of the spirits of darkness. And it will gain ground if human beings are on their guard against the spirits of darkness. These last three years have been a challenge to be watchful and on our guard, though the numbers of souls able to perceive the call are as yet far from adequate. We have been able to see the opposite trend at work here, there, and everywhere. It is particularly when spiritual life is beginning to be possible that the spirits of hindrance are very much to the fore. We have seen characteristic things, and we shall see more of them. Even just to hint at such things is liable to create continuous misunderstanding. The spiritual atmosphere in which people live today is impregnated with the will to misunderstand to such an extent that one's words are immediately interpreted as something different from what they actually mean to convey. One has to use human words and these have all kinds of associations. Today so many people base their judgment on national passions that if one has in some way to characterize someone who belongs to a particular nation, simply as a human individual who is here on earth, this is taken amiss by people who also belong to that nation, despite the fact that something said about individuals who are involved in current events, for example, has nothing to do with one's views of some nation or other. The belief that the tempest now raging is caused by the things that everybody is talking about today is especially harmful because it is especially senseless. The causes are much more deeply hidden and initially have really nothing to do with national aspirations in some respects. Please note, I am saying in some respects. National aspirations are merely made use of by certain powers, but the majority of people are so superficial that they do not want to know about this. It will be some time before an objective view is taken in this area. Large sections of humanity find it easiest to ascribe greatness and far-sightedness 
to ideas which have arisen in a brain as limited as that of someone just out of teacher training college, who is let loose not just on a class of school children, but in this case on the whole of humanity. As I said on a number of occasions, it did not need this terrible time, which has come upon us, to form an objective opinion on Woodrow Wilson from the point of view of spiritual science. I spoke of this in the lectures I gave in Helsingsfors in 1913. You can read it up in titled The Occult Significance of the Bhagavad Gita. There I spoke of the world school mastery of Woodrow Wilson and the shallow superficiality of the man. In those days, however, you were outside the spirit of the time when you spoke about Woodrow Wilson like this. For his grammar schoolboy essays on independence, culture, and literature were then still being translated into European languages. It will be a long time yet before people will feel, feel embarrassed at taking seriously the grammar school level policies of Woodrow Wilson. Spirits of darkness are at work everywhere to befog human minds. One day people will waken from the mists and vapors in which they are now asleep, and they will find it hard to understand how people could have allowed themselves to be kept on leading reins by Woodrow Wilson and his wisdom in the early twentieth century without feeling embarrassed. A moment of waking will only come when people begin to feel embarrassed at policies which are possible today. It is difficult to say truth-inspired things today because they sound too much in opposition to the ideas which have been inculcated into people's heads. And it is difficult to form an independent judgment in the atmosphere which has been produced not only during the last three years but also through everything I have called a social carcinoma in the lectures I gave in Vienna. It is necessary to take these things with profound seriousness and not apply to them the concepts and ideas which people have been in the habit of using as their criteria. It will be necessary to realize that the present time demonstrates the inadequacy and indeed the utter uselessness of the ideas humanity has come to accept, and that in terms of world history it is indecent for people to base their judgment on the very ideas which have led to present events when those events clearly show them to have been wrong. Do people think they can cure the ills of the present time by applying the same principles which have brought them about? If so, they are utterly deceiving themselves. Humanity has a certain sum total of cultural achievements which come from older times. These are now being used up. Every day brings evidence of their being used up without anything new taking their place. People are so little prepared today to understand and see through such things in their full seriousness. Many are still thinking exactly as they did in 1913, in the belief that the understanding they had in 1913 will also be adequate for 1917. They do not have enough sense of reality to see that this kind of thinking has a great deal to do with the events of the year 1917, having brought them about, and that it cannot cure the ills we experience now in 1917. The need of the present time is that we go deeply into the events which have occurred since the fall of the spirits of darkness. We must gain as much insight as possible into the events of the 1880s, 1890s, and the first two decades of the twentieth century. People are utterly confused in their judgment with regard to them. Neither do they have a real idea of the radical difference in the way people felt and reacted after 1879 compared to the way they did before 1879. Going into something like Part Two of Goethe's Faust will also help us to progress. This work could not be understood in Goethe's time because it is a critique of what Goethe perceived to be the content of the twentieth century. Characteristically, someone like Oswald Marbach only found access to Part Two after the fall of the spirits of darkness. These are the insights and impulses which will help us to grow inwardly so that we may meet the needs of our time. 
Many of the seeds sown before 1879 have not come to fruition. And in connection with this, there is a significant question which should really cast its shadow on every human soul. Today I want to put it merely as a question. The events in which we are caught up today indicate where humanity stands now. What matters now is not merely to understand them, but to find a way out of them. Yet while there is so little will to penetrate the deeper real impulses which have led to the present age, Practical minds will not be able to understand these matters. It is wrong to think that no one has sufficient insight into the current situation. People simply do not want to listen to them, just as they do not want to know about such a thing as Gertianism, which is also like the voice of the twentieth century. Yet this voice will only be rightly understood if people seek to understand, seriously and in all dignity, the profound significance of the fall of the spirits of darkness in the autumn of 1879. To understand the present time, it will be necessary to understand the spiritual evolution of humanity. That is why I spoke of Oswald Marbach, whose poem I gave you last year to let you see how he looks at the past and ahead to the future. He wrote the poem to mark the anniversary when Goethe found entry into communities then called Masonic or the like, though in the 18th century this meant something different from what it means today. Goethe's viewpoint allowed him insight into many of the mysterious impulses which go through the world, things that people are too superficial to want to see. Oswald Marbach wrote these verses to mark the anniversary of Goethe finding his way to the world of the Spirit. Quote, With you, my brother, father, sublime master, we now join hands across a hundred years to mark the steadfast love which does unite and closely bind all independent minds. Greatest of spirits, mind most independent, all our endeavor is to reach your heights. We dedicate ourselves to you. We dedicate our sons so that one day achievement be the crown. You strove as we now strive, yet the soul of your endeavor to gain self-knowledge that will lead to wisdom was always life itself with vigor lived, was power creative, actively progressing, to works which rise into the light in glorious beauty for eternity. Like Israel, you struggled against God until you won the victory or yourself. The mystery which now forever binds us will not be told to unenlightened souls, yet make it known to all the world in deeds of purest love that never tire, in the clear light which spirit gives to spirit, in life eternal which shall never fade. Lead on then, Master. Where you went before, we are drawn to follow in most ardent longing. Close quote. Such is the mood that must unlock the quote, gates of fulfillment. Close quote. End of lecture 13. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness, 14 lectures. And this is the last lecture in this cycle, Lecture 14, entitled Into the Future, given in Dornach on the 28th of October, 1917. We have been reflecting on the significant events which took place, as it were, behind the scenes of world history during the 19th century. The nature of it all is such that if one does not want to be entirely abstract, it is necessary to characterize many of the things which have to be said with regard to the spiritual world by considering their reflection or mirror image in the physical world. For events here in the physical world truly do reflect spiritual events. Before going on, I want to draw your attention to something of great significance which lies behind all these things. As you know, the transition from the 4th to the 5th post-Atlantean period of civilization came in about 1413. 
that is, in the 15th century. This has been characterized in many ways, but let me add today that spiritual guidance of earthly affairs involved mainly members of the hierarchy of archangels. You will find some of the details in the small volume entitled The Spiritual Guidance of the Individual and of Humanity, uh, Readers Aside, which is on this website, and of Readers Aside. As I said, they were mainly involved. Try, with all intensity, to gain an image of this. Angelic spirits pursued their tasks in the spiritual worlds. Much happened on earth as a result. History, human life in the fourth post-Atlantean age resulted on earth. Angelic spirits belonging to the hierarchy of angels served the higher hierarchy of archangels. They did this in such a way, however, that the relationship between members of the two hierarchies was entirely above the earthly and in the spiritual realm, hardly touching on human life. This changed with the coming of the fifth post-Atlantean age. For then, the members of the hierarchy of the angels became more independent in their task of guiding humanity. Thus, humanity was more under direct guidance from the archangels during the fourth post-Atlantean age and will be under direct guidance from the angels during the fifth age, that is, throughout our present fifth age, until the fourth millennium. We can, therefore, no longer say that the relationship is entirely unconnected with the physical world. This is how the fact can be presented at the spiritual level. It can also be presented at a more physical level, for all things physical are in the image of the Spirit. Looking for the indirect route by which the archangels guided humanity by working with the angels during the fourth post-Atlantean age, we can say, This was done via the human blood. And the social structure was also created via the blood, for it was based on blood relationship, on blood bonds. Both the archangels and the angels had their dwelling place in the blood, as it were. Truly, the blood is not merely something for chemists to analyze. It is also the dwelling place of entities from higher worlds. During the fourth post-Atlantean age, therefore, The blood was the dwelling place of archangels and angels. This is changing with the fifth post-Atlantean age. For the angels, I am referring to the angels of light, the normal angels, will take possession more of the blood, and the archangels will be more involved in the nervous system. This is putting it in the terms of the modern science of physiology. Using an older terminology, I might also say, During the fifth post-Atlantean age, the archangels are essentially more at work in the brain and the angels in the heart. You see, therefore, that a major change has occurred, which can be traced all the way to the physical structure of human beings. The things people do and achieve here on earth are connected with the spirits which are at work in them. People tend to imagine, not always correctly, that angels and archangels are somewhere in cloud cuckoo land. If we were to take the whole of human neurological life as a place and the whole of the blood life as another place and add what belongs to these when we are in the other worlds between death and rebirth, we would have the realms of the archangels and angels. The 15th century marked a specific period in earth evolution and in the corresponding evolution of the spiritual world. We can characterize the events of the time more or less as follows. In the 15th century, the earth held the greatest attraction for the regular archangels, who were seeking to make the transition from the blood to the nervous system. Going back from the 14th to the 13th, 12th, and 11th centuries, we find the earth's power of attraction growing less and less. Beyond that time, it would grow less and less again. We might say the archangels were directed by higher spirits to love earthly existence most of all during the 15th century. Strange as it may seem to many people today, who think only in grossly materialistic terms, it is nevertheless true 
that earthly events are connected with such things. How did America come to be rediscovered in such a strange way? And people began to make the whole world their own again, exactly at that time. Because at the time, the archangels were most attracted to the earth. They, therefore, guided partly the blood and partly the nervous system in such a way that human beings began to go out from their centers of civilization to make the whole earth their own. Events like these must be seen in conjunction with spiritual activities, otherwise they cannot be understood. It does, of course, sound peculiar to people who think in a crude materialistic terms if you say America was discovered and everything we read about in so-called history happened because, within certain limits, that was the time when the earth held the greatest power of attraction for the archangels. The archangels then began to train the angels to take possession of the human blood, whilst the archangels wanted to make the transition to the nervous system. By the early 1840s, the point had come where certain retarded angels made the attempt to take the place which belonged to the archangels in the nervous system rather than reside and reign in the blood. We are therefore able to say that in the 1840s a significant battle developed in the way I have described. And if we consider its most material physical reflection, it took place between the human blood and the human nervous system. The angels of darkness were cast out of the nervous system and into the human blood and now wreak the havoc in the human blood which I have described. It is because they are at work in the human blood that all the things I have described as due to the influence of retarded angels are happening here on earth. It is because they are at work in the human blood that people have become as clever as I have said. All this developed slowly and gradually, of course, and we are able to say that whilst the profound break came in 1841, the whole of the 19th century had been infected with it. An evolution of profound significance has thus been initiated. One important fact to which I have already drawn your attention in these lectures is that not later than the seventh millennium in earth evolution women will grow infertile and reproduction will no longer be possible. If matters went entirely according to the normal angelic spirits in the blood, human reproduction would not even continue for as long as this. It would only continue until the sixth millennium or the sixth post-Atlantean period of civilization. According to the wisdom of light, the impulse for reproduction would not continue beyond this time in the seven periods of civilization in this post-Atlantean age. However, it will go on beyond this, into the seventh millennium and possibly a little beyond. The reason will be that those cast-down angels will be in charge and will give the impulses for reproduction. This is highly significant. In the sixth post-Atlantean period of civilization, the human fertility, which depends on the powers of light for its impulses, will gradually come to an end. The powers of darkness will have to intervene so that the affair may continue for a time. We know the seeds for the sixth post-Atlantean period of civilization lie in the east of Europe. The east of Europe will develop powerful tendencies which do not allow physical human reproduction to continue beyond the sixth period of civilization. But instead, let the earth enter into a form of existence in soul and spirit. The other impulses for the seventh post-Atlantean period of civilization, in which procreation will be guided by impulses from the cast-down angels, will come from America. Consider the complex nature of these things, which can only be discovered, I have to stress this again and again, by direct observation of the spiritual worlds. Mere theorizing will generally lead to error, for with this we tend to follow a single line of thought, which will finally lead to the statement that 
human procreative life will be extinguished in the sixth post-Atlantean period of civilization. It needs actual spiritual observation to enable us to observe the different currents which interact to produce the whole. You have to put a great deal into it if you are to arrive at significant insights and their interactions, such as those of which I have been speaking. The enormous complexity of human beings becomes apparent when you consider that now in the fifth post-Atlantean age archangels and angels are active in them via the nervous system and the blood, but so are the abnormal spirits which oppose them. This is where the forces are anchored which act with each other, against each other, and so on. There we see what is happening in reality. Looking at events in outer life, one only sees the surface wave and not the forces which cast it to the surface. We can give another instance of the way in which the spirits of darkness, who were cast down in 1879, seek to exert an influence. Before 1879, from the spiritual world and, since then, from the human realm. You will recall something of which I spoke in an earlier lecture that humanity as a whole is getting younger and younger. If we go back to ancient India, we find that people remained young and capable of physical development well into ripe old age. During the Persian epoch, less so. In Egypto-Chaldean times, even less. Until, into Greco-Latin times, people were only capable of development until they reached the span extending from their 28th to their 35th year. Today they have grown even younger and are only capable of development up to their 27th year, as I told you. Later a time will come when this only goes to the 26th year, and so on. You will recall that I referred to someone who is at the hub of things at the present time and who can only be really understood if we realize that the age of 27 plays such a special role in life today, and this is Lloyd George. For it is always significant when the life of the soul coincides with the outer life of the body. The fact that in our fifth post-Atlantean age people are naturally capable of further development only until they reach their twenties is important as a basis for the concerted action of archangels and angels. The normal spirits, the spirits of light, want to direct human evolution in a certain way. This is as follows. Human beings are naturally capable of further development until they are in their twenties. The spirits of light want to keep this an intimate affair, letting it proceed without much ado in human beings. Then in the twenty-eighth year, between the twenty-eighth and thirty-fifth years, the development which has gone on quietly is to emerge. Mark well, therefore, something which evolves in the human blood until people reach the twenty-eighth year, is to enter more into people's self-awareness. It is to be handed over to the blood in self-awareness. It is therefore the intention of the normal spirits, the spirits of light, that the inner life should develop quietly, unambitiously and selflessly, and only come into action when individuals have reached the age of twenty-eight, when the years of apprenticeship are behind them, as it were, and they become journeymen and finally masters. The spirits of darkness, which had been cast down from the spiritual world, rebelled against this. They wanted people to take an active role in life and be masters at using the external intellect in their twenties, rather than go through quiet inner development. Here you have a social phenomenon traced back to its spiritual foundations. A significant battle is taking place among us, you will find. The spirits of light only want us to reach maturity and be ready to take on an active role in public life after the twenty-eighth year. The spirits of darkness want the time put forward so that it comes before the twenty-eighth year. They want to push people out into public life at an earlier time. All the impulses in our social life which reflect these elements have their origin in this, 
when in some place or other, for instance, the request is made to bring the age of majority down even further into the twenties or even earlier than the twenties. There you have the origins of these elements. People do, of course, find it uncomfortable to know such things today, for they make it evident to what extent the spirits of darkness are causing havoc in public affairs. Much of what I have been saying has so far been known instinctively and atavistically by people. This has to come to an end, however, and people will have to be prepared to gain conscious knowledge of things that used to be known instinctively and were also instilled into human minds by the ancient mysteries. Spiritual principles must be included in shaping the social structure. They have to be thought of rather than people wanting to shape the world blindly on the basis of mere emotions. The spirits of darkness find it easiest to achieve their aims if people are asleep to what goes on in the spirit. They can then easily gain power over what over what they cannot achieve if people enter consciously into the spiritual impulses that are active in evolution. Much of the mendacity which exists in the world today serves the purpose of rocking people to sleep so that they do not see the reality are deflected from reality, and the spirits of darkness have it all their own way with the human race. All kinds of things are falsely presented to people to deflect them from truths they could experience if they were awake, and indeed ought to experience, if human evolution is to proceed in a fruitful way. This is the age when human beings must take affairs into their own hands. It will be of real importance to see certain things in their true light, which, however, will only be possible if one knows the spiritual powers involved. We may say that the nineteenth century brought everything which can cause people to be deflected from the truth. Just think what it really meant that Darwinism intervened so profoundly in human evolution, even at the most popular level of thinking, exactly during the most important phase of nineteenth century evolution. It is strange to see what people sometimes come up with in this respect. For example, Fritz Mautner's famous title, Dictionary of Philosophy, includes the interesting statement that it was not how Darwin overcame teleology, the theory of design and purpose, which mattered, but the fact that he did overcome it. In other words, in Mautner's view, it was most fruitful that someone presented organic evolution taking its course without involving spiritual entities and their designs and purposes. Now, for someone who is able to see these things in their proper light, the matter appears as follows. If you see a horse-drawn vehicle, a cab with a horse in front, the horse is drawing the cab. You will, of course, say that the driver is sitting on the box and guiding the horse with the reins. But if you ignore the driver... You will find it interesting to study what goes on in the horse to make it draw the cab. You can go into every detail of how the horse sets about drawing the cab, if you leave aside the fact that it is given its intention by the cab driver. This is the actual basis of Darwinian theories. One simply leaves aside the driver, saying it is an old superstition, a prejudice to say that the driver is guiding the horse. The horse is drawing the cab, anyone can see that, for the horse is in front. Darwinian theory is entirely based on this kind of logic. Being thus biased, it has, of course, brought to light some excellent truths, which are of the first magnitude. But it blocks all possibility of a real overview. Countless scientific facts suffer at the empirical level from the fact that people overlook the driver. They speak of cause and effect, but they seek the cause for the movement of the cab in the horse, considering this to be a great advance. People fail to realize that this type of confusion between horse and driver, such horse theories, if you will, forgive my putting it bluntly, exists right, left, and center in modern science. These theories cannot be proved wrong, just as it is not wrong to say the horse draws the cab. This is quite correct but true and false in the outer sense is not the issue. Materialistic thinkers will always be able to refute a spiritualistic thinker 
who knows that the driver is there as well. Here you see where the hair-splitting, astute, critical intellect could lead, which the spirits of darkness want human beings to have. It does not matter about getting things right, let alone complete. What counts is that one follows the model where the horse draws the cab. Logic can easily separate from reality and go its own way. It is possible to be utterly logical and at the same time be far from reality. Something else has to be considered when we speak of human evolution. It is that the spirits of darkness have power mainly over the rational mind and intellect. They cannot get hold of the emotions, nor the will, and above all not the will impulses. This touches on a profound and most significant law of reality. You have, all of you, though to a different degree, reached a sufficiently respectable age for it to be fair to say you have lived several decades, or two or three decades at least. In the last decades we have seen a wide variety of social efforts, many supported by press journalism, some also by book journalism, but very few based on real knowledge and on the facts. We have seen strange forms of social and political life evolve in Europe and America. Yet, strangely, we find in all these things the ideas belonging to the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, but not the emotions, nor the will impulses. This is strange indeed. It can only be discovered if we carry out genuinely honest and conscientious investigations in the spiritual world. People who came down from the world of the spirit in the 1840s to incarnate in human bodies and are now up in that world again know about these things. They have the point of view of the spiritual world and know that in recent decades the intellects were active which were ripe for the age whilst the will impulses were still those of the 1840s. The will moves much more slowly in human evolution than do ideas. Please take this as a highly significant truth. The will moves much more slowly than do thoughts. For example, the patriarchal, solid citizen type, habits of people, who were not being rebels or revolutionaries in the 1830s and 1840s, but were more inclined to follow the general trend, continued to live on into the decades of which I am now speaking. Their thoughts were ahead, went ahead, however, and so there are continuous discrepancies between thought life and will life in evolution. Discrepancies which do not show themselves in all but only in some spheres of life. It is entirely due to this that something became possible in the, in the 19th century which had not been possible in any previous century. Superficial historians may well disagree, but it is pointless to go against it. What I mean is this. Never before in the historical epochs of human evolution did the intellect or acumen positively intervene in life. Go back to the slave rebellions in ancient Rome. The slaves were essentially aroused by rancor, by will impulses. In the 19th and on into the 20th century, this is different. Modern social democracy does not compare, historically speaking, with the old slave rebellions. It is something entirely different, born out of theories produced by LaSalle, but mainly by Karl Marx, including his theory of the class struggle. A purely critical element, purely theoretical, based on ideas, set people going and made them into agitators. This was because the people who took up Marxism and became agitators still had the will impulses of the 1840s. They had not been able to catch up as far as the will was concerned. This discrepancy in will had the effect that under the guidance of certain powers a purely intellectual movement generated agitation among the masses. This is something which did not exist before. It shows even more than what I said yesterday, that in the 19th century, partly during the time when the spirits of darkness were still above, and then after they had come down, they sought above all to encourage the physical intellect by working through one particular stream. 
There you see it at work. You see it take hold of the emotions, even in the 1830s and 1840s, and for once acting not as pure intellect alone to convince people. You see the direct effect of the intellect in agitation, revolution, revolutionary longings. Never before had the intellect been at the helm to that extent. It is important to consider this. We must penetrate the time with understanding by discovering what goes on behind the scenes in world history. Ask anyone who does not take much interest in these matters how old history is and for how long humanity has been engaged in the discipline known as history today. They will say that it goes a long way back. But history as we know it today is not much more than a hundred years old. Before that, memorable events and histories, in quotes, were recorded world history, as it is called, where a thread is followed through human evolution, is just slightly over a hundred years old. Look at the stories of history which preceded this. Why did modern history come up? Because it is a product of transition. Are there any special reasons why history and the way it is handled today should be regarded as a science? Well, we can give a number of reasons, the main one being that several hundred professors are employed as professors of history at all the universities on earth. This reminds me of an individual who taught criminal law and who tends to come to mind whenever we speak of the reasons for developments. This individual taught criminal law at a university. He always started his lectures with what he considered to be proof of human freedom. Well, he did not produce much by way of real reasons. Quote, gentlemen, freedom has to exist, for if there were no freedom, there would be no criminal law. The fact is that I am a professor of criminal law, therefore criminal law must exist. It follows that human freedom also exists. Close quote. Whenever you hear opinions expressed on what are said to be developments in the course of human evolution, you will hear the fine words, quote, history has shown, close quote. Look at the things that are being written on current events. Again and again you will see the phrase, history has shown this, when someone wants to present his nonsense about what will happen once peace is made. They will say, quote, it was like this after the Thirty Years' War, close quote, and so on. These truths are of the kind of which I have spoken before when I said that according to people's calculations, a war cannot take more than four months today. In reality, history does not teach us anything. In materialistic thinking, sciences can only be called such if one has repeated instances which allow one to draw conclusions as to future developments. When a chemist does an experiment, he knows that if he combines certain substances, certain processes will occur. Combining the same substances again will result in the same processes, and the third time it will be the same again. Or one gets a certain cloud combination, which generates lightning. A similar combination will again generate lightning. Modern thinking is based on premises according to which a science cannot be a science unless it rests on this type of repetition. Do, you, do think this through. History cannot be a science for people who take the materialistic point of view, for things do not repeat themselves in history. The combinations are always new. It is therefore not possible to draw conclusions by using the method employed in other sciences. History is merely a product of transition. It only became a science in the 19th century. Before then, memorable events were described. You see, writing your family history is not considered to be history either. Even the German word for history, Geschichte, is far from old. Other languages do not even have this word, for the word history has quite a different origin. In the past, the singular was Das Geschichte, as in titled Das Geschichte der Apostel, and so on. Quote, what has come to pass, close quote. Then the plural, die Geschichten, came to be used, which is the straightforward plural of das Geschicht. Today we have to say die Geschichte. Yet in Switzerland, die Geschichten was still the plural of das Geschicht, 150 years ago. 
Then the article was changed, and one said die Geschichte, singular, which had been the plural when the word had the article das. This is the origin of the word. You can read it up in works on etymology. The term history will only have real meaning when spiritual impulses are taken into account. There we can speak of what really has come to pass, and within limits, of what happens behind the scenes. Limits are set in so far as we compare this with what can be predicted to apply in the physical world in future, the position of the sun next summer, for example, and so on, but not every detail of the weather. The world of the spirit also has elements which are like the weather of the future in relation to the future position of the sun. Generally speaking, however, the course of human evolution can only be known on the basis of its spiritual impulses. History is, therefore, embryonic and not what it is supposed to be. It will only finally be something when it makes the transition from its 100 years of existence to consideration of the spiritual life which is behind the scenes of what comes to pass at the surface level for humanity. It means that people must really wake up in many respects. We merely need to take up a theme which is not without significance for the present time, such as this theme I have just taken up, how old is history? Many people, and this is not to blame individuals, but merely the system used in schools, have never had the least idea that history is still so young and cannot yet be in accord with reality. Imagine what it would be like if natural science were only 100 years old and you wanted to compare it with earlier stages in natural science. These things only move gradually from being something which is merely learned to becoming real life. It is only when this is seriously considered and these issues become issues in education that people will come to understand the reality of life. On the other, on the one hand, People must be introduced to the life of nature when still young, as one sees in some, I am saying some of the stories in Brehm's work, where it is really possible to gain a living perception of things which happen through creatures from the animal world. Distinction must be made, above all, between anything based on reality and the allegorical, symbolic tales told by people whose approach to nature is entirely superficial. These would merely come between the children and their understanding of reality. The point is that we should not tell them anything symbolic and allegorical, but introduce them to the real life of natural history. We might consider the life of bees, not in the way zoologists do, but rather in the way of someone who enters into things with heart and soul, without being sentimental about it. Metterling's book on bees is, of course, very good, but it would not be suitable for children. It might induce someone to write a children's book on bees or perhaps on ants. You would have to avoid any form of allegory, nor should you speak of abstract spiritual entities. You would really have to go into the concrete reality. On the other hand, history, which is nonsense and harmful to children as it is now written, would have to be handled in such a way that one could always feel the spiritual at work in it. Of course, you cannot tell children, not even boys and girls at grammar school, what actually happened in the 19th century. You can give expression to the real situation through the way in which the story is told, in the way in which events are grouped, and by the value given to one element or another. The stories concocted for the 19th century are certainly not what is needed to give even people of more mature years years, an idea of what really happened. We ought to show how something was in preparation during the first, second, third and fourth decades of that century, which really came to life in the forties. All we have to do is to describe things in such a way that the individual concerned gets a feeling for events in Europe and America during the 1840s. This something special is, quote, chumbling and churning, close quote, in there, if you will forgive the expression. Then again, when one comes to the 1870s, we would not say it was the time when the angels were cast down from heaven, but we can speak in a way for people to see and feel 
that a major change came at that point in the 19th century. Anthroposophy can also enrich earlier history. The rubbish presented as Greek and Roman history in schools today could really come to life if the anthroposophical impulses we have come to know were brought into it. No need to use exactly these terms and ideas, but tell the story in such a way that it emerges in the telling. People have moved a long way from this and must come closer to it again. This is the only way in which people can get a sense of reality. They lack this sense today, even with regard to the most primitive aspects of life around them and the events in which they share. People think they are realistic and materialistic today, when in fact they are the most abstract of theorists you can think of, stuffed full with theories, fast asleep in nothing but theories, and not even aware of the fact. If one of them should happen to wake up, it is not a matter of chance, but if we use the proper way of saying it, we might say, if one of them should by chance wake up and say something whilst awake, he would simply be ignored. It is the way things are today. You will no doubt have heard that certain people are over and over again proclaiming to the world that democracy must spread to the whole civilized world. Salvation lies in making the whole of humanity democratic. Everything will have to be smashed to pieces so that democracy may spread in the world. Well, if people go on to accept ideas presented to them as they are, with wholesale acceptance of the term democracy, for instance, Their idea of democracy will be like the definition of the human being which I gave you. A human being is a creature with two legs and without feathers, a plucked cockerel. The people who are glorifying democracy today know about as much about it as someone who has shown a plucked cockerel knows about the human being. Concepts are taken for reality, and as a result illusion may take the place of reality where human life is concerned by lulling people to sleep with concepts. They believe the fruits of their endeavors will be that every individual will be able to express their will in the different democratic institutions. And they fail to see that these institutions are such that it is always just a few people who pull the wires, whilst the rest are pulled along. They are persuaded, however, that they are part of democracy, and so they do not notice they are being pulled and that some individuals are pulling the strings. Those individuals will find it all the easier to do the pulling if the others all believe they are doing it themselves instead of being pulled along. It is quite easy to lull people to sleep with abstract concepts and make them believe the opposite of what is really true. This gives the powers of darkness the best opportunity to do what they want. And if anyone should wake up, they are simply ignored. It is interesting to note that in 1910, someone wrote that large-scale capitalism had succeeded in making democracy into the most marvelous, flexible, and effective tool for exploiting the whole population. Financiers were usually imagined to be the enemies of democracy the individual concerned wrote. But this was a fundamental error. On the contrary, they run democracy and encourage it, for it provides a screen behind which they can hide their method of exploitation, and they find it their best defense against any objections which the populace may raise. For once, therefore, a man woke up and saw that what mattered was not to proclaim democracy, but to see the full reality, not to follow slogans, but to see things as they are. This would be a particularly important this would be particularly important today, for people would then realize that the events which reign with such blood and terror over the whole of humanity are guided and directed from just a few centers. People will never realize this if they persist in the delusion that nation is fighting nation, and allow the European and American press to lull them to sleep over the kinds of relations they are said that are said to exist between nations. Everything said about antagonism and opposition between nations only exists to cast a veil over the true reasons. For we shall never arrive at the real truth if we feed on words in order to explain these events. 
but only if we point to actual people. The problem is that this tends to be unpalatable today. And the man who woke up and wrote these statements in 1910 also presented some highly unwelcome accounts in his book. He produced a list of 55 individuals who are the real rulers and exploiters of France. The list can be found in Francis de Lazy's, uh, uh, forgive the French, La Dem- Democratie et les Financiers, written in 1910. The same man has also written La Guerre qui vient, a book which has become famous. In his La Democratie et les Financiers, you will find statements of fundamental significance. There you have someone who has woken up to reality. The book contains impulses which allow one to see through much of what we should see through today, and also to cut through much of the fog which is made to wash over human brains today. Here again we must resolve to look to reality. The book has, of course, been ignored. It does, however, raise issues which should be raised all over the world today for they would teach people much about the reality which others intend to bury under all their declamations on democracy and autocracy and whatever the slogans may be. The book also gives an excellent exposition on the extremely difficult position in which members of Parliament find themselves. People think they can vote according to their convictions, but you would have to know all the different threads which tie them to reality if you wanted to know why they vote for one thing and against another. Certain issues really must be raised. De Lacy does so. I'm pronouncing that De Lacy, it's spelled D-E-L-A-I-S-I, readers aside. Thus, for example, he considers, considers a member of parliament and asks the question, quote, which side should the poor man support? The people pay him 3,000 francs a year and the shareholders pay him 30,000 francs, close quote. To pose the question is to answer it. So the poor dear man gets his 3,000 franc allowance from the people and 30,000 francs from the shareholders. I think you will agree it is a good piece of proof, a sign of real acumen to say how nice that a socialist, a man of the people like Millerand, has gained a seat in Parliament. De Lacy's question goes in another direction. He asks, how far can someone like Millerand, who was earning 30,000 francs a year for representing insurance companies, be independent. So, for once, someone did wake up. He is well aware of the threads which run from the actions of such an individual to the different insurance companies. But such things, reported by someone who is awake and sees the truth, are ignored. It is, of course, only too easy to talk about democracy in the Western world. Yet, if you wanted to tell people the truth you would have to say, quote, the man called so-and-so is doing this, and the one called so-and-so is doing that, close quote. De Lacy has found 55 men, not a democracy, but 55 specific individuals, who, he says, govern and exploit France. There, someone has discovered the real facts, for in ordinary life, too, a feeling must awaken for the real facts. Here is something else from De Lacy. There was once a lawyer who had all kinds of connections, not just insurance companies, but centers of finance, financial worlds. But this lawyer wanted to aim even higher. He wanted sponsorship not only from the worlds of finance, industry, and trade, but also from the academic world of the French Academy. This is a place where the academic world can raise one to the sphere of immortality. There were two, in quotes, immortals, within the academy, however, who were involved in illegal trust dealings. They found it perfectly possible to combine their work for immortality with trust dealings which the law of the land did not permit. Then our sharp-witted lawyer defended the two immortals in court and managed to get them off, to whitewash them so that no sentence was passed. They then had him admitted to the ranks of the immortals. Science responsible not for the temporal things of the world, but for things eternal and immortal, made itself the advocate of this selfless lawyer. His name is Raymond Poincaré. De Lazy tells the story in his La Démocratie et les Financiers. It is not a bad thing to know these things, which are ingredients of reality. They must be seriously considered. And one is guided to develop something of a nose for reality when one takes up anthroposophy, 
whilst the materialistic education people have today, with innumerable channels opening into it from the press, is designed to point not to the realities, but to something which is cloaked in all kinds of slogans. And if someone does wake up, as De Lacy did, and writes about how things really are, how many people get to know about it? How many people will listen? They cannot listen, for it is buried by, well, by a life that again is ruled by the press. De Lacy shows himself to be a bright person, someone who has gone to a lot of trouble to gain real insight. He is no blind follower of parliamentarianism nor of democracy. He predicts that the things people think are so clever today will come to an end. He says so expressly, also with reference to the, quote, voting machine, close quote, which is approximately how he puts it. He is entirely scientific and serious in his discourse on this parliamentary voting machine, for he understands the whole system which leads to these voting machines, where people are made to believe that a convinced majority is voting against a mentally unhinged minority. He knows that someone else will have to take the place of this if there is to be healthy development. This is not yet possible, for people would be deeply shocked if they were to if you were to tell them what will take its place. Only people initiated into spiritual science can really know this today. Forms which belong to the past will definitely not take its place. You need not be afraid that someone speaking out of anthroposophy will promote some kind of reactionary or conservative ideas. No, these will not be things of the past but they will be so different from the voting machine which exists today that people will be shocked and consider this madness. Nevertheless, it will enter into the impulses of evolution in time. De Lacy too says, in organic development, certain parts lose their original function and become useless, but still persist for some time. In the same way, these parliaments will continue to vote for quite some time, but all real life will have departed from them. You know that human beings have parts of the body which are like this. Some people can move their ears because the muscles for this existed in the past. We still have those muscles, but they have become atavistic and have lost their function. This is how de Lacy sees the parliament of the future. Parliaments will be such atavistic remnants which have died and will drop off, and something quite different will come into human evolution. I have quoted de Lacy in his book, which appeared not so long ago, in 1910, to show you that there really are enough people, for one such individual will be enough for many thousands. It is important, however, not to ignore these people. Apart from my efforts to introduce you to the laws of spiritual life and the impulses of spiritual life, I also regard it to be my function to draw attention to significant elements in present-day life. It means, of course, that initially you will hear aspects called significant in these lectures which are not considered significant in life outside, if you find them mentioned at all. The things we do must be radically and thoroughly different from those which are done outside. And we can only truly follow the science of the Spirit in the way it should be followed if we accept this in all its depth and seriousness. The end of Lecture 14 and that is the end of the book, The Cycle of Lectures by Rudolf Steiner, entitled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness.